Chapter One of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. California Coast Trails. Dedication. Preface and chapter one dedication to my brothers whose lot it has been to remain in the old homeland this volume is affectionately inscribed preface the little thread of land so puny and yet so obstinate that it has almost the look of an intentional provocation which has kept the two great oceans of the world asunder is on the point of being severed, and the twin Americas clipped apart. With that event there will open for California an era of development as striking as that which followed upon the Great Awakening in the middle of the last century. With the increase of commerce and population there will come important physical changes and the obliteration of much of what is distinctively Western in life and manners. Especially for that reason the writer hopes that this volume of impressions and experiences gained during a leisurely horseback journey recently made through the coast regions of the state may be found timely and not without interest and value. The matters of principal concern to him in making his trip were not, it is true, the practical ones of commerce and its prospects and possibilities, rather the facts and beauties in nature, and the humane and historic elements in life were his points of special attraction. Thus it occurs that neither the cities passed on his route nor the industries of the coast region are treated in particular detail if apology be needed for any dearth of what may be called practical information in the volume he feels that the lack has been is being and increasingly will be supplied by the many capable pens always at work on the categorical and statistical side in describing the features of the scenery no attempt has been made to paint in high colours indeed on a re-reading of the manuscript the impression is that, in the desire to avoid the flamboyant at all hazards, the balance may have been weighted a trifle on the conservative side. But if a mistake has been made it is in the right direction, and the writer states here his plain belief that California, with her magnificent mountain range of the Sierra Nevada, her generally diversified configuration, a shoreline extending through nearly ten degrees of latitude, with the variety in climate and in animal and vegetable life which that fact implies, and a history tinged first with the half-pathetic romance of Spain, and then by the brief but lurid epic of gold, is by much the most beautiful interesting and attractive part of all the states of the Union. It may fairly be pointed out further that it is only one region of the United States, and indeed there can be but few parts of the world where one may travel with enjoyment for half a year continuously, secure from climatic vagaries and carrying on the animal one rides everything needful for comfort by day and night. There might well be organized a society of California rovers whose annual program would be to take to the road, trail, or shore at, say, the first appearance of apple blossom, and allow no roof, unless one of canvas, to interpose between them and these kindly skies until the last late pippin has fallen from the tree. For the convenience of the general and especially the non-Californian reader, the pronunciation and also the meaning, where it is to the point, 
of the Spanish words which occur in the text are given in a glossary placed at the end of the volume preceding the index. These words are numerous, but they are unavoidable in the nature of the case, since most of the place names throughout the coast regions of California are Spanish. Beyond these place names, however, the Spanish words introduced are only those that have passed into common speech in the one-time Spanish and Mexican territories. J. S. C. Los Angeles, California Chapter 1 Leaving El Monte Objects of the Ride Our Horses and Equipment El Monte the First Mission San Gabriel, Friendly Mexicans, A Ranch House of Old California, Downey, A Farmer of California's Best Type, Sleepy Hollows, Camp on the San Joaquin, Coyotes and Sulphurous Coffee, Laguna Canyon, Warfare of Sun and Fog, The Coast, Laguna Beach. Hello, said a little girl in a sunbonnet, in shy response to my own salutation. I do not know her, but I like shy little girls in sunbonnets. Hello, travelling or just going somewheres? said a pumpkin faced boy, grinning at us over a gate. To this ingenious witticism we deigned no reply. Hello, going camping? said a rancher, jolting on a load of hay behind two serious horses. The rancher, with no very wonderful feat of discernment, had hit the mark. Carl Eitel, the painter, and I were riding down the south road from El Monte one midsummer morning, with our blankets rolled behind our saddles and other appurtenances of outdoor living slung about us. Ever since I had lived in California, I had been waiting for an opportunity to explore the coast regions of the state. At last the time had come when I could do it, and Eitel, my companion on other journeys in the mountains and deserts of the West, was free to join me for the southern part of the expedition. Our object was to view at our leisure this country once of such vast quiescence, now of such spectacular changes. Especially we wished to see what we could of its less commonplace aspects before they could have finally passed away. The older manner of life in the land, the ranch houses of ante gringo days, the Franciscan missions, relics of the era of the Padre and the Don, the large, slow life of the sheep and cattle ranges, and whatever else we could find lying becalmed in the backwaters of the hurrying stream of progress. As we meant to camp wherever night might find us, we carried with us everything we needed to make us free of cooks and chambermaids. At the same time we determined not to be encumbered with pack animals. A description of our equipment may interest the reader who wonders how this could be done on a trip which, in my own case, ran to something not far short of two thousand miles. To begin with the horses. My companion's mount was a hardy and experienced Arizona pony, round of build, sedate of temper, and serviceable to the last ounce. He owned the straightforward name of Billy, and looked it. For years he and his master had haunted the outposts of Western civilization, from the coast as far as to the lands of the Navajos, in that picturesque region which the Spanish explorers named El Desertero Pintado. Nothing came amiss to Billy, either in forage or incident. He ate alternately of mesquite and tules, dozed equally well under palm or pine, and viewed barrow train or automobile with impartial eye. 
My own horse I had bought for this trip from a Los Angeles dealer, and knew nothing of him except that he was said to hail from some Nevada stock range. As neither the dealer nor he could tell me his name, it was needful to fit him with another. So, from a trifling incident of the purchase, I called him Chino. He had a good head and limbs, intelligent eyes, and the lean body lines of a racehorse. I believe there was a strain of blood in him somewhere. He was gentle in temper, and, though excitable, was afraid of nothing, except that some unlucky experience had left him nervous of his picket rope. After a few proofs of this drawback I got him a pair of hobbles, and had no further trouble. For saddles we both had the excellent McClellan, or army pattern, which are light, strong, and fitted with rings and fastenings front and rear, for blankets, holsters, and other matters. We had had saddle-bags built of stout waterproof canvas, fourteen inches long, twelve deep, and five in the box. These were invaluable, rode well, and held a surprising quantity. In one side of the pair went our mess-kit and cooking-tackle, the articles all arranged to nest, and made with detachable handles. The stove consisted of merely two strips of wrought iron, which, laid across a couple of stones, or even across a hole scooped in the ground, made quite a serviceable cooking-place. On the other side were notebooks, maps, ammunition, toilet things, and so forth. There was room for some odd articles of provision as well, and even for a small volume or two. The other pair of saddle-bags accommodated the bulk of the provisions, of which the staples were rice, flour, oatmeal, sugar, tea, coffee, and the invaluable Erbswurst, a compact ration of pulverized split peas and bacon. These items were supplemented, as occasion offered, with bread, cheese, canned meats, vegetables, and fruit, while the gun provided rabbits and other such game as was in season. To complete the list of our traps, I carried on one side of my saddle-horn a small hatchet in a sheath, and on the other side a camera and a light tripod. Eitel had the gun, slung in a holster, and his sketching things. Our blankets, with a few extra pieces of clothing, were rolled compactly, and fitted above the saddle-bags behind the saddles. I suppose my horse carried, a rider included, about two hundred pounds, and Eitel's possibly a little less. These were good loads for our rather light animals, but our stages were meant to be short, and, in the nature of the case, they would often be broken, since the whole object was to look about us at our ease, as tourists stroll about Paris or London, seeing the sights. The road we were riding along might have been in Surrey or Virginia, so tall were the hedges that half hid the fence in their wild sweet tangle. You will not see much of verdure in travelling California roads by midsummer. Our sun is a thirsty one, and for half the year the landscape at close range is one of dry brown earth and shrivelled herbage, though distance may wash it over with amethyst, as memory does with the unhappy landscapes of the mind. But the land about El Monte is damp and low-lying. Green meadows and fields of alfalfa stretched on either hand, and the road was triple-boarded, first with vivid ribbons of grass starred with dandelions, next with rushing bulrushes or arrowy evening primroses, and then with a fifteen-foot thicket of bushes over which rolled a flood-tide of wild grapevines, their tendrils reaching far up into the air in the determination to grasp their fill of summer. The village of El Monte, 
is a rather pretty little place, not too much modernized, with plenty of big poplar and eucalyptus trees swaying above the modest cottages. I venture to hope that the reader agrees with me in finding, as I always do, the dwellings of the rustic poor, with their democratic marigolds and nasturtiums, more charming to the sympathies, and even to the eyes, than those elaborations of self-conscious modesty that lie in our streets in these almost too elegant days. I seriously think that humble things ought to please us best. The place stands near the bank of the San Gabriel River, a dozen miles or so east of Los Angeles, and four miles from San Gabriel, that dusty little hamlet, the long drowse of whose one street of adobes is broken nowadays by half-hourly convolutions when the electric car comes clanging with its load of tourists to do the venerable mission. Not many, however, even of Californians, are aware that the crumbling old building with the ponderous green bells that threaten at every ringing to wreck the cracked campanile is not the original building of the name. The first Mission San Gabriel was built in the year 1771, close to the river, and about five miles south of the present church. It was abandoned after five years by reason of some disability of sight, and a second building was consecrated in the present position in the fateful year of 1776. It also was temporary, and in 1796 the third and permanent structure took its place. As the site of the first building was but a short distance off our road, we diverged to see what might remain to keep the memory of its brief existence. Passing a little huddle of dwellings, half house, half shed, we stopped to ask directions of the unmistakably Irish head of an apparently Mexican family. He could give us but little help. He would lived there a long time, and had heard something about an old doby, but evidently was no antiquarian. Inquiry of a Mexican woman who lived a little farther on resulted in the identification of a spot near the bank of the river, where we thought we could trace the outline of a rectangle marked by a slight inequality of the surface of the ground which might indicate the ruins of adobe walls that had sunk back literally earth to earth to their original clay. It was in the middle of a field of yellow grass sprinkled with grey bushes of whorehound and defiled with the carcass of a long dead buzzard. Hum of bees, murmur of summer wind, twinkle of river shallows, these were all as of old. The rest was silence. The morning had been cloudy with a high fog when we started, but by the time we were a few miles on the road the fog melted away, leaving a sky of light, sensitive blue, dappled with faint clouds that were like the sighs of a sleeping child. The hills on our left, under which lay the little Quaker town of Whittier, passed from grey to fawn, and behind us the rocky barrier of the Sierra Madre was streaked here and there with folds of mist that clung in the deeper canyons. At a corner of the road stood a schoolhouse, enclosed, as every schoolhouse should be, in a square of trees. The trees in this case were especially handsome poplars, rising like pillars of green flame into the air, and resembling in shape, I suppose, that pillar of fire and cloud that led the way for the fugitive Israelites. It was yet before midday when, at the crossing of the river, we came to a simple white plastered house with a great bush of some flowering vine pouring over the roof in masses of wine-red bloom. Making bold to tie our horses to the rail before the veranda, 
I entered into conversation with the three Mexican women who were resting in the shade of the porch, while Eitel sketched the place. The senora herself, a sweet-faced old dame with quiet, kindly eyes, sat gazing out with placid enjoyment over the river while we talked. The daughters, both mature women, stood by, listening, but speaking little. The equipment carried by our horses occasioned some curiosity as to our purposes and destination and I found it difficult to explain the indefinite nature of our journey until I bethought me of that useful term paseo, which told all in one word. A paseo, it may be explained, is a walk, a ride, an excursion, a picnic, in fact a going anywhere and anyhow so long as it is leisurely, pleasurable and unbusinesslike. The old lady, learning that I was from Los Angeles, grew eloquent in a gentle way over the advantages of living in this quiet spot, rather than in the city, where, beyond noisy cars and much people, there was nothing, nothing. I had no difficulty in agreeing, but I fancied that the silent daughters by the door had another opinion. With friendly adieus we rode on our way, and after a mile or so stopped, soon after noon, under a shady pepper-tree, close to the Sanchez Ranch House. Here we ate our lunch while the horses refreshed themselves with a scattering of hay from the field, lately cut. Two Mexicans from the house came over to chat with us while we smoked our pipes, displaying a great interest in our expedition and exhibiting that courtesy of speech and manner which, for some reason incomprehensible to me, seems to be considered by many people as almost a base quality in their race. The reader will no doubt notice in the course of these pages that the Californian Spaniards and Mexicans, in one way or another, enter more into my narrative than their numerical strength in the population of the state would render natural. The reason is partly that my purpose led me much into those out-of-the-way districts where they still form a large element in California life, and partly that I have a genuine liking for them, not, I may say, without the basis of considerable experience. I confess to having no sympathy with the slighting regard with which they, especially the Mexicans, are held by the great majority of people in the West and to holding them quite our equals, using the word our to signify the rest of us in general, in that sum of good, bad, and indifferent qualities which makes up the characters of races and nations. With his opinion, and with the sympathy naturally accompanying it, I find pleasure in their society, and the reader may perhaps receive an impression of their greater importance in the community than their relative numbers would justify. The old Sanchez house, which stands on an abrupt rise above the road and on the river, retains still a few marks of the bygone importance of the family. It is now almost a ruin, and consists partly of the original adobe house and partly of the later frame additions, even these showing traces of unusual finish and expense in carved cornices and ornamental mouldings. The cavernous fireplace and vast stables testify to the numbers of those who gathered to the hospitality of the old house in the days of its prime. All day we kept the south road toward the coast, after crossing early in the afternoon the stream known as Rio Hondo, or Deep River, a name calculated to provoke a smile from the traveller who, passing over it in the dry season, sees nothing but a wide expanse of sand and a thicket of willows. Sundown followed us on the outskirts of the little town of Downey, where we pitched camp on a vacant lot adjoining a church, and passed the night embittered by mosquitoes. 
We arose early and bade adieu to Downey, while all but a few of the townspeople were still wrapped in slumber, or in the enjoyment of those serene moments during which one reconnoitres at a long range the duties of the coming day. For us it was a day of long straight roads, of inexpressible dust, of leagues of sugar-beets, and farms at mile-long intervals. After the gloomy experience of the previous night it was cheering to anticipate a night of unbroken rest at the ranch of a friend of Eitel's, to whose house we rode up just as the family were sitting down to supper. We were at once welcomed to bed and board. Hay was thrown down to our tired horses, and in due time we slept the sleep of the just traveller, who is secure not only of his own, but also of his horse's welfare. Our host was a representative of the best type of American farmer, a thoughtful, well-read man, courteous in the old leisured manner widely travelled, and full of distinct impressions and shrewd comparisons. Twenty-seven years of California ranching on the grand scale had left him with a well-digested fund of practical outdoor wisdom that made hours of conversation with him pass like minutes. His knowledge of the locality where he now lives goes back to the time of its first settlement by Mormons who, under the unflattering names of Swamp Angels and Tule Rooters, found the region an almost uninhabitable marsh, and have made it amongst the richest of California's boasted soils. It was mid-afternoon next day when we said good-bye and rode away. On the right hand the twin peaks of Santiago Mountain rose into a faint blue sky while to the south a pearly bank of sea-fog overhung the Pacific. In spite of careful directions as to our road, we soon found ourselves wandering in a maze of tule swamps and barbed wire fences, while hosts of implacable midges swarmed about us, biting furiously at horse and man alike. Two Mexicans whom we met walking could give us no direction but a Chinaman on horseback at last put us right, and we made a happy escape. The time, we remarked, is oddly out of joint when Chinamen ride while Mexicans go afoot. The road ran by sundry little settlements, some new and thriving, others, such as the hamlet of Fairview, where a few old houses and a church no longer young, stood among loquacious poplars and cottonwoods. With all the phenomenal growth of population in California as a whole, we found tracts of country here and there which have somehow been exempted from the influx, and some of which, from that point of view, appear to have retrograded. But the kindly law of compensation is quietly at work, and one finds a charm in these sleepy hollows where nothing has grown but the trees, where the improvements are only in the increase of moss and lichen on roofs and fence-posts, and where old ladies still drive with fat ponies and antiquated phaetons to sewing-meetings and ladies' auxiliaries, instead of whizzing in automobile to browning clubs and bridge-parties. Crossing the main Santa Ana Road, as a meteoric procession of these last-named vehicles were bearing back Los Angeles holiday-makers from the seaside to their homes, we struck across the San Joaquin Ranch. The sun was going down behind us, and our shadows were projected gigantically before us on the wide yellow plain. Darkness overtook us early, aided by the fog that had waited for set of sun to advance its grey armies. A dry camp and a poor grazing seemed to be our portion, but luck favoured us, and by the last daylight we descried in the distance a stack of baled hay, beside which was a litter of loose hay, 
which we felt free to appropriate for our horses. Then, prowling in the darkness in the faint hope of discovering water, we came upon a good artesian flow issuing from an open well-boring. It was of blood-heat temperature and strongly charged with sulphur, and of highly unattractive odour, but it was water, and neither we nor our animals were inclined to refuse it. Tying the horses securely, lest they should be tempted to exchange our uninteresting society during the night for that of a band of their own flesh and blood that were grazing near by, we spread our blankets under the lee of the haystack and were lulled to sleep by a nocturne in which the wailing of plovers competed at disadvantage with indescribable clamour of coyotes. It was something of a problem next morning how, in this treeless country, we were to achieve our indispensable coffee. But Eitel, who is a sort of Bedouin, was equal to the emergency. With ten minutes' search we gathered a few handfuls of dry mustard stems, and with these he made a small but efficacious fire. The beverage made with the sulphur-impregnated water revealed a startling flavour, and it needed a certain amount of determination to ignore its weird aroma, but it was hot and we were cold, and so that it really went very well. We were early in the saddle, and making for the pass between the northwesterly flanks of the San Joaquin Hills and the foothills of the Santa Ana range of mountains. Indeterminable beans in time succeeded to the miles of pasture land, and I gained an increased respect for this useful legume when I saw it growing thus, not in family backyard fashion, but in great horizon-filling expanses from which loaded rail-cards would soon be rolling away to carry it by the hundreds of tons to the bean-loving world. A countryman with whom we talked told us that artesian water lay at no great depth below all this level plain of the San Joaquin, uh, not to be confused, by the way, with the other great San Joaquin, the great central valley of California whose southern boundary, the Tehachapi range of mountains, forms a convenient geographical division between the southern and central portions of the state. I thought that, if that were so, I could foresee the time, not so very far distant, when the prairie-like landscape I saw would be checkered into hundreds of trim little farms, occupied by farmers of the new style, who, scientifically blending water and soil under the most generous climate in the world, would cover the great expanse with the choicest fruits of the earth. Turning southward and rounding the outermost point of the San Joaquin Hills, we began to descend into the Laguna Canyon. Utilitarian reflections were not suffered entirely to occupy my thoughts. As we rode, my companion noted, with a painter's instinct, the broad simplicity of line and colour. Yellow bays of stubble washed far up into the folds of the hills, and on their wide expanses solitary oaks or islands of brush were stamped in spots of solid umber. The grey thread of road stretched on before us appearing and lapsing as it followed the gentle contours of the land, and over all a sky of cobalt blue had succeeded to the broken greys and purples of the morning. At the head of the long descent to the coast lay a lagoon bordered with rustling tules and populated by files of waterfowl. Here and there a heron or a sandhill crane stood sunk in abysmal reflections. Brush began to cover the hillsides, the half-toned drabs and sages relieved with the uncompromising green of the tuna cactus, these decorated with vivid yellow blossoms that sprouted like jets of flame from the edges of the lobes. The canyon in its lower half is highly picturesque, 
steep hills close it in and curious caverns some of them of large size give a touch of mystery to their rocky sides this quality of the scene was heightened when a sudden sea fog that lay continually in wait along the frontier of the coast gaining a temporary advantage by some slackness of the enemy poured over the mountain to the southwest and cast the whole mass into impressive gloom on the instant the leaf was turned brush was transmuted to heather from california i was translated to scotland fringes of sad grey cloud drooped along the summits or writhed in tangles in the hollows of the hills one who did not know the almost impossibility of rain at midsummer in this region would have declared that it was imminent a strong breeze blew salty into our faces and when by mid-afternoon we rode into the village of laguna beach the sun again held sway so the unceasing warfare goes along this coast we rode our horses down to the beach the philosophic billy was unemotional as usual but my chino a lean bundle of nerves was deeply interested and gazed snorting and breathing quickly at the phenomenon of the surf Turning westward, we found an oasis of wild oats among the brush and cactus that occupied the rising ground at the back of the cliffs, and there cast anchor. It was highly pleasant at evening to lie in our blankets, listening for an hour to the surf, growling like a friendly watchdog in our extensive backyard, and to wake after a night of industrious oblivion to feel the sea fog brushing our faces with its cool, soft fingers, a kind of infinitesimal needle-bath. End of chapter 1《Chapter 2 of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 2 Aliso Canyon, The Eucalyptus, Bird Voices at Morning, A Painter's Coast, Our Camp at Aliso Canyon, Coast Features and Resemblances, A Typical Southern California Canyon, The Artist's Point of View, A Hermit's Cave, California Land Grants, Their Names, Dana's Cliff at San Juan, The Town of San Juan Capistrano, Its Old Time Air, Its Ruined Mission, Relics of Mission Days. Laguna Beach is a main resort of California artists, and the next morning was devoted to a foregathering with certain of them who chanced to be painting in the neighborhood. Then there was a great comparison of sketchbooks, the expeditions upon line, balance, and mass. Not even the spectrum was out of range. With bohemian hospitality and a notable combustion of tobacco, the hours sped away, until soon after midday we saddled up to move a short distance farther down the coast. A few miles along a road that wound and dipped over the cliffs brought us by sundown to Aliso Canyon. A brackish lagoon lies at the mouth, barred from the ocean by the beach sands. The walls of the canyon are high hills of lichened rock sprinkled with brush, whose prevailing grey is relieved here and there by bosses of olive sumac. A quarter mile inland we struck tokens of the neighbourhood of a ranch, and here made camp under a rank of fragrant blue gums, populous with argumentative kingbirds and cheerful orioles. The landscapes of California have been greatly enriched by the acclimatization here of the eucalyptus. It is not often that the presence of an imported ingredient adds a really natural element to the charm of scenery, 
but the eucalyptus especially the globus variety has become so common throughout the state has so truly native appearance that it seems as if its introduction from australia must have been more in the nature of a homecoming than of an adoption the wide treeless plains and valleys which once lay unrelieved and gasping under the summer sun and inspired similar sensations in the traveller are now everywhere graced by ranks and spinneys of these fine trees beautiful alike whether trailing their tufty sprays in the wind or standing as still as if painted in the torrid air when the winter rain comes there are no trees that so abandon themselves to the spirit of the time with wild sighs and every passionate action they crouch and bend as if in the very luxury of grief and toss their tears to the earth like actors protesting their sorrows on a stage the long scimitar-like leaves are as fine in shape as can be imagined and each tree carries a full scale of colours in its foliage the blue-white of the new the olive of the mature and the brilliant russets and crimsons of the leaves that are ready to fall the bark is as interesting as the foliage its prevailing colour a delicate fawn smooth enough to take on fine tone reflections from soil and sky long shards and ropes of bark hang like brown leather from stem and branches making a lively clatter as they rasp and chafe in the wind and revealing as they strip away the dainty creams and greenish whites of the inner bark the tree's habit of growth sets off its beauty to the best advantage long spaces of the trunk arms and smaller branches showing all their handsome colours and drawing between the dense plumes of foliage in early summer the tree flowers with a profusion of blossoms uniquely tasteful and later the seed vessels are as quaint and curious as rare seashells to crown all the tree is as fragrant as sandalwood and the scent a hundred times more robust than that exotic perfume which is fit only for seraglios and the effeminate paraphernalia of mongolian decadence the night was cloudy but warm our blankets were spread upon a litter of blue gum leaves and their vigorous essences gave the spot unusual attractiveness as a sleeping place something however probably the virtue of our laguna friend's home-grown tobacco again made me wakeful but it was enjoyable enough to lie and watch the quiet play of the foliage the only sounds the gentle clatter of leaf on leaf the industrious mastication of the horses the occasional challenges of distant owls and the monotonous voice of the surf lulling the earth with its unceasing narrative the hubbub of birds that greeted the morning was something to remember the kingbirds seemed to be the earliest risers their waking complaints overlapping the long-range adieus of the owls for some time nothing else stirred no doubt birds have their peculiarities of temper or at least of temperament just as we have i fancied the less strenuous inhabitants of the trees lying lethargically gazing at the brightening sky awaiting the fatal moment when the duties of the coming day could no longer be ignored perhaps like some of us the victims of <clears throat> liver in due course the linnets blackbirds orioles and canaries came in and just before sunrise the cliff sparrows of whom a flock of full two hundred inhabited a cavern by the lagoon filled the air with their sweet trilling voices as they swung and soared in zestful manoeuvres then the cliff wren's cascade of plaintive chromatics rang out 
from far up the hill, and when the sun arose, and with him the insects, the flycatchers arrived to occupy the most desirable stations for business. Next the quail began to call in the willows, their flute-like voices receding as they made their way to the hillsides for the day. The soft cry of doves came from the stubble, and finally the scream of a hunting hawk supplied the inevitable element of discord. Our camp here was so attractive that we remained for several days. For my companion's purposes the locality was quite undeniable, the coast both up and down being ideally broken and paintable, point after point, rich in ochres, madders, and umbers, ran into the sea of truly Mediterranean brilliancy, and chains of islets ringed with flashing foam lay like pendants of jewels on the turquoise plain. The cliffs rose in general to a hundred feet or thereabouts, and were broken by frequent canyons which varied with lines of heavy brush the sweep of hillside that ran to a horizon of large free outlines. Dark ranks of cypresses, stunted and broken, stood here and there near the cliff edge, the when and by whom of their planting offering problems of casual interest to the infrequent wayfarer. Thirty miles in the west lay the island of Santa Catalina, often unseen for many days together, and even in clear weather hardly discernible above the grey line of the sea-blink that banded the horizon. Before we moved on Eitel had quite a gallery of studies and sketchings tacked up on the trees to dry. Altogether our camp had an attractive air of alfresco bohemianism, and we would not have exchanged it for the charms of the Vache en Vage or the Boule Miche. Saddles, bridles, saddlebags, guns, spurs, and cooking tackle were strewn all about the little spot, which for the time we called home. An easel and pallet signified the door of the studio and our horses fraternized and quarrelled alternately, in such close proximity to our beds that they could have kicked out our brains while we slept, if they had been so minded. This part of the coast of California bears a curious likeness to that of the Channel Islands off of the Brittany coast. A difference there is in details, of course, geologic structure, vegetation, and somewhat colour. Here, Warm ochres, creams, and drabs alternate on the broken cliff faces with olive greens, greys, and masses of ashy rose, and the herbage of the tops carries out the same general class of tone. Cactus growing to the cliff edges gives a touch wholly characteristic of the region, but the long wing-like reaches of the land line where ten miles of coast will contain twice that number of little emerald bays, barred one from the other by white arms of spray, brought constantly to my mind the rocky shores of Guernsey and Jersey. There are some little castellated peninsulas that I could match almost detail for detail with some that I remember near St. Aubin. Such resemblances are full of pleasure. They keep one's thoughts unstagnant and ever on the wing, and better yet they reach down and stir sometimes those subtlest strings of all that vibrate in the dark quiet chamber of the mind where lies the well of tears, keeping that unstagnant too. One afternoon we rode a few miles up the canyon towards El Toro, the nearest point of the railroad. The valley, for it is too gentle in outline to be properly called a canyon, is so purely typical of many of the California landscapes that I will describe it as an example. As soon as we passed the gates of the ranch we entered a league-long valley from which rose smooth slopes of pale golden grass. The rounded swells and folds of the land 
took the light as richly as a cloth of velvet. In the bottom lay the creek, in isolated pools and reaches, its course marked sharply by a border of green grass and rushes. Red cattle grazed everywhere, or stood for coolness in the weed-covered pools. The hillsides were terraced by their interlacing trails. Elders and willows grew at wide intervals, a blot of shadow reaching from each. Under them the rings of bare grey earth were trampled hard as brick where generations of cattle had gathered for shade. In one side reach of the valley was a little bee ranch of a score or two of hives with the typical shanty of the bee-man, closed and apparently deserted. It was an off-year for bees near the coast. Excess of fog had spoiled the honey-flow. As we rode, blue mountains rose on the northern horizon. They were the Santa Ana Mountains, fifteen miles away. That was the only ingredient in the view that could come under the term picturesque. The rest was open, bald, commonplace. European painters, American too, all but a few, would have declared it crude and impossible. The yellow horizon was cut on the blue of the sky in a clean, hard line. In one spot, where the creek in winter flood had cut out a fifteen-foot bluff, the shadow was a slash of inky blackness on the glaring expanse of sun-bleached grass. There was always a buzzard or two swinging slowly in the sky, and once one rose nearby in a heavy, shambling flight from its surfeit on the carcass of a dead steer. That was all. But to Eitel, and indeed to me, though I am no artist, it was complete and perfect. If beauty consists, as theorists I understand declare, in the true expression of spirit, then certainly this landscape complied with the terms. It was a very summary of the native and original California del Sur, California of the South, as nature designed it. And even the sophisticated mind, trained to weigh tone, values, and balance of line, found the composition ideal in its magnificent western simplicity. Pretty? Hm, a thousand miles from it. Picturesque? The very word sounds puerile. But simple, strong, dignified, which I take to be the primaries of art after all, these were the very facts of the case, the materials of the landscape. Of small life there was a plenty but not in much variety. Ground squirrels by the hundreds scurried across the road, or sat motionless, so exact in imitation of dead stumps of wood that it was hard to detect the trick, which they no doubt relied on for safety. Their runways were as well beaten and plain to see as in many places was the country road we were on. A ground owl, like another stump, sat on the edge of the creek bluff, his head revolving like a screw as he watched us through three-quarters of a circle. Two road-runners raced away uphill, the sunlight glancing from their long straight backs and tail-feathers as if from steel. Once a coyote stole up the hillside, standing in plain view on the ridge as long as he felt sure he was out of range, and then dodging from cover to cover until he reached his safe ravine. A hawk, chivied by kingbirds, like a Spanish galleon beset by pirates, drifted and flapped about in misery, a fine moral spectacle of poetic justice. We had been told of a cave somewhere in the canyon, which had been, in past days, inhabited by a hermit. Our friend at the ranch remembered that nearly forty years ago his father had removed from it scraps of iron, and such other articles as the hermit, even then long departed and already become historic, 
had left behind to keep his memory grey, as I suppose a hermit would prefer to have it. We had no difficulty in identifying the place, though we had not asked for direction to it. A mile or two up the canyon we found a sizable cave in the side of a stony hill that rose from the eastern bank of the creek. The roof was still begrimed with smoke, so that the swallows and even the bats had eschewed the place, and Eitel picked up near the entrance a stone pestle, such as was, and still is common to some extent, used by the California Indians to grind flour in their morteros. This, no doubt, was the property of the legendary man. A little delving in the floor of the cave brought to light fragments of shells of mussels and clams, but nothing more eloquent of the past. Nor were any reflective inscriptions, such as one would think befitting, if not inevitable, were to be found on the walls. But hermits, we remembered, are not all given to scribbling and then our friend, if we might take that liberty with him, might not have been able to write. In fact, we speculated whether he might not have been one of those Kanakas whom Dana in Two Years Before the Mast reported encountering, I thought, at San Juan, only a few miles from this very spot. Hence no writing, and the pestle and the art of using it were no doubt the gift of friendly Indians. We fancied our man, a literal cave-man, sitting at set of sun in the door of his lonely dwelling, revolving omitical thoughts, and travelling perhaps in mind the leagues of blue ocean back to far Hawaii. We thought we heard him singing his superflumina babylonis by the willows of the creek, and with kindly thoughts of the unknown brother we turned away. It was generally mortifying, after these sentimental exercises, to find later that we had been at the wrong cave. Uh, the true place is in a side canyon on the other side of the creek, and anyhow it was at San Diego, not at San Juan, that Dana met his protégés. As we returned in the late afternoon, shreds of silvery fleece were drifting over the hill from the sea to dissolve in the heated air that still rose from valley and mountain. An hour later the balance would be slowly reversed, and during the night the people of the inland towns and farms as far as to the foothills of the Sierra Madre would lie under the cool blanket of the sea fog. The land of California was held first under the Spanish, and then the Mexican governments in large grants or ranchos. Most of these have, under American rule, and especially during the last few decades with their accelerated development, been broken up. But a few remain intact, and the original names of all of them still adhere, and preserve for us a touch of the glamour of the old regime. To name only those tracts which we had traversed in coming from El Monte to the coast, there were San Francisquito, Portero Grande, La Merced, Paseo de Bartolo, Santa Gertrudis, Los Coyotes, Los Alimitos, Las Bolsas, Santiago de Santa Ana, and San Joaquin. Aliso Canyon is on the Niguel a designation which has by general consent been Englished into Newell, a fair phonetic approximation. We now entered upon the grant of the Mission Vieja de San Juan Capistrano, the lands that formerly pertained to that once flourishing mission establishment. Wide levels of yellow grass that shone like silk in the sunlight led to a small canyon in which lay a narrow lagoon. Skirting this we came to a great expanse of stubble, with here and there huge stockpiles of sacked grain built up like redoubts, a palpable defiance to famine. A shallow stream, the San Juan Creek, here comes down to the sea. 
the adjacent coast was the scene of events narrated by r h dana in that graphic chapter of autobiography two years before the mast to which reference was made on a recent page it was easy to identify the cliff from which the hides were thrown down to the much abused sailors of the pilgrim and where dana himself performed that perilous descent for which he received such ambiguous thanks from the redoubtable Captain T. The presence of a pensive pelican, who sat apparently in remorse of indigestion on the topmost scarp of the cliff, seemed somehow to add in the reconstruction of these bygone incidents of the place. We now turned our back for a few days upon the ocean, and rode inland. The sun, setting in a pageant of colour, poured a flood of rosy gold upon the low hills to the east, and clad with a more solemn splendour the higher back ranges. Behind us a segment of grey sea filled the mouth of the valley, its passionless unconcern, in contrast with the companionable aspect of other features of the scene, affected me with a sudden feeling of aversion. Water, though the most beautiful, seems the least humane of the elements. Darkness was falling as we entered the little town of San Juan Capistrano. A few torpid Mexicans lounged outside the stores, which had closed for the day, and gave us buenas noches as we passed. We camped beside a river half a mile beyond the town and enjoyed at night a fine entertainment of summer lightning that played upon the northern horizon. Lightning is something of a rarity in California. Capistrano, to use the common abbreviation, is the most interesting small town in California. The reason is that it has remained Californian in the old sense, that is to say, Spanish, Mexican, and Indian. I suppose five-sixths of the inhabitants are of those races, and the remnant is a motley of Basques, Germans, French, and Jews. Judge E., who is the Justice of the Peace, and the effective squire of the place, is an American, certainly, but if you should ask his name, you would be told Don Ricardo. Capistrano's threescore or so of houses are mostly adobes. Its stores are tiendas, its meat markets, carnicieras, its weekly function, a baile, its celebrations, fiestas, and the autumnal employment of its people, piscando nueces, in the walnut orchards which fill the lower valleys of the San Juan. But the great charm of Capistrano lies in its mission. Here stood what must have been the most beautiful of all that chain of twenty-one churches which, in the last decades of the eighteenth century, rose like a monkish dream on the gentle landscape of California, culminating in a unique but momentary success, and sank quickly into decay under the exploitation of successive governors of the Spanish and Mexican regimes. An omen of the general catastrophe fell early on the mission of San Juan Capistrano when, in 1812, the great domed church, shaken by an earthquake, crashed down in hideous collapse upon the congregation as they knelt at their devotions. There remains now a ruin of singular beauty. Owl-haunted colonnades of crumbling arches, clustered pillars, on whose broken fillettings the thoughtful moonlight loves to linger. A fragment of the dome showing still the quaint frescoes of the Indian artisans, and a little nondescript campanile of four bells, the pride of old Aku, hereditary ringer of bells to San Juan. The Padre, a cultivated, kindly, young Kentuckian, made us heartily welcome to the hospitality of the quiet old place. We spread our blankets among the rustling wild oats of the quadrangle, and consorted for a few nights with the ghosts of neophytes of a century ago. The days passed quickly. 
Eitel's in sketching, mine in exploring with the Padre the few remaining treasures of the library. Slender tomes in rough sheepskin, like tall, pale old gentlemen, written closely in Spanish, with records of christenings and burials, each volume devoutly rounded off with its laus deo, a triumph of flamboyant calligraphy. Ancient sets of Bousset and Massillon, breveries, missals, what not, all endued with that odour of sanctity which is neither Catholic nor Protestant, the sanctity of age and bygone human usage. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Three San Juan Hot Springs, San Mateo, a princely ranch, the Santa Margarita, vicissitudes of western towns, Fallbrook. Palomar Mountain, the village of Pala, the wronged Indians of Agua Caliente, the mission of San Antonio at Pala, American hospitality at the old Montserrat ranch house, echoes of the past, Don Tomas Elvarado, wildcats, the San Luis Rey Valley, Wayside Interludes, the Wahome, its deterioration, the Mission San Luis Rey as <laughs> restored, Oceanside, companionship and moods of the sea, night at La Costa. A dozen miles or so inland from San Juan Capistrano are the San Juan Hot Springs. The short journey thither was fully justified by the beauty of the mountain canyon in which the springs are situated. We gazed at one another expectantly after taking our baths in the hot sulphur water, but were bound to admit that the soft and velvety complexions that are promised as a result had not been achieved. Turning again westward, we followed the valley of the San Juan down to the coast. Then, for a few miles, the road lay along the beach, in company with the railroad. Now and then a train passed us, and jaded passengers, lolling in corner seats, turned eyes of envy, or so we thought, upon us, as we rode leisurely along our uncommercial travels. By sundown we arrived at San Mateo, which we found to consist of two ranch houses and a water tank, to say nothing of the name. Here we camped on the borderline of the counties of Orange and San Diego, and performed the feat of cooking our supper in one county and eating it in the other. A long extent of thinly settled country continues to the southward, broken by canyons whose names offered interesting matter for speculation in advance and confirmation in experience. El Horno, the oven, Piedra de Lumbre, firestone, and Las Pulgas, the fleas. Again we left the coast and struck inland. After crossing Aliso Creek, the road led up a long, winding canyon, and then descended steeply to a wide green valley in which ranged great bands of cattle. It was the home ranch of the Santa Margarita, one of the largest of those princely estates in which the lands of California were held under the former rule. The house is a charming adobe roofed with tiles, built in the Spanish mode around a flowery patio. Cascades of roses, bougainvilleas, and trailing geraniums pour over every fence. Hammocks, benches, and an ola 
of cool water invite one into the shade of the veranda, where antlers of deer are set above the heavy doors and barred Spanish windows. Hill and valley, as far as the eye can range, are stippled with grazing cattle, and the air of the whole place is that of large, simple interests, moving quietly on, year by year, from a serene past to a tranquil future. We camped beside the creek, and passed a strenuous evening in battle with the mosquitoes. A full moon shone down upon us and lighted the enemy to the attack. I turned in early, and, protected by an oilskin drawn loosely over my head, lay and listened with deep pleasure to their excited voices outside. From here we took the road to the east through the rural town of Fallbrook. This is one of the many California towns that owe their birth to great expectations which have never been realized. Fallbrook once boasted a railroad, but the timetables know its name no more. A large hotel, its gay paint subdued to a pessimistic grey, bears the inconsequent name of the Naples. The only signs of life, revealed by a careful survey of the main street at midday, were two urchins eating ice cream and an elderly man with a faded valise who stood gazing up and down the street, evidently looking for means of escape. A long and dusty road, bordered with groves of sleepy olives, led straight towards the mountains. In due course ensued grateful intervals of oaks, and then, better still, glimpses of forest peaks of which the highest was Palomar Mountain, more often called by its alias after a party by the name of Smith. It was good to see that dark, dim blue of timber, and to know that the great friendly pines were thriving away up there, while they looked down upon us who loved them in the hot and dusty valley. The mile strung out unconscionably. But at last we saw, far up the valley, a white tower, which we knew to be the campanile of the Mission of San Antonio of Pala. In the gathering dusk we rode into the village and bivouacked in the adobe-walled courtyard in the rear of the general store. We dined in dust and darkness, and later, when the moon came up, wandered for an hour about the village. Lights shone here and there in the windows of the cottages. The humble, white-railed graves in the little Indian cemetery glimmered under the shadow of the old tower, whose bells had counted out the lives of all that sleeping company. A mandolin tinkled. The mountains rose near and solemn all around. A bar of warm light shone from the half-open door of the Padre's room in the cloister. From a new building across the street came the click of billiard balls. So even Pala suffers change. Its great change came when, a few years ago, the Indians of Agua Caliente on Warner's Ranch, twenty miles to the east, were forcibly and to go back to principles weightier than the law, shamefully driven from the place that they and their forefathers had inhabited from time immemorial, and on which there chanced to be some valuable mineral springs that invited exploitation. The Indians of Pala had dwindled to few in number, in compliance with the fiat that is ruling the American aborigines out of existence. So, in a business-like manner, it was decided to lump the Agua Calientes with them, to mingle or refrain as they chose. Of course they protested, and their friends among the whites appealed. But someone in authority on the other side of the continent had said it was to be done, and it was done. 
Amid their lamentations they were carted over the mountains with their pitiful belongings, and here they now live, in a row of flimsy little houses with numbers on the doors, quite respectable, comparatively prosperous, and deeply wronged. It is one more item in a long account. Their Indian hearts still yearn for the old places. Even the grasses for basket-making are not so good, the woman said to me, as those of Agua Caliente. Are not Abana and Fapa? The little church is inviting in its whitewashed simplicity. It is a plain rectangle of adobe, with tiled floor, unceilinged roof, a few plain benches, and an altar, ornamented with paper flowers and other humble offerings, whose irrelevance to a Protestant eye may well be redeemed by their pathos. The genial young priest has charge of four small Indian settlements besides this of Pala, namely Potrero, Rincon, Pachanga, and Palma. They all lie in the neighboring mountain region, and, with his little buggy and his sagacious rowan, he drives about his wide parish, baptizing, marrying, and burying his Indians. As interesting and romantic a field of labor, I should think, as any in America. Leaving Pala about mid-afternoon, we turned coastward, following the course of the San Luis Rey River. Night overtook us before we had found grazing and water for our animals, and the prospect was not cheering. We were thinking of turning back under necessity to the least undesirable spot we had noted when we came in sight of a ranch house, toward which we made. In response to our hail a lantern appeared, and the prompt reply to our inquiry whether we might be put up for the night was, You bet you can. Certainly any one might bet on it at the sound of that hearty voice. Why don't you fellows throw down your blankets on the hay? I reckon that's softer in the ground, was the next suggestion, and we wanted nothing better. Our horses plunged their noses into the hay, and we fell to preparing our own supper. But not satisfied with these benefits, our friendly host or his kind wife would appear every five minutes with, Can you fellows use some milk for your coffee? Or, Maybe you fellows like tomatoes. Well, here's a dish of them, and there's half an acre more over yonder. Or some other hospitable inquiry. It seemed that they had just been waiting for some opportunity to shower benefits on wayfarers, and we were all deigned to be the fortunate ones. We slept magnificently on our ten-foot-thick mattress, and the next day being Sunday, stayed all day with these warm-hearted people. We found that the place was the old Montserrat ranch house, and as our host had lived there, man and boy, for thirty-eight years, Many were the tales he had to tell of the days when Don Tomas Alvarado maintained here the tradition of the grandees of Spanish California, ruling over a household of no mean dimensions, and himself ruled, so it is said, by the priest whom he kept as a necessary adjunct to his state. Thirteen thousand sheep, three thousand head of cattle, and three hundred horses could the Don call his own in the days of his prime? Yet he died a pauper, the victim of his own lavish dispensation of pesos. About the old house lingers a faint essence of its past, a glamour of things strange and gone beyond our ken. A date palm waves in languid grace over the patio, casting its fronded shade over the defaced walls and lazy balconies. A few rows of orange and olive trees drop their starved fruit among the weeds, and a marachal neel blooms secretly in a corner of the deserted veranda. The conversation turning upon game 
it appeared that this locality is a sort of headquarters of the wildcat tribe. Two hundred and fifty of these animals were killed by our host and his neighbours during two months of one prolific year, and last winter he himself had accounted for nineteen in one month. When I asked grey-eyed Edith, who had come with armfuls of puppies for our admiration, whether the wild cats did not kill their chickens, the answer came with eloquent brevity. Lots. Seventeen skins line the wall of their little kitchen, and a heap more lie in the unused room which was once the private chapel of Don Tomas. Among the wildcat skins on the kitchen wall I noticed a frame motto. The words were, Love one another, and my last impression of the family was a delightful commentary upon it. The toil-worn hand of the wife rested on the shoulder of her stalwart husband, who talked tender nonsense to the nine-months morsel of baby that he held, while the other three children played an uproarious cowboy game of roping one another with a superannuated riata. There was no need to say, God bless them. Clearly he does. The valley of the San Luis Rey River open before us in wide stretches of pasture and grain land. Behind lay the long blue ridge of Palomar. The cool sea breeze began to blow up the valley, and the last grey shred of fog sank away into the immense cobalt of the sky. Doves flew from sycamore to turkeyweed, and from turkeyweed back to sycamore. Buzzards sailed in the clear air, circling with unmoving wings, and balancing with easy perfection of flight. A handsome young Indian passed us at a gallop. An automobile or two whizzed by. A Mexican family jogged along in a buckboard. So the old and the new of California tossed their dust at one another. All the morning we plodded quietly along ruminating lazily to the pad-pad of the hoofs. After passing a minute hamlet called Bonsal Bridge, we rested for half an hour beside the road under a sycamore in the fresh young leaves of which the horses discovered an interesting flavour. These roadside interludes are very pleasant. You tie your horse in the shade, take off the bridle, loosen the cinch, pull out your bread and cheese, and munch it to the rustle of leaves and the interrogative comments of hidden birds. The brook purls along, and your thoughts purl along with it. A draught of water, and then the carefully packing of the pipe bowl, and the first grateful puffs. You slip the bridle on, tighten up the girth, swing into the saddle, and ride on with one more little vignette added to the many such, of which one is turned up now and then by some chance occurrence, whereupon there comes back to you the whole scene with your companion, if you had one, or your faithful horse, now perhaps obeying another hand, or none. In the afternoon we diverged a mile or two to visit the Wahomey Ranch House, where it is said Helen Hunt Jackson gathered much of the local colour for her famous California romance of Ramona. We found the place a particularly sad instance of the unworthy fate which has been allowed to fall upon nearly all of these relics of a picturesque past. The ruin of the Wahome seems more like the hideous decay of a murdered body than the peaceful dissolution which shed over most ancient buildings that particular charm which we all recognize. Cans, bottles, and other refuse covered the floors and the broken chairs and tables of the rooms we entered. The fish-pond was slimy and defiled, the fountain dry and shattered. But for a few flowers that blossomed in the dusty courtyard, I could discover nothing of attraction. 
it was a relief to turn our backs upon the place. As we rode back across the ranch we passed a great band of sheep, and the barren ground, ugly as an ash heap, in the rear of the devastating army, served to complete the depressing impression. A few miles farther on we came in sight of the mission of San Luis Rey, half hidden behind a line of blue gums. The mission, which in its state of partial ruin was singularly attractive, has lately been restored, with the usual disastrous results from the point of view of beauty. A barrack-like addition has been built, and fascinates the visitor by its appalling ugliness. Our intention had been to stay a day or two about the place, but we now laid our plans for an early departure on the morrow. We put up our horses in the stable of a civil Mexican, and ourselves camped nearby, passing a night enlivened with dogs, fleas, and mosquitoes, but with a conspicuous absence of sleep. By four o'clock we were taking the road by the light of a waning moon towards Oceanside, where we arrived with the sun. Here, for a novelty, we breakfasted at a hotel. Sundry small affairs of business delayed us till afternoon, and we mounted and pursued our way to the south. The road ran once more by the coast, and after passing the village of Carlsbad lay along the beach. We looked forward with pleasure to a few days of travel again within the sight of the sea, and within the sound of its wise, admonitory voice. Already. I found that this almost daily companionship had given me a longing to remain with it, to ride on, far, far southward, through Mexico, Darien, and the long continent of South America, with the monody of the surges ever with me, day and night. What a ride that would be! And then, perhaps, up the other coast of the Western world, though, on reflection, I think not for somehow my long life in the west has weaned me from my old preference for the atlantic side after all the west is finest the new unformed west where the tide of human life that spread out from old secret asia comes at last full circle and is already beginning to break in tumult against this farthest wall of the world Today the sky was overcast, and the grey sea plain ran to an indeterminate horizon, with that curious appearance of fullness which I have often observed to accompany similar conditions of sky. The long ranks of the surf crept patiently up to the ineffectual siege, forever unconquering, but forever unconquerable. It is so that I best love the ocean. Not glittering, garish, with shallow laughter and flippant retort, but grey, reticent, resolute, proud, solitary. We entered now a silent region where wide expanses of grain land alternated with stretches of brush, and houses appeared at league-long intervals. Here we crossed a wide lagoon, the Agua Hedionda, signifying ill-smelling water, though the reason for the name was not apparent, which lies at the mouth of the Canyon de los Monos, or Monkey Canyon, another cryptic designation. As we approached La Costa, where our road ran in company with the railroad, it began to rain smartly. By good fortune a deserted house stood nearby, and this we appropriated to our uses, eating our meal on the veranda, and finding the tea no less cheering for the fact that the well was inhabited by a trio of prosperous-looking water-snakes. The rain ceased by nightfall, and we slept under the cypresses of the garden hedge. A conspicuous event of the night was the passage of the San Diego Express at a distance of thirty feet from my head. End of chapter 3
Chapter Four of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Four, Boom Towns, Del Mar, the Torrey Pine, the old Alvarado Ranch House, an incident of the eternal feminine, the decay of the historic Spanish California houses. Las Peñasquitas Valley and Ranch House. The Linda Vista Mesa prospects of a kangaroo ranch. Mission Valley, the Mission of San Diego. Old Town. San Diego, our southern terminus. Bay and Waterfront. The Highlands of Mexico in sight. Our route next day lay through a succession of depressing little boom towns whose vacant stores and depopulated hotels bore witness to some of the more melancholy attributes of human character. As we surveyed the boarded up windows of a dry goods and notions establishment, my companion put the case neatly by remarking that evidently the fate of the dry goods had been to dry up and the last and very best of the notions had been the notion to go away. Encinitas was only one of several such establishments hereabouts that has survived the unhappy omens of its birth. New Capital, wisely invested in roads instead of hotels, bids fair to put this pretty little town on a safe footing. At San Jalijo Canyon, where the Escondido Creek widens at its mouth to a considerable lagoon, the road crossed by a strip of beach on which breaks an unusually fine surf, with line upon line of long white rollers following each other in close succession. I should like to hear a winter storm beat on this exposed shore of shingle, as I have heard them on the shingle beaches of England, the wild air ringing with the shriek of multitudinous pebbles as they are driven to and fro by the claws of the raging sea. Above thunder of water and roar of buffeting wind, the cry of the tortured earth rises in a shrill appassionato, a magnificent concert of the elements. Crossing yet another lagoon at the mouth of the San Diego River, we entered the village of Del Mar. A picturesque modern hotel forms the nucleus for a score or two of cottages scattered near a charming beach, and the locality is notable to tree lovers as being the home of the Torrey Pine, Pinus Torriana, a tree whose circumscribed habit makes it a botanical curiosity. On the exposed cliff edges the wind-blown patriarchs of this little tribe crouch in eloquent attitudes and it was interesting to note the similarity of form of this sea neighbouring pine to that of the alpine white-bark species which I had seen the previous summer fighting for life on the other frontier at two miles of altitude in the Sierra Nevada. We camped a mile beyond the town at a small farm whose kind people gave us the freedom of their pump, no slight boon, I assure the non-California reader, and the next day struck inland, skirting the Soledad River. The name of this stream in no wise belies the solitary character of the country, where the scanty rainfall might well discharge the most optimistic of farmers. I knew the region twenty years ago, and the population now seemed to me more scanty than I remembered it at the time. Evening found us at Sorrento, a lonely settlement consisting of a store, a railway station, and two or three houses. Here we turned eastward and rode a mile or two up Las Peñasquitas Canyon to the ranch house of the one-time Alvarado Ranch, now incorporated in Las Peñasquitas Ranch, which formerly included only the upper part of the valley. A careworn woman and two wild-looking boys were working in the dusk near the house. 
and of the former we asked permission to camp by the only available water, which was within the farm enclosure. The request was neither granted nor denied, but implicitly discouraged. I make no claims to special penetration of character, but as I looked at her, and she looked with no friendliness at us, I felt sure I could trace the current of her nature, and read her present state of mind only too plainly. She was a young woman, and rather pretty. As a girl I think she had been very pretty. Her dress was rough and dirty, though natural enough to her masculine employment of digging. As we talked I noticed that she tried instinctively to hide her torn sleeves and disordered bodice, and I thought I could see beneath the inhospitable frown far less of inhospitality than of shame at her rough dress and her unfeminine labour. Poor woman! It was a trifling incident, a mere by-play in the tragedy of the eternal feminine, the tragedy of a losing struggle for grace and loveliness, not only of dress and feature, but also with them, and unconsciously felt to be symbolized by them, of mind and character, that old, unphilosophical, but very human relation of ideas. I saw it still more clearly when next morning we asked to be allowed to view the rooms of the old house. Disorder, struggle, and carelessness were written large over all. Yet with a curious sense, which I felt, without being able to explain, that they were hated and rebelled at. Poverty was written there too, unless I am vastly mistaken. Yet when we tendered payment for the privilege of camping it was steadily refused. My sister, though you will hardly see these words, the Spanish has a good adage for such cases. Dios se lo pagare. I do not fear that you will be the poorer for refusing that coin. As we rode away from the decaying house with its frayed old date palms and independent morning glories, we remarked again upon the discreditable feature of Western American life, which is illustrated by the condition of these interesting and once beautiful monuments to our history. Perhaps it would be too much to expect that those who have succeeded to the ownership of the estates of the Spanish Californians should expend a fraction of their revenues upon the preservation of the old houses. That is not our way. But it seems as if the State might well have taken sufficient interest in its own history to rescue one or two of these fine old houses from destruction. Even now a very small sum of public money would purchase and restore an example or two, and a mere trifle would keep them in repair. But we in America are obsessed with our own particular conception of progress, and self-sufficiency is always a blunder. Las Peñasquitas is a long, narrow valley, threaded by a small stream, which in summer takes refuge underground from the thirsty sun. Scattered sycamores and elders grew here and there along its channel their shade already, early in the day, preempted by groups of cattle. The canyon trends northeast, and when a slight rise of the ground opened a wider horizon, I recognized the distant outline of Queermaca Mountain, Queermac in the common speech, under whose nearer flanks I had lived twenty years before, while beyond it lay the home of my companion, amid the glistening sands and statuesque palms of the Colorado desert. At the ranch house we found a squad of carpenters at work obliterating the traces of a recent fire. The solid walls of adobe were intact, which was fortunate, since the art of building such is now almost gone out of mind among the native population. We lunched under a shady pepper and early in the afternoon resumed our way, which led by a steep road 
up from the canyons to the south. From the summit we looked out over a landscape quite different from any we had yet seen. For miles to south, east, and west stretched a level mesa, covered with a growth of greasewood brush, whose dull olive was unbroken but for the road, which ran down to the vanishing point, straight as a line could be drawn. This was the Linda Vista Mesa, one of the most hopeless of those arid tracts of land which, under the glamour of the boom, found ready purchasers at high figures, but have since found none at any figure at all. The soil is red and clayey, not that good red that tells of the blood and juices of the earth, but a pale brick colour, malevolent even in appearance. Its superficial resemblance to the famous red soil on which some of the noted olive groves of California are now thriving invited boomers to advertise it as having no frost, no alkali, no hard pan, to which they should have added uh, no rain to speak of and no crop. The ground is packed with cobblestones, fuller than ever was a pudding of raisins. While, so far from there being no hard pan, the unlucky purchasers often found it necessary to blast the holes for their ill-omened trees in order to shatter the rock that lies like sheet iron just below the surface. In discussing the possible uses and prospects of this region, Eitel and I agreed that, upon the whole, a kangaroo ranch seemed to offer the best chances of success to an adventurous speculator. Without any special knowledge of the kangaroo, we had a strong idea that this was about the sort of thing that appeals to that singular creature. Willingly we turned our backs upon the mesa, and entered on a long canyon that bears the name of the great family of Murphy. Last year I had camped by lovely lakes under the shadow of Murphy's Dome in the northern Sierras. Now we searched and searched in vain for a trickle of water in Murphy's Canyon at the uttermost southwest verge of the country, for now we were within twenty miles of the Mexican frontier. We dismounted, and mile after mile led our weary horses down the interminable grade. About sundown we debouched into the valley of the San Diego River, generally called Mission Valley, after the Mission of San Diego, the remains of which stand hereabout. Turning up the valley for half a mile, we prospected among the willows and cottonwoods of the riverbed for water, and found a few small pools, standing but not stagnant. Here we unsaddled under a goodly cottonwood near which was a space of fair pasturage. It was five weeks to a day since we had left El Monte, and now we were practically at San Diego, the southern limit of our joint expedition. The event warranted an uncommon supper, and thereafter we lay at ease while we smoked, and indulged the retrospective vein. The sky was all but cloudless. The stars shone cheerfully down, and the mild and friendly air for which San Diego is renowned invited us to a pleasant slumber, or equally pleasant reverie. A vagrant mosquito now and then sounded his unrelenting horn, but was easily discouraged or quashed. Even while we praised the charms of lying awake, we fell asleep, and when I awoke, the moon, her last quarter half spent, looked down on me from a large stage of her journey that told me it was near morning. Before it was daylight the sky was overcast, for the sea fog had come in on the wings of the morn, an arrangement that is always agreeable to me, since it allows of breakfast being cooked without enduring a superfluous blast of sun. I confess I find the manufacture of flapjacks over a smoky fire, with a fervent sun castigating me from above, 
an exercise that puts too much strain upon the early morning temper. The next day was Sunday, so we did not break camp. The peace of the day was somewhat disturbed by a promiscuous bombardment from the sportsmen of San Diego, who arrived early and in unreasonable numbers to bag the mission doves and rabbits. We pastured the horses well out in the open, where they would be in plain view, and ourselves sat in partial security under the lee of a scrap of adobe wall, gazing off at the mellow fragment of western antiquity, with its romantic setting of waving palms and black and silver olives, and trying, without too much exertion, to call to mind the long past days when the scene that now lay so solitary before us was busy with cowled monks, Indian neophytes, and Spanish men-at-arms. Early on Monday morning we set off westward down the valley, and came by the middle of the morning to the northern suburb of San Diego, which is called Old Town, in distinction from the modern city. It lies at the head of the superb bay of San Diego, while the newer city occupies the middle sweep. Its great interest is the old mansion of the Estudio family, a good example of the early California residence which has lately been restored and is used as a tourist attraction. A small restaurant takes up one of the rooms where genuine Spanish dishes are served by velvet-eyed senoritas. We called for tamales, believing that we might here do so with more confidence than one can usually feel when indulging in that ingenious article. A ride of an hour brought us to the present city of San Diego, where our appearance, long of hair, stained with travel and somewhat out of repair, occasioned no little comment among the idlers on flower-covered porches and shady balconies. We had some little difficulty in these days of the all-usurping automobile in finding a livery stable, and I was amused at Chino's evident anxiety on the matter. He clearly understood that the change in his surroundings portended hay, grain, and convenient lodging arrangements with the society of interesting strangers of his kind, and he was naturally eager to arrive at the haven. When at last we came to the expected wide doorway, he steered promptly and with determination for it, and he and Billy lost not a moment in attacking the hay, nibbling surreptitiously at the fragrant bales as they passed to their stalls. We next sought modest quarters for ourselves, where the spectacles and benevolent aspect of the good landlady could not quite disguise her qualms at our dusty and tramp-like appearance. Here we cast anchor, spending our days among barbers and clothiers, and our nights in tossing on beds of unaccustomed softness. I had known the city twenty years before, when it was drawing its first bewildered breaths after the cataclysm of its boom, and I had always cherished a pleasant feeling for the place. Why has Smithville hosts of friends, while Jonesville, its twin in all points of outward seeming, is condemned by all men as a blot upon the geography of its state? The peculiar subjectiveness of towns is a curious study in what one might call physical psychology. The purpose of these pages does not require a description of the city, nor do my own preferences lead me much into the regions of statistics and real estate. Suffice it to say that San Diego is a prosperous, energetic place which is rapidly adding to its present population of some forty thousand contented people. I own I was best pleased to walk along the waterfront, by the rows of little amphibian huts that I remembered from former days. Flowers bloomed in cans and boxes all about these humble dwellings, and the boats slapped idly on the water by the crazy landing stages. Odours, unnamed because unnameable, greeted me with claims upon my friendly remembrance, and the new generation of waterfront children 
seemed no less arch and engaging than those of yore. Three steamers lay at the wharves, and two large lumber schooners swung in the tideway. A knot of torpedo boats were anchored on the Coronado side of the bay. Point Loma, famous among theosophists, stood up well and boldly, a worthy headland for the abutment of a sovereign state. And in the south, beyond the forlorn wastes of National City, rose, wistful and pale, the blue highlands of Mexico. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 5 Northward Bound San Fernando, its mission. The San Fernando Valley. Topanga Canyon. Wild Flowers. A Wayside Thomas. The Coast. Dana's opinion of San Pedro, Northwestward Ho, the Malibu, no trespassing, shoreside sheep. I am an object of compassion, the pro and con of solitude, camp by the ocean edge. The middle of May of the next year, after my expedition with Eitel southward from Los Angeles found me again in the saddle. This time I was alone and northward bound. My appetite for practical geography had only been whetted by the fraction I have seen of the coastline of the state, and I felt bound now to complete the unit. I had the same horse and much the same equipment as before, the principal difference being that, to save weight, I carried no gun, but instead a short-jointed fly-rod which found frequent use. Also, I had had made a little tent of very light oiled material, fitted with jointed aluminium poles, the whole weighing about six pounds. This was in view of the fact that the rainy season might overtake me before I completed the trip. For a great part of the journey I did not carry it with me, but had it sent forward to San Francisco ready for the expected change of climate. Again my starting point was El Monte, where my good Chino had just enjoyed a liberal vacation in pasture. I took a somewhat circuitous route to the coast, and for two reasons. In the first place I was willing to forego the sight of that galaxy of seashore pleasure towns, Santa Monica, Redondo, Long Beach, San Pedro, and several more, which, in the exuberant metaphor of real estate circulars, are flung like a tribute of gems at the feet of imperial Los Angeles. Hmm. In the second, I wished to visit the Mission of San Fernando, lying twenty miles northwest of Los Angeles, and half as much more from my point of departure. I had a long ride and a hot day for my start, and Chino's load was no light one. I rode by way of Pasadena and the cañada that connects the San Gabriel and San Fernando valleys, and put up for the night at the little town of San Fernando. The next day being Sunday I remained about the place, while Chino, in stable, made industrious preparations for strenuous days at hand. The mission of San Fernando, which was founded in 1797, probably never had as great claims to notice, on the score of beauty, as had some others of those interesting monuments. But the heavy, low building, with its long line of arches, red-tiled roof, and elementary campanile, is pleasing for its simplicity, and seems appropriate to the humility of the Order of St. Francis. The church itself is in ruins, and shows plain evidences of the unhallowed industry of treasure-seekers with crowbars. An old Mexican now guards the place, unlocking for a small payment wormy doors with fiddle-like keys, 
and leading the visitor by precarious stairways to mouldy lofts and cellars, peopled with the shades of priest and neophyte, commandante and soldado de cuero. The San Fernando Valley, through which I rode next day, is an example of those famous ranches in which the lands of California were held by grantees of the Spanish or Mexican government. This was one of the last of them to remain unbroken, and was now in process of being surveyed for selling off to settlers of the new order. It opened before me in league on league of grain, waving ready for harvest, a crop to be measured by the thousands of tons. The landscape flickered under an ardent sun, and as we plodded hour after hour along the tedious straight roads, escorted by clouds of pungent dust, I panted for the clean, crisp breezes which I knew were blowing just beyond the low range of the Santa Monica Mountains to the south. No single tree offered respite of shade, and the two or three ranch houses we passed looked almost hideous in their blistering whitewash. Gradually the valley began to close in toward the west, where the wooded seamy hills rose to meet the higher Santa Susanas, and turning at last southward I struck into the main coast road and came by sundown to the little village of Calabasas drawing rein before a small building which bore the sign of the Hunter's Inn. Automobiles were whizzing about like cockchafers, and the landlord, after a careless word in answer to my inquiry for board and lodging, turned his attention to the superior order of travellers, leaving me to arrange where and how I pleased, for both my horse and myself. At the third request, he condescended to show me a room which made amends by its pleasing rusticity. There was a wren in occupation, and a great oak tapped with friendly fingers on window and roof. Supper, when at last it came, showed host and hostess in a better light, so that conversation ran agreeably. The night was made pleasant by a sound as of rain on the roof, from the drops condensed by the fog by my sociable oak. When I took the road early next morning, the fog still hung over the landscape in wreaths of thoughtful grey, broken to east and south by auspicious gleams of sun. A superb freshness lay upon every leaf and flower, and the very stones of the highway appeared to share the improvement. The road now struck directly down to the coast, following the Topanga Canyon, and the way was enlivened by a thread of water which grew quickly into a sizable brook. I was impressed by the ruggedness of the mountain slopes, which rose in striking masses and contour, and in places pushed the road into a mere defile, overhung by precipices of fine height and verticality. At the northern end of the canyon are many neat little hillside farms, mainly of Mexicans, and the dust of the road was plentifully marked by the scamperings of children's naked feet. The summer was at its full of flowers. The beautiful tree poppy grew freely in many places, bearing shallow cups of palest gold at twice a man's height. By the roadside bloomed the great golden Mariposa tulip, flecked with brown, a truly magnificent blossom. Mountain lilac was just breaking into clouds of fragrant azure, and wild roses, daintily simple, gleamed from every thicket. I always feel that the wandering Briton owes a special debt to nature for the wide dissemination of this delightful flower which greets him in so many alien lands. Poppies, mimulus, brodias, and many more added their cheerful colours to the summer show. There were few travellers on the road, but while I stopped to lunch by a little stream that came in at a bend of the canyon, an old man came by, driving a wagon, 
and turned in for the midday rest at the same spot. We fell to chat about such universal topics as crops, aeroplanes, and local politics, and grew quite cordial over the sugar trust. I saw that my friend's attention had been caught by Chino's equipment, but it was not until I was ready to move on that he brought out the inevitable, What are you bound for? When I replied, To Oregon, I saw a look of annoyance come into his face. I had already found that my expedition appeared a formidable one to the average stay-at-home, but this old fellow was a frank unbeliever. "'Where did you say?' he inquired again, sternly this time. "'Oregon,' I answered. "'Why not?' But he felt sure now that he was being trifled with, and the only response to my parting good day was a mortified grunt. The former day's travel had been a pretty hard one for us both, and I determined to make this one correspondingly light. So when, by mid-afternoon, we came near the mouth of the canyon, as I knew by the distant sound of breakers, I stopped at a little opening and pitched camp. The stream contained some fair-sized trout, and half an hour's fishing produced my supper. A ruminative evening by the campfire closed the day. I turned in betimes, and lay once more, as many times last year, listening to the murmur of the sea, which was now again to be my great monologist for perhaps half a year. I was astir by first daylight, and was early on the way to the mouth of the canyon. As I reached the top of a little rise, the roar of the sea close by met me with a sort of boisterous friendliness, like the welcoming of some tremendous mastiff. Looking eastward from the cliff on which I stood, I could see the long wharf at Santa Monica, and beyond a long curve of shore that ran to the Palos Verdes and the promontory of Point Fermin. Beyond that lay the town of San Pedro, detested of Dana, who, in 1835, reported it as being universally called the Hell of California, and who himself wrote of it that this rascally hole of San Pedro is unsafe in every wind but a southwester, which is seldom known to blow more than once in half a century. Now, three-quarters of a century later, the rascally hole is in process of becoming a great port, with a much wider range of interest than the shipping of California banknotes, which Dana calls the hides which form the return cargo of the pilgrim. Turning to the west, my eye followed the long reaches of broken cliff along which ran my road, until the land view was closed by the low yellow cape of Point Doom. I lingered here a few minutes while I enjoyed the occasion, for here my northern coast trip was actually to begin. It seemed in a modest way momentous to be turning my face northward and westward, and I surveyed in fancy the long leagues of coast which I was to travel, to where, instead of languid dunes and sunburned brush, I should ride by stalwart cliffs and through stately alleys of forest. There was deep pleasure in the prospect. Thoreau says that the southwest was his point of inclination for travel, and enlarges, in his ingenious way, upon the reasons for his preference. For me it is always the northwest that captures my imagination. The west is but another name for the wild, Thoreau remarks and in the same fanciful way the north seems to me somehow to signify the noble. Was not the northwest passage always a natural goal for enterprise and gallantry? Farewell, then, I said, land of the south and sea of the south, and welcome the ultimate west, and the dark, the grey, the solitary north. My chino, meanwhile, free from such unpractical abstractions, was employing his leisure with the cliffside herbage. 
he is an engaging creature and we had many sentiments and even conversations together sharing confidences upon the quality of the water or the state of the road and other such matters of mutual interest automobiles naturally were often a topic and i may say that chino's views on that subject which may easily be guessed were quite my own turning then westward a few miles of pleasant road brought us to the entrance to the malibu ranch a long strip of land lying between the southward-facing foothills of the santa monica mountains and the shore at the gate was posted a warning that trespassing was strictly prohibited i knew that public right-of-way through the ranch had long been contested by the owners and i had been warned that i might find my way disputed by their myrmidons with shotguns but there was nothing except the passive placard to prevent my entering and i passed in with little doubt of making an equally peaceable exit at the western end on a limb of a sycamore that overhung the road a large cross was roughly cut it marks the place of one of the many commonplace tragedies of early california days some horse-thief name now unknown was hanged there perhaps it would be better to say some alleged horse-thief for mistakes no doubt occurred on occasions when somebody had to hang and quickly too and when justice playing a sort of hide-and-seek might let her sword fall suddenly upon any members of the free and easy community who was so unwise as to get in the way the hard sand beach here offered a tempting road along the water's edge and i turned chino down to it he was a little averse at first to facing the burst of the rollers and stepping into the hissing froth but he soon caught the idea and with arched neck and gay bearing splashed through the wash of the breakers and kicked the creamy fans of water into sparkling showers i had only seen one or two people on the road that day and it seemed as if we were quite the only trespassers until i saw a mass of whitish objects approaching and heard a new sound mingling with the lazy booming of the sea as we came nearer i saw that it was a band of sheep which were being driven along the beach by a mounted mexican aided by dogs it seemed odd to see these pastoral creatures marching composedly along neptune's frontier nibbling at seaweed their voices rising in plaintive crescendo above the recitative of the surf a splendid ram walked with immense dignity at the head of the flock his long fleece quivering as he stepped like that great beard of the prophet by which good mussulmans swear the herder rode behind on a lively bronco we stopped to pass a few words and i learned that he and his band had come down the coast over a hundred miles and were bound for the neighbourhood of san juan capistrano nearly as far still to the south the mention of my own destination excited his pity ah it makes much cold there i've heard that it rains always is it not true i explained that it was not quite so bad as that but he still gazed at me with compassion and rejoined with a shrug not to see ever the sun and the fruits and the good wine do not grow there ha huh! such a country i should not like it his sheep had left him far behind while we talked and he now said adios and turned to overtake them but as he rode away he still shook his head over the thought of a country where it rained always and the good wine could not grow the promontory of point doom like a flattened turret stands well out to the south about midway of the malibu here the road bent inland for a mile or two but soon again came down to the shore frequent canyons each of them carrying a small stream of water broke the seaward slope of the mountains evening was drawing near when i found myself at the trancas canyon at the mouth of which lies a small brackish lagoon 
Here I found a good camping place under a tent-like sycamore. Orioles supplied my supper with music, and a night of balmy airs, with the drowsy rumble of breakers not a hundred yards away, rounded off a highly pleasant day. The first sound of the morning was the wild cry of gulls as they quarrelled over breakfast. As I ate my solitary flapjacks, I was half inclined to wish that it had been possible for me also to quarrel with somebody, but the presence of Chino grazing hard by allayed the loneliness for me, as I hope mine did for him. We were early on our march, following the shore under a bright morning sun. I could see a few miles out a white steamer making eastward, and waved my good morning to the passengers who, I took for granted, were gazing toward me, though not exactly at me, from over the side. The road lay alternately along the beach and the cliff, where yuccas bloomed plentifully among the brush. Those white banoosed Arabs looked out of the place standing here and there within a stone's throw of the ocean, and their exotic scent mingled strangely with the sharp tang of seaweed. Now we pushed through thickets of head-high mustard that dusted us with yellow. Next sunflowers stared at us eye to eye, and again lavender sage refreshed us with fugitive dashes of perfume. The rattle of machinery came faintly to me, and I could see the mower and his team creeping along high up on the hillside, a mile away. It was far too heavenly a day for one to be in a hurry, and I dismounted and removed Chino's bridle, leaving him at liberty to saunter and graze, while I sauntered and praised. Only here and there a thump of thorny cactus obtruded a suggestion of evil. I suppose that cactus may have been unknown before the fall. One of the compensations to be set against the lack of a companion was that I was free to stop or proceed, hurry or delay, camp here or there, entirely at my own choice, only having regard for my horse's needs as to forage. So when, early in the afternoon, I came to an attractive little stream that ran in a deep canyon, filled with sycamores and wind-blown oaks, I paused and considered. The brook chattered happily over the rocks of the beach until it met the sea, like the sudden cutting off of the life of a child. Close by it was a triangle of clean sand littered with driftwood, and near at hand there was a space of good fodder. It is not always that things arrange themselves so propitiously. I could make camp not twenty yards from the very verge of the ocean. The opportunity was not to be missed. I got my little tent pitched in spite of a strong breeze which showered me with flying sand, and then spent a lazy afternoon in the society of the gulls, my loquacious little brook, and the indolent roar of breakers. The wind increased during the evening to a point that made a campfire something more than a luxury, so I started a noble blaze and humbly emulated the poet with his fire of driftwood. I found, too, that my little shelter, like his, farmhouse old, gave to the sea breeze, damp and cold, an easy entrance. Sand makes one of the least desirable of sleeping places, and all night I was consciously or subconsciously aware of the thunder of the waves close by. Once or twice I heard the spray rattling like hail on the tent, or the hiss of the sea froth as it washed far up on the beach then sank away into the sand. I had picketed Chino in a more sheltered spot fifty yards away, and, blanketed warmly, I think he passed the night quite as comfortably as his master. I was up at four o'clock and broke camp early. The breeze was strong and keen, and an inexhaustible freshness was in the air, as if the world had been created within the week. 
gulls and pelicans were fishing busily, and on the horizon two faint smudges marked where steamers were passing. After a few miles more of alternate shore and cliff, we crossed the line into Ventura County, and at the same time bade adieu to the Malibu and its cantankerous but futile placards. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Six An Inland Trail. Strange Country. Downs and Coombs. Bony Mountain. Friendly Mexicans Again. Sycamore Canyon. Sunday in Camp. A Night Disturbance. Oak Glades. The Santa Barbara Channel Islands in View. The Resting Place of Cabrillo. Wanami. A Moribund Town. Oxnard. The Hated Rival. An Embarrassing Companion. Ventura. Its Mission. San Buenaventura, Nasturtiums, and Simplicity. The broken country which had lain to the north of the road began now to come down to the shore, and the road soon struck inland up Little Sycamore Canyon. I studied the coast beyond with a view to travelling by the beach, if possible. A high bluff coast, much broken, ran for a few miles to the northwest, culminating in the fine headland of Laguna Peak, which rises in striking profile to a height of fourteen hundred feet. The cliffs rose high and steep from water's edge, and I knew, moreover, that just beyond lay the Mugu Lagoon, and a long stretch of sea-level sand and marshland where it would be difficult, if not impossible, to travel on horseback. So I turned into the canyon to find a trail by which I might cross the mountains and come down into the valley of the Santa Clara. The canyon was pleasant with shade of oak and sycamore, and vocal with murmur of stream and sprightly voices of many birds. It soon narrowed to a defile and the road came to an abrupt end, but no sign of trail appeared. I felt sure there must be a route across this narrow belt of mountains, and I knew also that it could be but little travelled. After half an hour of search I found faint indications of a trail leading off to the west. With some misgivings I turned into it hauling my reluctant companion up a steep mountainside, slippery with short dry grass. The track was hardly discernible, and was so confused with cattle paths that I was often in doubt whether I was on it or off. The hillside was hot and shadeless, and as we panted and perspired up the ascent we both, I think, wished ourselves trespassers again on the Malibu, with its fresh shore breezes and plentiful cool streams. For two hours we toiled on and up, with frequent stops for breath, and on my part, admiration. The country was strange and un-Californian. In all my wanderings through this varied state I had seen no other region of this kind. It reminded me constantly of the downs of southern England, only that the hills were higher and steeper. The short sodded grass may well have been the wise turf of Kipling Sussex, but for the Castilias, Azulias, and yellow poppies, which thinly sprinkled it, and occasional yuccas shooting up from the small islands of brush. Now and then a distant glimpse of ocean far below confirmed the resemblance, or some deeply cut canyon carried the mind a little farther afield, 
to the Coombs of Dorset or Devon. When the trail had climbed to a height of fifteen hundred feet, there opened a still more striking landscape. Nearby to the north rose the fine shape of Bony Mountain, its highest crags hidden in dragging mists, and far in the distance a high blue range marked the Topper Topper and Pine Mountain country beyond the Santa Clara River. More to the west, blue with summer haze, the wide valley stretched away to the Pacific, and between lay the expanse of rough, brushy hills through which I have to find a way. It was getting toward evening when, still following at best I could the elusive trail, I noticed on the hillside a little fenced pasture in which three horses were grazing. Evidently there was a farm nearby, and going over to investigate I saw some cultivated land lying in a narrow valley not far from a thousand feet almost perpendicularly below. As the trail seemed to bear away from the place, I abandoned it, and, leading Chino, made the best of my way down to the valley. At the bottom I found a small stream, and both of us being pretty well tired out, I deferred visiting the ranch until the morning, and made camp for the night. Half an hour next morning brought us to the ranch. From the chorus of dogs which hailed our approach I guessed the owners to be Mexicans, though the land showed more careful farming than those people of the non-strenuous life usually attempt. I was right. Under a shady live oak I found a handsome old Mexican who was smearing with butter a number of little Spanish cheeses, more of which were drying on a platform built among the branches of the oak tree overhead. The old man was very deaf, and it required all my Spanish and my breath to introduce myself and explain my presence, which plainly surprised him. In reply I learned that he was the owner of the place, Jesus Serrano by name, and I was invited to tie up my horse and rest the old gentleman insisting that I take his chair while he made shift with a sawbuck. A young man leading a saddled horse now appeared, introduced himself as Francisco Serrano, and subsided on the ground for a chat. When they heard that I had camped so near them, they asked why I had not come to the ranch and stayed with them for the night, saying they had plenty of room and hay. I found later that the plentiful horse-room consisted of two small cabins, each containing a single bed, and I have little doubt that either of them would, as a matter of course, have slept on the bare floor in order to accommodate an entire stranger. Such is the instinctive kindness of these people, whom it is the fashion to condemn for the lack of some far less excellent virtues. I passed a very pleasant hour with them, and when I rose to go the sun offered to put me on a cut-off trail that would save me some miles. The old gentleman presented me with one of his cheeses, explaining that I must eat it with chili, and should find it good for the health. Francisco slung a rifle to his saddle, and, escorted by half a dozen eager dogs, we rode away. The trail was down the canyon and mainly in the bed of the stream. My guide splashed and clattered ahead, pointing out here and there the scene of some episode of wildcat, coyote, or mountain lion. He had an eye for the flowers, too, and often drew my attention to some clump of fragrant ceanothus or wild rose, or bush of toyone, the Christmas holly of California at that season in full summer glory of white. When he put me well on my way, my companion bade me good-bye, and turned back. I was soon in the main Sycamore Canyon. The road marked on my map was nothing more than a fair trail, 
and I doubt whether wagon had ever passed that way. A good stream ran among the boulders, and there was pasturage in plenty, so though it was still early, I resolved to camp and devote the remainder of the day to the cooking of beans, that invaluable ration of the western traveller. The next day also, being Sunday, I passed in camp with Chino's full concurrence. Now and again a few cattle strayed by, but otherwise the solitude was unbroken. At night an alarm was caused by some nocturnal visitor. Chino, who was staked near by where I slept, awoke me by snorting and rearing in great excitement. I got into my boots and made a circuit of the camp with my revolver, but was unable to find the cause of the disturbance, uh, probably a roaming wildcat or mountain lion. Such incidents are annoying, and hereafter at night I kept my revolver handy in my bootleg, close to my head. Morning brought in one of those particularly perfect days that remain in one's memory like the special incidents of childhood, or one's best catch of trout. The sky was softly clouded, the air moist and gentle, and the trees wore that half-smiling, half-pensive look that makes one wonder if they have not some faculty of enjoyment, or even remembrance. We moved leisurely along under a leafy screen of oaks, whose black stems leaned in pictorial attitude across softly lighted vistas of open canyon. Birds flitted quietly about, unhurried, like us. Against the skyline of the high smooth hills tiny cattle were placidly grazing. Here and there a wet sycamore showed conspicuously among the oaks, whose rounded tops, balanced with Spanish moss, cast a tragic darkness over the brook. The creek lay in pools, its quietude deepening the dreaminess of the scene and the morning. It was one of those days when one expects something fine and unusual to happen, a storm, for instance, though at this season that would have been out of the question. If it had been a few centuries earlier, and in Europe instead of America, Sir Tristram de something might have come riding along one of those green bound on some errand of joyous peril. With this in mind, a glance at Chino with his panoply of comfortable saddle-bags and blankets was almost comic. The trail, which had risen gradually, now crossed the divide between two high-grassed hills, and I looked out upon the open valley, chequered in dark greens of beets and pale golds of stubble, running level to the sea, six or eight miles away. Fifteen or twenty miles out to the west lay a group of rocky islands, the nearest one an odd conglomeration of spikes and splinters, the others more formal in outline. They were the Santa Barbara Channel Islands, Anacapa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel. Somewhere on the last named, which is the most westerly, is the resting place of the brave navigator Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, who, only fifty years after Columbus's epoch-making voyage, coasted far up the Californias to die as he was returning on this lonely outpost of the wonderful new world. With a backward glance at the fine shape of Bony Mountain, his crag still attractively shrouded in a mystery of cloud, I started down the steep descent. The trail soon broadened to a wagon road, and before long I rode out on the rich farming land of the Guadalasca Ranch. To this succeeded a long straight country road, bordered by prosperous fields of beans and beets, the staples of the country, and in due time we entered the sleepy little coast village of Wanami, 
where I put up my horse at the decaying livery stable, and found clean and simple quarters for myself at the village inn. Waname is the ghost of a once flourishing town. On its one business street, the vacant stores, with their hopeless signs of to rent, stand ranked in shabby idleness like a row of blind beggars. Not very many years ago this was a lively little port, but a beet sugar factory sprang into existence a few miles to the north, and that, with its joint advantage of a railway, was too much for Wanami. The greater part of the population, and not a few of the houses themselves, made off bodily to the new centre, and left Wanami nothing to boast of but its smooth, clean beach and its busy past, during which, as a gloomy citizen assured me, the place had been the scene of as much traffic as any other two blamed towns of the county. Now only one small coasting steamer calls at long intervals, and occasionally a lumber schooner puts in with its fragrant load from the northern forests, while a stage carries scanty mails and infrequent passengers over to the railway at Oxnard, the hated rival. Still the place has an air of restfulness, which is pleasant, even though it be involuntary, and moreover it has a lighthouse, a modest wooden building, but like all lighthouses, a fascinating object. As I stood on the shore in the dusk and watched the steady beam of light streaming out over the grey wash of the ocean, there seemed something godlike in its kindly vigilance. All night it shone into the little room where I slept, throwing its moonlight gleam every few seconds upon the white wall beside my bed. The next day was some holiday, a decoration day, I think, and the Wanamians, throwing care away, were early astir and off on a picnic. When I went to the stable for Chino, I found him and the stable cat in solitary possession. I saddled up and rode on toward Oxnard, taking the main road due north, instead of trying to keep to the coast, having been warned of possible trouble with quicksand if I should try to ford the Santa Clara River. Oxnard was also on holiday, and all the stores were closed except those of the indefatigable Orientals, and fortunately that of an Armenian shoemaker whose services I required. A Japanese girl in kimono and slippers was sitting on the sill of a doorway that opened on an upper veranda, daintily smoking a gilded porcelain pipe. Riding on towards Ventura after a short stay, I was overtaken by a young Oxnardian in a buggy, whose curiosity over my outfit led him to check his speed and enter into conversation. I was glad of company, and we rode a few miles side by side. At the village of El Rio he begged me to look after his horse for a moment, and vanished round the corner. Twenty minutes passed without his returning, and I was just starting in search when I saw him approaching with a peculiar smile and gait and an armful of bottled beer. As his horse was a spirited one, and the man himself was half intoxicated, it seemed necessary for someone to keep an eye on him in the interests of public safety. I resisted his pressing invitation to get in and drive with him, but kept alongside and awaited developments. They came quickly, as he emptied the bottles at a lively rate, but he obligingly took no offence at my refusing to share them with him. His driving soon became erratic, and when he had twice narrowly escaped driving into the ditch and once into an automobile, I proposed that he let me take the lines and drive him into Ventura, his destination. Rather to my surprise he agreed to this but only, he was good enough to say, 
because he considered me in the light of a close friend, for no one but him had ever driven Ginger. I tied Chino behind the buggy and got in, and before long he was sufficiently lost to his interests to allow of my dropping the remaining bottles overboard as we crossed the river, and I was at liberty to enjoy the evening beauty of shadow on the mountains near by to the north, while he slumbered peacefully at my side. When we arrived on the outskirts of Ventura, I stopped, shook my companion with some violence, and asked him whether he thought he was capable of driving. He replied with indignation that he had been driving all the time, and that I must not think that I could guy him, but ended by declaring that I was a good fellow, and giving me the name of a hotel in town where the knowing ones among the boys put up, and to which the mention of his name would procure me admission. As he seemed really pretty sober, I thought he might be trusted to escape trouble, so declining an urgent invitation to drink out of an empty bottle, I bade him good-bye, and struck into town by a crossroad. Ventura is a modest little city of some three thousand people. Though it is the county seat of a prosperous county, it has never seriously attempted to compete with the other cities of the South for preeminence, nor any eminence at all, except that of natural attractions and steady, well-ordered progress. The people who live in its pretty cottages enjoy, on the whole, as I judged, the continual feast of a contented mind, speaking well of their city, but without that undue fanfanade which, like the voluble wiles of a street fakir, does but warn the judicious of danger. Its situation certainly is super-excellent, by the shore of a summery sea, and yet at the very foot of picturesque mountains, which, at this season, was dusted over with the gold of the wild mustard. A fine stream flows into the sea at the western edge of the city, and from May to October the breakfast tables of Ventura need never go troutless. The place has some little historic attraction, too, for here in 1782 was founded the mission of that comfortable-sounding saint, Buena Ventura. It was not one of the handsomest of the missions, but it was never allowed to fall into disrepair, and now provides a dignified and interesting place of worship for the Catholics of Ventura. In the neat garden of the priest's house which adjoins the mission are a few ancient fruit trees, among them a solemn old fig, which may well have witnessed the prosperity of anti-secularization days. I took it as another token of the pleasant quality of the Venturans that the unpretending nasturtium seemed to be the popular flower. Banks and hedges of them greeted the eye everywhere, and banners of gay blossoms hung over the low sea-cliff from the gardens that ran to its edge. I think that Flora was in one of her happiest moods when she invented this sprightly flower, and wherever I see nasturtiums in the garden I argue smiles and sweet simplicity in the house. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 7 Fording the Ventura River. Tramps in Clover. Hospitality Unfailing. Carpinteria. Origins of Spanish Place Names. A Huge Grapevine. Summerland oil wells in tide-water, Montecito and millionaires, Santa Barbara as Dana saw it, and today. The Mission, a link with the past, the De La Guerra Mansion, 
Santa Barbara of the Far Future. From Ventura, the coast takes a northwesterly sweep, the mountains now pressing closely down to the shore. There are two roads from here to Santa Barbara, the inland one, preferred by automobilists, which crosses the mountains by the Casitas Pass, and another, more to my mind, which follows the coast in company with the railway. The bridge over the Ventura River had been demolished by the floods of the previous winter, and the ford was rather too wide and deep for Chino's peace of mind. When in midstream he became nervous, finding the water touching his belly, and proposed to turn back, but I had seen another horseman cross the day before, and knew we would get through. So, punching him industriously with my heel, I got him over, though not without getting both saddle-bags and boots waterlogged. All day we travelled an attractive coast, while I let the monotone of the surf lull me into a mood of reverie. Houses were few, and hour after hour passed without sight of other travellers. Occasionally a train whirled by, breaking the indolent summer quiet with a clatter of wheels and rhythmic clangour of bell. By now we had been passed several times since starting by regular trains, and the trainmen began to toot whistles and wave friendly hands to us as they flashed by. Numerous canyons led back into a maze of rough, though not high, mountains, which culminated some miles to the north in the long ridge of the Santa Inez range, and at longer intervals capes ran seaward, shutting off the view of the farther coast, and providing constant material for curiosity and imagination. Now and then a distant vessel drew my gaze and raised a lazy speculation whether its freight were lumber, oil, or humanity, and whether it was bound to a nearby port or some romantic voyage to, say, near Valparaiso or Zanzibar. The Channel Islands, looming faintly in southern haze, were no less interesting for the opposite reason, namely on the score of their being almost uninhabited. Just beyond the promontory of Punta Gorda, was a tiny village, lying a little off the road. A little trio of tramps were sitting about a fire, over which steamed a sooty coffee-pot. A lordly steak reposed on a newspaper, awaiting its turn, together with onions and half a loaf of bread. I wondered whether the villagers could have paid such a heavy assessment willingly. Mid-afternoon found us at Rincon Point. A home-like farm, shady with palms and olives, occupies the level land of the point, and Rincon Creek marks the boundary of Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. It seemed an audacious spot for a camp, so I boldly entered an open gate of the farm fence, and found an inviting nook among the trees beside the stream. There were one or two trouty-looking pools nearby and I spent a profitable hour with my fly-rod. As I sat by my evening fire, tracing Chino's wanderings on the hillside above by the jingle of his bell, I received a visit from the owner of the farm. My apologies for trespassing were at once discounted by his friendly manner as he dismounted for a chat, remarking that I ought to have come and put up at the house. I may say here, that in the whole course of the trip I found the milk of human kindness always flowing, plentiful and rich, whenever I had occasion to draw upon it. The road here leaves the shore, and for a few miles lies through a fine farming country stretching back to where the Santa Inez mountains rise abruptly to nearly four thousand feet. It would be hard to imagine a more desirable location for a farming life than this belt of richest soil, backed by opaline mountains, and fronted by the calmest of seas. Here and there a clump of feathery eucalyptus, or a rank of sombre cypress, marked the place of a farm, and supplied the one element that nature had omitted from an otherwise perfect landscape. 
to this succeeded the lemon and orange groves of carpenteria an old and small but pretty settlement or rather two settlements the old spanish and decrepit and the new american and thriving if report speaks the truth the prosperity of one local landowner was gained by methods which entitle him to the special contempt not only of his defrauded mexican neighbours but of all persons whose sympathies go with one naboth in a well-known incident of israelitish history the name of this village offers an example of the manner in which a great number of places in the state come by their titles this and many other points on the coast were named by members of the expedition of which father palou was the historian which passed up the coast by land from san diego to monterey in the year seventeen sixty nine at this spot some indians were found engaged in building a canoe and from that circumstance the soldiers of the party named the place for the spanish word for a carpenter's shop similarly from nothing more important than the killing of a gull a point a few miles to the west was named gaviota that the clergy also took their full share in the work of bestowing titles is plain enough from the generous manner in which the saints were remembered i have heard of a celebrated grapevine hereabouts which proclaims itself the goliath of its kind i turned aside to see it and found the monster in an enclosure behind a little house which stands on the side of a vanished adobe when i viewed the enormous trunk nearly ten feet in girth i could easily credit its claim as to size and to the statement of its owner that it bore from six to twelve tons of fruit yearly the limbs one of which i measured and found it three and a half feet around cover a space a hundred feet square and are supported on a framework of massive timbers there is a legend that it dates from the year eighteen hundred and nine the birth year of so many great men but be that as it may it shows no sign of decay and should be good for many a decade in proof of one tall California story at least. I bought a bottle of juice made from its grapes, and ate my lunch under the ample shade, looking, I was aware, like a sort of modern and commonplace silliness. From the increasing number of automobiles that bequeathed us their superfluous dust and odours, I knew that we were nearing Santa Barbara we were in fact already within the limits of the generous grant of land which belonged of old to the spanish pueblo a few miles brought us to summer land where a number of black and oily derricks built on wharves were robbing neptune of a long unsuspected asset the place which was originally a spiritualist colony now resounds with the creak and groan of pumping plants and at night might i should think be the congenial rendezvous for ghosts on the right now appeared the wooded slopes of montecito a lovely expanse of rolling country sacred to millionaires a green canyon of oaks and sycamores suggested thoughts of camping but there was something almost sacrilegious in the idea and i hastened on oak-shaded villas gave place to acres of sweet peas and trim orchards of walnut and orange and beyond ran the dreamy blue mountains with the peak of la cumbre overlooking all soon the dust of the road was exchanged for asphalt and gay parties of barbareños appeared in automobiles and on horseback in quest of appetites for dinner by early evening i rode into santa barbara and for a day or two we went into the city quarters when in eighteen hundred and thirty five dana sailed into santa barbara bay on the pilgrim he found to quote his own words the large bay without a vessel in it the surf roaring and rolling in upon the beach 
the white mission, the dark town, and the high treeless mountains. The three quarters of a century that has elapsed since that time has been highly eventful to California as a whole, but, as usual, the caprices of fortune have had their effect. Santa Barbara then, notwithstanding the poor impression Dana received of it, was the place of second importance in the Californias, outranked only by Monterey, the capital. San Francisco was a nearly begun settlement, mostly of Yankee Californians, called Yerba Buena, which promises well, and Los Angeles, though then the largest town in California, could hardly have dreamed, with her interior position, of contesting for the southern supremacy with the better-placed settlements on the coast. The modern city of Santa Barbara is a place of about twelve thousand people, which, wisely following the lines of least resistance, has attained a fame of its own as a particularly delightful place of residence. Its climate, mild, equable, and the reverse of stimulating, is just suited to the enjoyment of its attractions of coast and mountain scenery, and tourists, who nowadays with extensive view survey mankind from China to Peru, naturally have not overlooked Santa Barbara. Two giant hotels provide the superlative of comfort for the wealthy traveller, and streets of pretty flowers in flower-crammed gardens are inhabited by fugitives from blizzard-stricken states in east and north. There are not many traces, except in the names of several of the streets, of the older Santa Barbara. Of what remains of it, the mission stands first in interest. It dates from 1786, and, standing on the high ground at the rear of the city, the grey old building, drowsing in the sun with its red-tiled corridors and twin-domed belfries, sheds an air of Spanish languor, a perpetual siesta over the city. While I sat on a bench beside a fountain in the open space before the mission, I heard the patter of naked feet beside me, and, turning, saw the arch face of a Mexican boy, of seven or eight years, only a few paces away. He had noticed my camera, and was skirmishing in hope of some interesting photographic incident, but was ready for flight at a moment's notice. When I spoke to him he came and talked frankly, telling me his name, Jose, and those of his father and a considerable array of brothers and sisters. The surname was that of one of the soldiers who formed the escort of Padre Lassuen at the time of the founding of the mission, and as it was an unusual name I had little doubt that this curly-pated youngster was one link of a chain which, if I could trace it, would lead back to that event, one of some importance in the history of the state. The mission possesses a great collection of the material of California history. In the library of the building I found the genial and scholarly Father Zephyrin Engelhart, deep in learned labours over his great History of the Franciscan Missions, now issuing from the press. It is a worthy task and Protestants, as well as Catholics, may well regard with respect the work of Father Sarah and his helpers on these shores, which, a century and a quarter ago, were more remote and savage than Central Africa is today. On a quiet side street I found another remnant of Santa Barbara's historic past, the old mansion of the De La Guerras, a family so identified with the city that its history might almost be said to be their own. Readers may remember that it is the marriage of one of the daughters of this house, Doña Anita de la Guerra de Noriega y Carrillo, that Dana describes with so much vivacity. The bridegroom was Mr. Alfred Robinson, the agent of the owners of the Pilgrim and the Alert. There is a volume now rare entitled Life in California by an American, written by this Mr. Robinson, 
which gives much very interesting information as to manners and affairs in California within a decade or two before the grand transition from hides and tallow to gold. I noticed over the main doorway of the house the words in quaint lettering, La Paz sea en esta casa. Peace be to this house, followed by the name of the family. There seemed an odd disparity between the sentiment and the martial name, for de la guerra signifies literally of the war. I wondered whether the incongruity could have been unnoticed by the old Don who had the words cut there, or whether or not there might have been some particular occasion for the little joke. I believe it has been found that the western coast of this continent is slowly rising. If that be so, and the movement is to go on, and no wholly unthinking change as to arise in the course of human affairs, why, I wonder, may not this sleepy city be a far future metropolis of the western hemisphere, lying at the head of a huge bay, protected by a great arm of land on which the present Channel Islands would be prominent peaks. But no doubt long before that could come to pass, ports, steamships, and all the rest of our modern paraphernalia will be material of very ancient history, and meanwhile Santa Barbara fulfils her comfortable destiny, dozing among palms and roses, beside the bluest of seas. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Eight. Arboreal Strangers. A Squally Evening. Roadside Camp and Company. An Incongruity. Church as Barn. The Village of Naples. The Refugio Pass, More Pleasant Mexicans, Bernardito the Jolly, Crossing the Santa Inez Mountains, A Wonderful Landscape, Wild Flowers and the Medronio, Los Lomas de la Purificación, A Land of Great Oaks, Fording the Santa Inez River. We left Santa Barbara on a Monday afternoon. Both man and horse rested well. From here the coast runs almost due westerly for fifty miles to Point Conception, the elbow, or as Dana calls it, the Cape Horn of California, where it begins to blow the first of January and blows all the year round. Here again I found it advisable to take the county road, a short distance inland for a few miles, to escape some extensive sloughs that occur in the neighbourhood of Goleta Point, and in winter furnish the sportsmen of Santa Barbara with goodly bags of ducks. A few miles out, at the village of La Patera, I was overtaken by a young fellow on horseback who was leading three other horses. One of them was a handsome three-year-old, full of fire and nerves who danced about in excitement at every automobile that passed, and seemed likely to drag the rider out of his saddle. I offered to take the halter ropes of the other two animals, so we rode on together and fell into conversation. Miles of eucalyptus trees have been planted hereabouts, in groves and along the waysides, and I learned from my companion that we were passing through the ranch of Mr. Elwood Cooper, to whom California is indebted as the pioneer both of this useful tree and also largely of the olive. One of the attractions of travel in this state is that so many of its products have a geographical association with some distant land of origin. It is as pleasant, perhaps even more so, to encounter constantly some arboreal Australian or Greek or Persian or Algerine, as it would be to meet the human representatives of those countries. When you see a pomegranate you are likely to think of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, 
and the green-bursting figs among their broad dark leaves remind me of Matthew Arnold's Merry Grecian Coasters, or the grave Tyrian trader who unbent sails there, where, down cloudy cliffs, through sheets of foam, shy traffickers and the dark Iberians come, and on the beach undid his corded bales. The day had been partly cloudy, with a gusty wind and the possibility of a sprinkle of rain. As we rode down a long avenue of eucalyptus, a squall of wind came from the west, rushing like something solid down the tunnel-like road, and filling the air with dust, twigs, and even sizable branches. Following it came a lively spatter of rain, and as it was nearly evening, the question of a camp became interesting. My companion was bound for a ranch in one of the canyons a few miles ahead. My business was to find the best shelter I could, subject to Chino's necessaries of water and pasturage. A mile or two further we came to Ticolate Canyon, where a good stream crossed the road, and a broken fence gave access to a triangle of grass beneath some sycamores. Here I handed the horses over to my friend, and proceeded to such acts of trespass as were necessary to my comfort. My poncho, stretched between two trees, made a fair windbreak for myself, and Chino was quartered in a sheltered spot among good feed. The rain ceased about sundown, and I ate supper quite comfortably, amused by the remarks of two parties of automobilists, who exclaimed at the phenomenon of a tramp reading a book by candlelight, while he ate his, of course, stolen, victuals. As a rule, the sight of Chino as a part of my belongings gave me a better standing in the eyes of passers-by when my camp was near the road. But this time he was not in view, and I had to bear all the odium that justly falls to the man who eats and sleeps by roadsides. A campfire here was not practicable, so I turned in early and lay smoking and listening to a symposium of the owls which have given the canyon its name. The wind had ceased, and a few drops of rain had fallen again as I was spreading my blankets, so my dispositions were made with a view to a possible wet night. However, the first thing that came to my eyes when I awoke after sleeping some hours was the friendly twinkle of stars between the leaves overhead. I was up at the first sign of dawn, and found that during the night another traveller had arrived, and was now sleeping diligently under a tree on the other side of the creek. He, I supposed it was a he, was wrapped in an old red quilt, and an antique straw hat covered his face. A small tin pail lay nearby, and his pillow was the sack which held his remaining effects. I was careful not to wake him by my manoeuvres with the coffee-pot, but made an extra allowance of the beverage, and, seeing that he was still sleeping when I was ready to march, I quietly crept over and left a pint or two of hot coffee in his pail, with a wang, as Stevenson would say, of bread, uh, a couple of apples, and part of a can of tobacco alongside. As I was turning away it occurred to me to leave my card beside the little legacy, and to round out the matter I pencilled on the back Whitman's lines, Camarado, now I see the secret of the making of the best persons. It is to grow in the open air, and eat and sleep with the earth. I reckon my friend had some puzzled moments over his breakfast. It was a delicious morning. The road passed among rolling hills of freshly cut grain, broken by frequent canyons dark with oaks and dotted with notable sycamores. In one deep canyon a giant laurel, more than two feet in diameter of stem, filled the whole air with the stimulating scent of bay, and everywhere a multitude of aromatic herbs and shrubs diffused sweet or pungent odours. The purple sea lay to the left at a quarter-mile distance, and on the right the long wall of the Santa Inez mountains 
supplied a constant entertainment of light and colour. As we approached the village of Naples, a novelty appeared in the landscape in the shape of a square church tower of Norman style and apparently built of stone. Standing on a hilltop, it was strikingly visible long before the village, which lies in a hollow, came into view. I made up my mind that it would turn out to be of cunningly painted wood, or else of plaster, but on a near approach it proved to be of veritable stone, and point device even to the gargoyles. It had an incongruous look standing there in a sea of yellow mustard. I was told that it had been built by a former resident of the locality, and that its present use was as a storage place for hay. The village of Naples was a pleasant surprise. From its ambitious name I expected to see some spick-and-span modern resort. I found instead a half-score of old whitewashed buildings, the cottages smothered in flowers, and the hotel so engagingly simple and out of date that I longed to be put up there. A brook runs down to the sea, through a verdurous canyon of willows and sycamores, and the road up the hill beyond was bordered with giant prickly pears, looped with pink and white convolvulus. The mowers were at work on the hillsides, working round and round the knolls like barbers. I never felt any special calling to a farmer's life, yet now I felt that I could be brought to accept one of these generous, slumberous, oak-shaded estates, with sea and mountains handy for purpose of recreation. We travelled all the morning through this dreamy landscape. Houses were few, and the population appeared to be almost nil. The sea seemed unpopulated too. No sail or streamer of smoke broke the infinite creep of the water, and the surf, half a mile away, made only a vague, wide murmur that filled the air like a thicker kind of sunlight. At long intervals I saw a ranch hand or two at work in the fields, but seldom within hailing distance, and I passed like the lonely seabird with one waft of the wing. A few miles to the north, beyond the ridge of mountains whose foothills now rose close upon the water's edge, was the mission of Santa Inez. I wished to see all of these relics of California's early days that lay near my route, so, finding here a road that crossed the mountains by way of the Refugio Pass, I struck inland. A good stream ran down the canyon, and as evening was near I kept a watch for a camping place. Barbed wire fences held me to the road for a mile or two, but at last I came to a path that led to a lonely schoolhouse. Remembering my rights as a taxpayer, I entered the gate and found, a little distance upstream, a good spot under sycamores with abundant fodder adjacent. I earned my supper from the stream and cooked and ate it heartlessly on the bank in plain view of the relatives of the Eton while doves cooed melodiously, and coyotes raised doleful hymns to the rising moon. Next morning I continued up the canyon, which is a winding and very beautiful one shaded with oaks and sycamores of the finest. After a few miles the road leaves the bottom and begins the long climb to the ridge. Just where the ascent commences I found a mountain farm. On the window of the house was painted the proprietor's name, and the word comidas, signifying meals. The place was rustic and inviting, and I tied Chino to the gatepost and entered. A pleasant Mexican woman with a rollicking baby answered my knock. Certainly she could cook me a meal, but, hey, senor, nothing is there in the house but eggs with bread and coffee. I wanted nothing better, and seated myself at the table for proof. In a few minutes she returned with my eggs, deliciously cooked in oil that came, I learned, from olive trees on the hillside orchard. Presently the husband came in, carrying Bernardito the Jolly, 
and they all sat down for a chat while I ate. They were both of middle age, but had only been married a year or two, and it was delightful to see his pride in her, and their love and enthusiasm for the baby. His admirable qualities, and he was all admirable, were pointed out carefully to me, and I was charged to report them every one to a compatriot of the husband's who lived in the next county. How strong he was, and how big! His hair, so long for only ten months, his three small teeth, with which already he would bite his father's work-hardened finger, behold, as if he were a little pig, the chica, and so on, pouring out their simple love in all friendliness. Altogether, I do not know when I have more enjoyed a meal than my dish of eggs at that rough plank table with these good people. We now took our way up the steep slope. The mountain side faced the south and had no shade, and the sun was at its hottest. Not so hot, however, as the desert sun of our previous summer, as I reminded Chino when we halted for breath. As we climbed, the view opened finely and became constantly more striking. Even in California, it would not be easy to match that superb panorama. A foreground of flowery brush fell away steeply into a purple mystery of mountain and canyon, dreaming in the wistful haze of summer. At five miles distance, the infinite plain of sea shone softly under the southern sun. Far out the islands of the channel showed like fairy isles, mere shadow shapes of darker tone against the pallid blue of the horizon. Right and left ran the high, wavering crest of the Santa Inez, with here and there a sentinel pine breaking the ease of the long undulations. On nearing the summit, oaks began to appear, often surrounded with lakelets of tender grass interesting to Chino. Here I found, growing freely, the lovely globe tulip, Calicortus albus, a white saint of a flower, all ethereal gentleness and tranquillity, the purest-looking blossom I know. I think a pirate would look at it with reverence. With it grew many other flowering plants, nemophilias, geraniums, marguerites, Brodias, anemones, colincias, making little floral sanctuaries among the rough and thorny world of the brush. About the pass the oaks became larger, and among them grew a few beautiful madronios. This great arbutus is one of the most striking of western trees, handsome in leaf, blossom, and fruit, and especially noticeable for its smooth stem of satiny buff or red. The long gleaming arms make a gallant appearance amid the sombre olive of oak and pine, and with its tassels of scarlet berries the tree looks very equal to the part of Captain of the Western Wood, for which Bret Hart nominated it. While I rested by a spring, eating wild strawberries and noting where the deer had lately left their imprints. Four Mexican children came by on their way from school, as they told me. Their temple of learning must be of the smallest, for I have seen no house except one deserted adobe since I left my lunch-place three hours before. Crossing the divide we turned down the northern face of the through a splendid woodland of oak, laurel, madroño, and maple. A roaring stream, Ballard Creek, came in a deep canyon below the road. We marched rapidly down the steep descent. The sun was setting, and pools of solemn shadow crept in among the golden hills, the Lomas de la Purificación, that opened before me. How beautiful are these Spanish names! They seem to throw a cloistral quiet, and a mythical calm, over the wide sunny landscapes. 
one would think that angels had chosen them. I found an excellent camping place on a little bench of land above the stream. The moon was full, with the light of that warm, almost orange colour that one sometimes sees in summer. It was late before I could bring myself to turn in, and then I lay for a long time enjoying a moon bath, and watching the swaying pennons of Spanish moss that hung from the great oak overhead. Chino was tethered in a foot-high growth of clover, and put me to sleep at last with the rhythm of his molars. This part of California is preeminently the land of oaks. My road next day, following the same canyon but a few miles farther, passed through a park-like country where every oak seemed to reach the full magnificence of its type. The foliage swelled out in exuberance of glossiest green, and the convex of every leaf was burnished like metal. Between the trees the ground was covered with heavy-headed grasses, and the cattle stood grazing helplessly out over leaves of waving pasture. The canyon at length opened into the valley of the Santa Inez River, which here, thirty miles from its mouth, and after two months of rainless summer, was a small stream, twenty yards or so in width, winding from side to side of a sandy waste, in which time of heavy rain fills to a torrent. I spent an hour in searching for the road which my map showed as following the south bank. It had been washed away in the spring floods, and we made six fords before finding a place where we could climb the opposite bank. Good luck led me to the very spot I wanted. We scrambled up a thirty-foot cliff of crumbling soil, and in a few minutes I dismounted at the door of the mission. End of chapter 8、chapter、nine of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 9 Mission Santa Inez. Mission Hospitality. Quaint Relics. An Operatic Departure. The Gaviota Pass, Magnificent Oaks and Sycamores, The Nohohui Waterfall, Sea Fogs, A Travelling Emporium, Las Cruces, An Adventure with Quicksand, Voices of the Sea, Evicted by the Tide, Sea Birds and a Rattlesnake, A Sunset Island. At Mission Santa Inez, to give the name its proper form, I proved to myself one virtue for which the Catholic Church has always been famed, its hospitality to travellers. The mission is under the charge of Father Alexander Buckler, a whole-souled Teuton from the Lower Rhine. His extensive parish keeps him much on the move, but, luckily for the mission, the father is a man of taste, and has chosen for headquarters this lonely old church, where he has fitted up a suite of the dusky cell-like rooms for his dwelling. I found him among the roses of the tiled corridor, explained my presence, and asked permission to camp for the night in the meadow nearby. Camp? he echoed. Why can't you sleep in a bed? And straightway led me off to a plainly but comfortably fitted room, and detailed Chino to the stable and a well-filled manger. Then he was sure I must be hungry, so his housekeeper being away, he ransacked the larder to find me a meal. Whether I were Catholic, Protestant, or Mohammedan, Quaker, Shaker, or Supralapsarian, was all one to him. I was a traveller, and guest of St. Agnes I must be. I learned that the room assigned to me had once been the headquarters of the Commandante, when, after the secularization of the mission, one half of the then remaining building 
had been taken by the civil authorities and put to use of jail, blacksmith shop, or whatever purpose it would serve. I had heard also that in my bed an Indian who was murdered a few years ago nearby had breathed his last. But no ghost disturbed my sleep, and I awoke next morning to the strains of the Romance in F, played by the good father out of compliment, because I had happened to mention a special liking for Schumann. The father is an enthusiast in music. He played the organ when four years of age and performed in public at twelve, and often his piano is heard by the owls of the Santa Inez at the most abnormal hours. I was able to be some service to the father in photographic matters, and spent three days in his cheerful society. Lying, as this mission does, away from the main lines of travel, it has suffered less than many of its sisters from the vandals and is a veritable museum of objects, historical, ecclesiastical, and quaint. Here are rusty little cannon, with obsolete muskets, pistols, and swords, branding irons that once marked St. Agnes's flocks and herds, candlesticks in formidable array, portentous locks and complicated keys, parchment scores of church music, with the old square notes, antique tomes of baptisms, marriages, and burials, adorned with wonderful rubrics, and bound in rawhide, and a host of vessels of ritual and clerical whatnot. I was amused at a vast umbrella of yellow silk, with which the padres of bygone days shielded their reverend pates from the sun on their long marches afoot for the strict Franciscan rule debarred the use of horse or ass. Still more droll was a little Madonna of wood, a foot or so high, with a painfully commonplace expression of face, but a quizzical look in the eye that was highly comic. She was dressed in stiff-figured damask, with a kind of hilarious little cloak that stood out all about her, and a battered straw hat one or two sizes too large. The good father was not a whit offended at my mirth over the absurd little figure, and explained that it was the special pride of his Indian flock. When he removed it once from its place in the church where it had stood for many years, they objected strenuously, and would not rest until it was brought back. After all, perhaps one might better envy than laugh at such admirable simplicity. Of the building itself there remains, as in the case of most missions, only enough to suggest the extent and beauty of the original structure. Santa Inez suffered an additional disaster when, in the heavy rains of the spring of 1911, the bell tower and several of the buttresses of the church wall suddenly crumbled away and fell in a chaos of adobes and tiling into the little cemetery. The bells themselves, all of dates early in the last century, fortunately were unharmed, even to their huge ornamental caps of sycamore. Through the energy of Father Buckler the damage has already been repaired, and in enduring concrete. At Easter of this year a special service ushered in with a great ringing of the bells, was held to celebrate the event. My departure from Santa Inez was in the operatic manner, for I rode away to the imposing strains of the Pilgrim's Chorus, which the father thought an appropriate valedictory. It was a superb morning, with the highlands of the San Rafael range to the north glowing like a wall of opal under a sky of ethereal blue. I now turned again toward the coast, taking a road which crosses the mountain by the Gaviota Pass, a few miles west of the one by which I had come. I was more than ever delighted by the beauty of this region, which, for mile on mile, is a literal park of undulating hill-land decorated with kingly oaks many of which must have been full twenty feet in girth of stem. 
Along the watercourses grew sycamores commensurate in size, which gave the name of Alisal to this grant. A mild wind blew from the north, and before it the waves of shining grass flowed past in rich volume. Doves called and jays chuckled from every tree, and quail ran nimbly before us down the road. Chino, well rested and fortified with hay and grain, was in good fettle, and marched along gaily, noting the green landscape with an approving eye. I had been told of a pretty waterfall in the Nahohui, a tributary of the Santa Inez, and turned aside to see it. It is in a deep wooded canyon, half a mile to the south of the road, a straight, perpendicular, slender drop of about one hundred feet, such as in England would be called a gill or a force. With its bordering of dripping maidenhair fern, it makes a charming sight. Nahohui, I have been told, is Indian for honeymoon, and there is a legend of an Indian brave who, honeymooning here with his bride, was carried over the fall and killed. I never find that these stories, that go with waterfalls like premiums with magazines, add much to the beauty of the scene, and moreover this particular stream is such a slight affair that one cannot help thinking the brave must have been something of a duffer. However, as waterfall the sight is pretty enough. We had travelled so easily that it was close upon sunset when we reached the pass. Just beyond the summit I made camp under some oaks in a hollow where a small stream ran. The forage was unusually good, a thick mat of burr clover almost a foot high. Chino affectionately rubbed his nose about in it in sheer joy, and ripped away with sighs of pleasure. I was not so well provided. The stream was so strong of alkali that the tea curdled in the boiling water. The best place I could find for sleeping slanted unpleasantly, and the south wind brought in such a dense fog from the sea that by morning my oilskin top covering was like a hydrographic model, with watersheds, creeks, main streams, and reservoirs all in detail. However, I made my morning coffee doubly strong to offset the alkali, and ward off what people used to call the humours. It must be by virtue of these dense and frequent fogs that the oaks of this region grow up to such rare perfection. By this means they not only receive the necessary moisture for growth, which the roots would supply, but are enabled often actually to bathe and revel in it. They have not only bread, but wine, are comforted as well as fed, and their plump and cheerful faces reflect their enjoyment. Soon after we took the road I saw two wagons toiling toward me up the grade. When we met the drivers pulled up their horses for a chat. They had come from Ventura, where they had a saddlery shop and were just taking in the country, a particular idiom that always amuses me, and doing a little business as they went to pay expenses. With this in view they offered to sell me, in turn, a horse, oranges, a horsehair riata, a revolver, neckties, a saddle, a brace of rabbits, and finally some astounding chromographs. Then they inquired my own line, and at once suggested that I should do a little advertising for them in my books. For this they were willing to pay, I suppose in rabbits or neckties. They were puzzled, but not offended, when I replied that that would be impossible, but supplied me with some printed cards which I was to kindly drop around in hotels and such places. I made a half-hearted promise, bought a few oranges, and so escaped. At the village of Las Cruces, where I arrived around midday, I got an excellent meal at the cottage of an old Spanish woman, where I had been told I might purchase bread. Her heart was enlarged over me when she heard that I had been the guest of the good father at Santa Inez, to whom she is a parishioner and friend. 
I am always glad when I can get entertainment with these friendly Spanish and Mexican folk, and relish it far beyond the pretentious hotel hospitality of towns. From Las Cruces the road turned directly south, following a picturesque gorge whose precipitous walls carried a wonderful growth of ferns, flowering shrubs, and herbage, mingled with huge creamy candle flames of yucca. A lively stream rushes among rocks and boulders that break it into pleasant music. A pipeline carrying oil from the wells some miles inland to the refinery at Alcatraz, nearby on the coast, does its best to spoil the canyon at its prettiest point, though I suppose it seems an adornment to the gentlemen who own stock in the concern. A turn of the road brought me rather unexpectedly within sight of the sea and soon I came again to the shore at Gaviota, not many miles to the west of the spot where I had left it. A group of farm buildings and a dingy house, showing the sign Gaviota Hotel and Store, stood at the mouth of the canyon, but I saw no living being except a melancholy hound, and in the distance a mounted man charging about as he rounded up a band of horses. The coast road from this point west for ten or twelve miles is little more than a track, and that of the roughest kind, quite impossible for wheeled vehicles. There was a fence across the path, and a notice was posted that travellers must take the beach. I rode down to the shore, and when I saw that a little farther on the tide was washing up to the base of the cliffs, I turned back, found a way through the fence, and trespassed on my way. The country hereabouts is monotonous and unattractive. Low, undulating hills run for mile on mile, treeless and scanty even of brush, and the canyons are dry and shadeless. We marched some miles before finding water, and I resolved to camp at the first creek I could see. At last I came to one which afforded good pasturage also, and dismounting I led Chino down toward the beach, where I noticed a little bench of green grass at the mouth of the canyon and on the very edge of the shore sand. Here the expedition narrowly escaped disaster. The inwash of the tide, meeting the water of the creek, had formed an area, a sort of pit, of quicksand. This we had to cross in order to reach the beach, and in a moment, without warning, I was up to my middle, and Chino, following close behind, plunged in beside and was almost upon me. On the instant I threw myself backwards, and tried to work myself out, but the sand clogged me as if it were liquid lead, and I could not reach back with my hands to where the solid ground would give me support. Chino, meanwhile, was struggling desperately but helplessly, the heavy saddle-bags and other articles of his load weighing him down so that he was almost half covered. By great good fortune the canyon wall was nearby, not over eight feet away. It was of weathered rock, soft and shaly, and I thought that if I could anyhow work over to it I could get a grip enough on to it to support myself. It seemed an impossible thing to do, with that fatal sand clasping and weighing me down, but I attempted it. I remember that, as I struggled, a horror of the commonplace sunlit evening flashed over me, and that with it the thought that no one would ever know what had happened to me, for there would be no trace, no clue. That horrible sand would close over me, the sun would shine on the spot, the roar of the waves would go on unbroken. I should simply cease to be. I think I wondered whether there would not be any way of telling my friends, but I am not sure whether that thought came then or in thinking over it afterwards. All this can only have taken a very short time, during which I was struggling to reach the rocky wall. At last my fingers scraped the rock, and gradually I was able to draw myself backwards to firm ground. Then I ran around by the solid beach sand, crossing the creek, 
and came back to Chino. He had stopped struggling, but lay over on his side, and had sunk so that one of the saddlebags was quite out of sight. Blood, too, was spattered all about him. Coming as close as was safe behind him, I gradually loosened as much of his load as I could reach. Then I caught his rope, and tried to get him to exert himself. For some time he made no move, and I thought he must have broken his offside foreleg on a half-buried snag of dead wood that projected above the sand. Again and again I tried to get him to move, but he still lay on his side, drawing great gasping breaths, and I about decided I should have to shoot him where he lay. But I made a last effort, shouting and hauling at him with all my strength, until I literally forced him to bestir himself. Then, putting my last ounce into it, I pulled and shouted, refusing to allow him to relax his effort for a moment, and gradually working his head round somewhat toward where I stood. With a final wild spasm he scrambled up on the hard dry sand, and stood snorting and trembling pitifully, bespattered with blood, and utterly exhausted. I was vastly relieved to find that the blood was coming from his mouth and nostrils. He had broken some small blood vessel in his first struggles. I took off the saddle and led him carefully over to a grassy spot where I washed out his mouth and then gave him a thorough rubbing down, and within half an hour I had the satisfaction of seeing my staunch companion of so many days and nights feeding with equanimity and even enthusiasm. The incident was sufficiently dangerous to give me a lesson in caution, as well as cause for hearty thankfulness. There was not the slightest hint of treachery in the appearance of the sand, but thereafter I went warily in all doubtful places. I ransacked my rescued saddlebags and made a rare supper to celebrate the adventure. As the bags were strongly made and waterproofed, the contents had not been much damaged. Then I ran up my sleeping tent in view of the fog which I could see advancing from the sea. I chose a place on a little shelf of dry land, sheltered by the angle of the canyon wall, and apparently above high water mark by a safe though narrow margin. Then in the dusk I gathered a pile of driftwood and made a royal fire, by which I sat until long after dark, listening with more than usual enjoyment to the tinkle of Chino's bell and the manifold voices of the sea. There seemed that night to be an unusual variety in the sound of the surf. Intervals of dramatic silence were broken suddenly by roars, as if huge bodies of water were being dropped from some great height. Then would come a long sibilant swish which, after subsiding to rippling murmurs, ended startlingly with a thump fortissimo. Occasionally, in the midst of a long whisper, there would come a smart clap, followed by little quarrellings and shudderings and sighs, almost of human quality of tone. The ordinary sound of the breakers, the steady pound, boom, and clatter, pound, boom, and clatter, seemed not to be in evidence. The entertainment was so interesting that it drew me down to the water's edge. When I passed beyond the light of the fire I found a new fascination in the pale sea-flame that hovered and raced up and down my quarter-mile of beach as the rollers broke in ghostly phosphorescence. Then a steamer, three or four miles out, passed on her way up the coast her light shining genially across the black void of water. I fancied that some lover and lass, leaning together over the bulwarks, might be watching my twinkling beacon, and I went back and threw on another log to brighten the blaze, in the hope that the beam might stimulate my swain to some urgency or some pretty fancy that should bring a happy climax to his wooing. When at last I felt in mood to turn in, 
I noticed that the tide had made a long advance toward my tent, but I felt sure that it was close upon its turn and that I could hold my ground. Still, as there seemed just a possibility of trouble, I did not undress to my usual camping limit, but got into my blankets partly dressed, and soon fell asleep. I had slept about half an hour when I awoke with an uneasy feeling that the water was coming too near. Looking out, I saw that the stronger waves were sending their fans of foam quietly up to within a few feet of me, leaving a very slight rise of beach before they would wash against and undermine my little shelf of sand. There seemed to be still a sporting chance that I should be safe, and I lay down again but the thought of awakening next time to find myself swamped and the tent collapsing over me was so annoying that I could not sleep and resolved to move. To go farther back was impossible, for the stream ran only a few yards behind me, so I gathered an armful of my traps and made a bolt into the darkness across the creek, which was already flooding with seawater, and found a level place among the grass near my horse. I had to make two more flights to and fro to bring the rest of my belongings, and then, too disgusted to set up the tent again, I made a windbreak of the saddlebags, rolled myself up in the blankets, and finally got to sleep. My last glance at the red embers of the fire showed an ambitious wave in the act of washing it out of existence. In spite of mishaps, the place was so attractive in its close proximity to the sea and its complete retirement, that I decided to remain for another day. The swallows that haunted the cliffs made the pleasantest of company, flying happily about me, and pursuing the sand-flies almost into the coffee. The weather, too, supplied one desirable thing, namely shade, which the camp otherwise lacked. For the fog of the night, lifting but not passing off all day, afforded a delightful temperature, with restful tones of colour. And it is so that I best love the sea. Its grandeur, its significance, its solemnity, are far more felt than neath the all-revealing sun, and the water itself, deeply, darkly clear, seems more aqueous and elemental. There was an unusual number of sea-birds hereabouts, and in a walk down to the beach I came upon the rocky point which was their home. Hundreds of them sat ranked in demure hierarchy, the shags, who were the most numerous, taking the lowest place, then the white-backed gulls, and, presiding over all with an air of burlesque dignity, a dozen or so pelicans. At my approach the whole company took flight and in a moment the winged air was darked with plumes. The clatter of wings was bewildering as they circled once or twice, and then streamed off to settle on the bed of kelp, which here forms a floating reef, unbroken for mile on mile. The flight of the pelican is a wonderful exhibition of ease in motion. I was never tired of watching them gliding in file, smooth, swift, and silent, with no movement of wing for great distances. If men ever attain to such perfection in aeronautics, though that is impossible, I mean to sell my belongings to my boots if necessary, and purchase the magic machine. Returning from my walk, I almost stepped upon a rattlesnake that lay coiled among the driftwood which I had been drawing upon for my fire. He was not a large one, and the calendar in his tail marked only four changes of skin, but I judged that he must die. Mr. Muir, I remember, deprecates killing these creatures, and says that, having once put one to death, he felt himself degraded by the killing business, farther from heaven. On the other hand, I recalled that when, on the Isle of Melita, a viper bit the shipwrecked apostle in the hand, he unceremoniously shook off the beast into the fire. 
My little reptile was a potential evil-doer also, and on the whole I saw no reason for trying to better such a notable example as that of St. Paul. At evening the cloud curtain to the south lifted a little from the horizon, and one of the jewels of the channel group shone out like a great jewel in the light of the setting sun. It was very beautiful, and rather solemn, the slow lifting of the veil, the magic of the revelation, the silent passage through tone on tone of ethereal colour until, when the sun had sunk, the distant isle stood marked in soft, dense purple on a glowing belt of yellow, the only object between grey of cloud and grey of sea. Then came the gradual lowering of the veil all over again. There was something unearthly in the quiet colour action, as if an angel had managed the heavenly display. Indeed, perhaps one had. End of chapter 9、Chapter 10 of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 10 A Bad Road. A Marblehead Skipper. Bygone Whaling. Portuguese Fisherman. Point Conception. Night at the Lighthouse. A Natural Division Point. The Halama. Fine Old Olives. Camp on the Espada. Tramp Company again. A Point Conception Wind. An Inexplicable Family. The Town of Lompoc. Chinese Freemasons. Don Camillo. A Spanish Californian. The Mission of La Purisima Concepcion. This stretch of coast is reputed to be the windiest part of all the California seaboard. There chanced to be only moderate breezes at this time, however, with a good deal of fog, and the morning on which we left the canyon was calm, with a sleepy sea that gleamed to white where it caught the rays of a hazy sun. The road, which can never have been exactly a boulevard, had been almost obliterated by the spring rains, and scraps of broken harness, shed plentifully along the way, seemed to illustrate the adventures of the last wagon that had passed over it. It was a relief when, after a few miles, we fought our way through a jungle of ten-foot mustard down to the beach, where we could travel on the hard sand. There seemed a little risk here and there of being cut off by the tide before we could round the many headlands, and at every crossing of a creek I could see the adventure of the quicksand calm vividly to Chino's mind. The loneliness of the region was marked by the presence of a bald eagle that sat in haughty solitude at the cliff edge, and gazed on us with unquailing eye as we passed below. This great bird is becoming rare in California, but still breeds in the lonely islands off the coast. At El Bulito Canyon I caught a glimpse of the handsome large house of a local cattle baron. Gleaming white among the noble oaks, it had much the air of a French chateau, until I reflected that it was probably built of one-inch plank, or perhaps cardboard. Canyon followed canyon, breaking the rounded hills of yellowing grass that rose in long succession to the west. Coming to the Cañada del Cojo, I found a little cluster of buildings where a trio of Portuguese fishermen had established themselves. A great boiling of nets was going forward in an immense cauldron set against the cliff, and in a shed one of the men was employed in making traps for crawfish, destined, I suspect, to appear as lobsters on the dining tables of San Francisco and Los Angeles. As pasturage was scanty hereabouts, I had a mind to camp if I could buy forage for my horse, 
The Portuguese had none, for they kept no horse, but I learned that an old American fisherman lived close by, on the cliff, and that there I might find what I wanted. I found the old man at home, and he willingly offered the best he had, for Chino, the use of a decaying stable, and for myself, to spread my blankets in an old barn, among rats, bats, nets, sails, and rudders. His own quarters were hardly better, and housed a quaint museum of smells, the accumulated odours of half a century of fish. I shared his supper of eggs, potatoes, which was his fancy to call oranges, biscuits, and coffee, while he, at my request, told me a little of his history. He was an old marblehead skipper, who had found his way to this solitary spot as far back as the year 1866, and had lived here alone since that time. His Portuguese neighbours had come only a year or two ago. He was now seventy-six, but still followed his calling, and had no idea of forsaking it yet a while. Why should he, he said? When he went into Santa Barbara he saw men of his own age hanging off and on without wind enough in their sails to blow out a candle, and look at him, as sound as a forecastle bulkhead. Dangerous to handle the boat alone? Well, maybe, but he never thought of that. Storms? Why, yes, now and then. Once he was capsized, and was pretty badly used up when a lumber schooner picked him up just before nightfall. But that was years ago, and he thought the weather late years wasn't near as hard as it used to be in the channel. Maybe I didn't know that there used to be a sight of whaling went on right here at the old Coho landing. Not so long ago as I'd think, neither. The whalers' camp was right below there, and they would tow the whales, uh, California greys they were mostly, to shore and cut them up and try out the blubber on the beach. You see, there wasn't so many places along this piece of coast where you could beach a boat anyway, so the coho was quite a place in them days. And had I ever heard of the school the priests used to have a few miles up the country? It was for teaching the boys to be priests, and now and then some of them boys would break away and run off down here, and he would row them out to some ship that came in near, like they generally do coming round Conception. The old fellow chuckled delightedly over this reminiscence, as a smuggler would over the shooting of a rich cargo of contraband. When I appeared by appointment for breakfast at a quarter past four, I found that he had already taken his own, and was ready to go out for the morning catch. I hinted that I should like to accompany him, but he ignored the suggestion, evidently feeling that landlubbers were best ashore. He left me to close up the house when I was ready to move, cautioning me to see that the chickens were shut up in their coop, or the coyotes would surely get them. So he took the fat grey horse, and I watched them drag the boat down to the water, and saw him shove off, leaving the horse tied on the beach, ready to haul up the boat on his return. Plucky old Yankee skipper! Some day the old grey horse may wait over long, and master and boat may come home at last in evil plight, thrown up mere drift by the indifferent sea. But, meanwhile, we never think of that. I stopped to chat with the Portuguese as I passed on, and I felt an interest in meeting these countrymen of da Gama and Magellan. Dark, active, crisp-looking fellows, they were very different from the American or English fisherman type, but they fitted well into the picture that came to my mind of carracks, caravels, arquebusiers, and marineros and past the headland, northward slowly drifting, the freighted galleon. This was the type of men who went flitting about uncharted and all but fabulous seas under the flag of the navigator prince. 
midday found me still lounging there, and I was invited to eat dinner with them. The wife of one, a smiling, handsome woman, speaking excellent English, had prepared a delicious meal, my offer of payment for which was generously scouted. The husband and one of the other men, as I learned casually at the table, had been capsized the week before, while the wife had helplessly watched them through the glass for twelve hours as they clung to the bottom of their boat. Two miles further on I passed Government Point, where lay the bones of a small steamer, the Shasta, wrecked here a few years ago, and then, striking across a wide, sandy plateau, another mile brought us to Point Conception and the neat white buildings of the lighthouse station. I had brought a note of introduction to the keeper, and found myself a bone of hospitable contention between him and his next in command. The lighthouse is an important one, with the light of the first order Frisnell system, visible for forty miles, and a foghorn whose range I do not remember, but which I could estimate as about ten thousand newsboy power. The building stands on a bold angle of this great seaward promontory, and carries its lantern two hundred and fifty feet above the water. The night I passed there was densely foggy, and while sharing the watch of the second officer I found it fascinating to pace for the midnight hour about the rocky platform, dank and slippery with the mist, listening to the maelstrom of swirling, roaring water, and the grim hail of the siren bellowing to unseen ships its warning against the treachery of the fog. Rocks! And again and over. Rocks! A terrible sound to strike the ear of seaman or sea traveller too near. Too late for warning, it turns to a cry for help. Often, alas, too late for that as well. A sight that I shall long remember was that of the sixteen great moving bars of light marked on the fog-like spokes of a gigantic wheel. As the huge lens revolved on its bearings, the white beams travelled slowly, smoothly round, searching the fog inch by inch, as if to discover what it might be hiding. Doomed ship, or shipwrecked men in boat or raft, drowning sailor clutching at a spar, or pallid bodies of the dead. As the rays passed in turn over the face of rock behind the tower, the shrubs and flowers started out of the gloom as if they too were dead, and suffered an unwilling resurrection. It was a relief after a while to climb again to the tower and join my friend in the commonplace comforts of coffee and cigars, until four o'clock and daybreak ended his watch, and sent us to bed. My last waking sensation was the shriek of the foghorn, still on duty. Rocks. Point Conception forms the western abutment of the Santa Inez Mountains, the elbow, as it were, to the humorous. Here ends the long westerly trend of the shore, which from this point bends sharply northward. I looked with interest to see what lay next before me. What I saw was a bluff, rocky coast, shut off at a few miles' distance by the promontory of Point Aguelo, and looming above a wilderness of broken mountains, one impressive peak, El Tranquilion. Someone had a happy inspiration in that name. The railway here follows the shore closely, with the road, now a somewhat better one, accompanying it. In my mental survey of the coast of the state, I had always found it fall naturally into three divisions. A southern from the Mexican boundary to this salient angle, a central from here to San Francisco, and a northern thence to the Oregon line. Dana also, whose observation extended from San Diego to San Francisco, 
viewing the coast in the large way of a sailor, remarks that Point Conception may be made the dividing line between two different faces of the country. As you go to the northward of the point, the country becomes more wooded, has a richer appearance, and is better supplied with water. So, in leaving Point Conception, I felt the stimulus of new expectations, and the prospect of trees in greater number and variety made a special attraction. The first few miles of our new road, however, proved barren of event, and even of water. All the morning we travelled a dusty road, far enough from the cliff edge to be shut off from the view of the sea, and bordered on the other hand by tedious hills, robed in summer monotony of brown. About noon we crossed the railway, and came down to the beach near the mouth of Halama Creek. There was a spring of warm sulphur water here, whose virtues for bathing I should have liked to test, but trains, whose schedule I did not know, passed unduly near, and it was necessary to refrain. I had been told I ought to see the old Halama ranch, which lay a few miles inland. It is now deserted, and is said to have been an appanage of the neighbouring Mission de la Purissima Concepcion in the days of its prosperity. Indeed, I heard it spoken of by the Mexicans as the Mission of San Francisquito. A romantic trail led to it by way of a valley of great shaggy oaks. I passed an old orchard where vines still grew rampant of leaf, though fruitless, and, a little farther on, the remains of a cellar-like wine-vat of masonry, overflowing now with phenomenal nettles, and lively with bright-eyed lizards. The old ranch itself occupies a shady, dell-like spot at the junction of two creeks that made music all through the vale. I walked under avenues of ancient olives which met overhead, and whitened the grass with myriads of starry blossoms, a habit of this tree by which one of Job's obnoxious friends illustrated the fate of the wicked, who shall cast off his flower as the olive. Two huge poplar-like pear-trees were heavy with fruit, and there were the remains of an efficient hedge of the tuna cactus. Altogether it is a beautiful and interesting place, and if one wishes to make me a present of the San Julian ranch on which it lies, I shall have no difficulty in deciding where to build my country seat. I returned to the coast by sundown, and pitched camp on the bluff beyond the creek. Nearby was a black and eyeless ruin of adobe, the old ranch house of the Espada. After getting my supper I walked over to inspect it. As I passed the doorless entrance of one of the rooms I caught a whiff of tobacco, and a voice from the gloom hailed me with, "'Come in, partner. Lots of room.' I hope I am as good a democrat as the average man but I confess I was a little nettled at the cordiality of this greeting, evidently from a brother tramp. However, I put a good face on it and entered. I could see nothing but the red tip of a cigarette, and the twin highlight of a brilliant nose, but the voice in which I was invited to sit down on a box, which I should find by the door, had a guileless tone, and even a hint of timidity and my foolish resentment faded away. So we sat and exchanged judicious explanations. Or rather, I sat and he lay, for he announced that he had gone to bed, no elaborate ceremony, I suspect. I could tell that he was a man of fair education, even before he confided to me that he was the son of a well-to-do Ohio farmer, and had thrown up good prospects when the wanderlust caught him twenty years before. I could but admire the philosophy of his conclusion. He thought sometimes that he might have made a mistake. There is much virtue in might. After all, to the actual bad there is always a possible worse, and still beyond that there lies a whole unknown region of superlative. 
I invited my neighbour to breakfast with me, and looked forward with some curiosity to the meeting by daylight. He proved to be a tall, middle-aged, pathetic man, weak of mouth and eye, buttoned and safety-pinned into a long overcoat. He was loud in enthusiasm, genuine enough, poor fellow, I have no doubt, over my camping appliances. The little sleeping tent was a marvel, only possible because extant. Almost more incredible were my white enamel cups and plates. He became incoherent over the coffee, and could only express his admiration for all in such impressive generalizations as, well, I call this living, or don't that knock you now. When we parted, Chico's load was lighter by my duplicate set of enamelware and half my supply of coffee. As I passed the neat house of a small ranch near the road, I halted to make inquiry as to the road. The rancher, a young Spaniard, proved so affable that our conversation extended until noon, when I was invited to join the family for a meal. Both Senor O and his wife were of families that figure largely in the ante-American history of California, and here again I experienced the open-hearted courtesy of this kindly race. A few miles inland from here was the town of Lompoc, near which were the remains of another of the missions, La Purissima Concepcion. After a mile or two I struck a road running northward, which made a fairly direct route to the place. A cold wind had sprung up from which I hoped to find shelter by taking to the canyon up which the road lay, but I was sadly mistaken for the power and coldness of the wind increased as the road climbed, until both myself and Chino were in misery. This, then, was a taste of Dana's infamous Point Conception wind. Harder and harder it blew, and by some local ingenuity it managed to come from all quarters in quick succession, or sometimes even from all at once. The sun shone clearly enough, but, but made not the least impression on the temperature. The grass and herbage looked pinched and starving, and the very rocks seemed to cower. Ordinarily the scene would have been interesting, though not specially pleasing. The weird yellow land, treeless, silent, and uninhabited for league on league. The stark, hard sky the glimpse of indigo sea behind, and the pale lilac road winding interminably away till it became a mere scratch of grey on the great hill shoulders that lifted to the distant skyline. It was picturesque, or posturesque, in an odd, uh, clever way, but under that confounded wind it looked abject, bald, and almost hideous. At last, to my vast relief, the divide was crossed, and we dropped into peace and comfort. The contrast within twenty yards was amazing. A soft sun lighted a landscape varied with trees, fields of grain, and cattle-spotted pastures. Beside the road stood a little farmhouse in a bright garden of flowers. A stream ran in a pretty canyon that opened eastward and here we stopped to regain our tranquillity and eat our lunch. Then I went up to the farmhouse to assure myself of my road. A solemn man and boy, in Quakerish wide-brimmed hats, and who were apparently in the act of leaving the house to return to work, answered my knock. An incomprehensible scene over which I had pondered more than once met my gaze as the door was opened. By the table, where evidently a meal had just been dispatched, stood two heavy-looking middle-aged women, each with a wreath of flowers on her head. Their eyes were bent upon the floor, and for all sign to the contrary they might have been graven images. 
Not a move was made during the two or three minutes that I remained there. They stood facing me, side by side, solid, stolid, and silent. It occurred to me that they had all been going to dance, or had just done so. But in view of the bearing and physiognomy of all four, uh, the idea was ludicrous to the last degree. Is there, I wonder, some quaint and serious sect whose daily ritual includes a minuet au fleur after dinner? Hmm. I had not gone far before I heard the man and boy coming up behind. They walked side by side with long marching steps, and each carried a shovel. Without a word or a look, they stalked by, like ships that pass in the night. I watched them until they turned in at a gate that led to a hillside field of grain. There they passed beyond my ken, but for a long time they haunted my campfires like some hopeless conundrum. The country I now found myself in was of an unusual character. The canyon ran between high hills, broken with cliffs, and darkly variegated with solid clumps of trees. Farmhouses were perched precariously on these steep slopes, and a fringe of timber wavered along the skyline. At the bottom ran the creek, growing apace, and the road which followed it was quite charming, often overlaced with oaks, and bordered with high banks on which honeysuckle, wild roses, wallflowers, and many other wildling favourites grew among jungles of grass and thickets of prosperous weeds. The occasional roadside houses stood among cherry and apple trees, and altogether the region looked interesting, homelike, and cheerful. By evening I found myself on the outskirts of Lompoc. This is a town of quite respectable size, but of sedate and village-like aspect. The locality is famous for its farming, and a branch of the railway comes down from the coast. The principal crop is mustard, fields of which lie all about the town, while blooming blossom stragglers invade the vacant lots and corners. On a side street I passed a red and green balconied house, on which appeared the sign Yi Hing, Chinese Freemasons Headquarters. Uh, this had a queer look. I tried to conjecture what mongrel rites might be celebrated within. It was not easy, but so far as secrecy is concerned, at least, one can understand that these impenetrable people are well fitted to be adepts. There is a considerable Spanish and Mexican population in this old town. I had brought a letter of introduction to Don Camillo R., the head of one of the old Spanish California families, and formerly the owner of a great grant of land farther north. I found him living in a cottage of four or five little rooms, and my interview with him and his wife was most pleasant. The tall old Don, in his black silk skull-cap, was like a Van Dyke picture, and his manner was a fine fusion of dignity, simplicity, and cordiality. It was delightful to watch him romping with his sturdy baby grandson, and hear him pronounce over and over again, with innocent pride in his English, the name of his son, Billy, whom I was charged to call upon on my way up country. The vivacious Doña bustled about to get me afternoon tea, as every day in England they have it. Is it not true? No hospitality could be more gracious, and, I will add, more touching. It was not only kindness, but honour, that they would heap upon me. Whenever I hear, as, as I often do, disparaging words spoken of the Spanish race, I have only to recall that simple meal, and those delightful people, to range myself without hesitation on their side. As I came into Lompoc, I passed the ruins of the original mission of La Purissima Concepcion, 
distinguished now as the Mission Vieja, or Old Mission, to mark it from its successor. It is little more than a heap of adobes, but a great crack still shows the means of its demolition by earthquake. The second mission was built some three miles to the northwest of the town, where, the next day, I found it sleeping in gentler decay among sober brown hills and acres of mustard and beans. It, too, has long been disused, and, as with Santa Inez, the heavy rains of the last spring had wrought havoc with the unprotected walls of adobe. A long row of filleted pillars and one or two door and window openings alone give coherence to the ruin. Wild mustard waved in profusion around and within the precincts. I pitched camp on a clear spot among the tangle of weeds, and passed a quiet Sunday in wandering about the old place, and in the company of quail, doves and squirrels, and echoes and fancies of the past. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Eleven Pine Canyon, the Burton Mesa, Camp on the San Antonio, the Sierra Santa Lucia in view, Casmalia and the Todos Santos, a fine seascape. Point Sal, friendly entertainers, a Spanish Petruchio, fog and rough trail, Guadalupe, humours of fence advertising, the valley and town of Santa Maria, Southern California left behind, hunting a location, the Nipomo Valley, the Dana family, Arroyo Grande Valley, San Luis Obispo Bay, an Indian burying place, a Portuguese legend, the Avias of Avia, more Spanish Californian hospitality, Shakespeare, and the drama of California. From the mouth of the Santa Inez River, which is a few miles northwest of Lompoc, the coast for fifteen miles or so is low, sandy, waterless and, for the greater part of the distance, roadless. When I add to these unsavoury items the probability of that dismal wind still blowing on the coast, I searched the map for some better way, and decided to take a road that ran north, by way of Pine Canyon, parallel with the coast, but a few miles inland. We crossed the river by a wide ford. Chino was excited this morning walking fast and nervously, evidently for some reason in a hurry, to get away from La Purissima. I had tethered him at night in a rather ghostly-looking angle of the mission wall, for shelter from the wind, and his present behaviour made me wonder whether my good horse might not have a streak of superstition in his make-up. I found Pine Canyon as attractive as its name. The road was enclosed by steep hills, wooded with oaks and small pines, and water and pasturage were plentiful. The pine is ever my best-loved tree, and these were the first of the family I had come among directly since I started. I was tempted to make a camp, but it was only midday when we came to the head of the canyon, and found ourselves at the edge of a wide, flat expanse known as the Burton Mesa, which stretches west and north unbroken for miles. Across this we took our tedious way through leagues of oats, uninterrupted by house or fence, and but little enlivened by a few haggard, wind-blown oaks. Only once I saw a wagon passing hull down on the distant horizon of oats, as if it had been a ship at sea. To the north rose a low range of whitish, shaly hills, and I thought I descried a derrick or two at its foot. 
It was a depressing landscape. No birds seemed to inhabit it, and the only sound over all the wide space was the long whisper of the oats. The sparse flowers looked lonely and frightened. Even the poppies seemed to have lost their broad yellow smile. I was glad when an abrupt descent took us down to the San Antonio Creek. A large ranch house stood on a knoll beside it, but all up and down the long valley no human being was in sight. We crossed the creek, and among a clump of leer-like moss-draped oaks, on a side hill, I made camp. The cottonwoods that grew along the creek bottom made quarters for a large colony of crows. I like these loud, cheerful blackguards that carry off their iniquities with such bravado. The sound when they came swinging home at bedtime was like the crowd cheering the orator of the day, and when they began to shout and scuffle over the desirable perches, Chino looked round at me from his gazing in amazement at such behaviour. A rattling chorus came already from the frogs in the creek, and before supper was over the owls opened in unusual variety of song. Nor, unhappily, was the impish note of the mosquito absent from the concert. I turned in early and smoked my after-dinner pipe in bed, chatting with Chino, and watching the stars winking through the leafy canopy. The rumble of surf came to me from four miles away with a peculiar deep tone that was due, perhaps, to its being conveyed partly through the earth. Then I felt some small animal, probably mole or gopher, shoveling at me from below. With moonrise there arose also an indescribable hubbub of coyotes. They went like mourners at a wake. To these dulcet tones I fell asleep, and knew no more till Chino called me at first daylight, whinnying to be let loose to graze. Our way next morning was up a long canyon with a frightfully bad road. There was compensation in the beauty of the oaks which shaded the way with an almost solid firmament of foliage. At the head of the canyon I looked out at a long desired sight, the distant highlands of the Sierra Santa Lucia lying low and blue in the north. For years I had been waiting my chance to get at that little travelled range and it had formed, in part, a main inducement in planning the summer's trip. Now that, at last, I was coming within striking distance, I gazed at it with special interest, trying to forecast from the dim and tumbled outlines some features of contour, timber, or stream. A long grade took us down to the valley of the Todos Santos, through which comes the railroad on its way to the coast a few miles to the southward. At the foot I found the village of Casmalia. Half of its score or so of houses were closed, and hotel and store were vacant and dismantled. I was glad that I had stayed the last night on the San Antonio instead of pushing on to this cheerless place. I sat for a few moments on the porch of the hotel while I condoled with an old Casmalian. Why, yes, he mourned, the barley and beans look good, but the toady santy ain't what she used to been. Them old strikes in the santy mari just plum cleaned this whole country out of ranch hands. You'd a thought twas whiskey they struck stead of oil. This pregnant remark gained point when, passing the saloon a few minutes later, I noted the speaker's figure in an expressive posture at the bar. A belt of broken country here extends to the ocean, ending in a fine headland at Point Sal. It looked so interesting that I turned westward to see what the coast might be like. Following an almost deserted road for a few miles, through rolling cattle range, I came upon a striking landscape. A strong wind blew from the west, and before it the fog rolled in, grey, chill, and gloomy. 
southward stretched a shore of sandy barrens on which huge breakers thundered with a power that betokened that a considerable storm had blown at sea. Beyond a mile all outline was lost in the smother of flying sand and spray. Now and again a pale gleam of sun flooded the scene with strange dull tones of colour. The heavy water showed yellow through the pallid wash of foam, and the wastes of sand took on a sickly tinge of ochre. To the northwest the point showed dark and misty between the upper and nether firmaments of the fog. At five miles' distance I could see the flash of the waves as they burst and rushed wildly up the face of the cliffs. All combined to interpret the intrinsic sadness, the ageless passion of the sea. It was hard to turn away from this superb sight, but evening was coming on, and the nightly problems of water and forage waited to be solved. A mile further on I met two horsemen, one evidently American, the other Mexican, who reined up and seemed to wait an explanation. When I inquired the prospects of making camp, the reply was discouraging. I was told the road had been abandoned. I could not cross the mountains by it, and must turn back. I answered that with a saddle-horse I thought I could get through, and anyway I meant to try. To this the American replied that the road was fenced across and the gates nailed up. He was foreman vaquero on this range, and no one but his own family lived farther on. I saw that for some reason I was regarded with suspicion, and it seemed best to make plain the innocent nature of my intentions. The explanation brought a welcome change of attitude. The hospitable American instinct came into play, and I was told that I might go on to the ranch house, where I was welcome to stay the night. An hour's travel took us to the house. I saw no one about the place, and my knock was not at once answered. The first thing that came into view as the door was opened was a rifle, evidently held by the person who opened it. This proved to be the foreman's wife, and to her I related my meeting with her husband. I suppose my appearance backed up my story, for the rifle was laid aside, and I was invited to put up my horse and make myself at home until supper-time. By then the husband had returned, and the meal was enjoyable, with racy table-talk as well as good fare. They were Oklahomans, not long in California, and full of entertaining comments and comparisons. I was struck by the feeling for natural beauty which came out in the conversation of this foreman of cowboys. He spoke in vivid words of the grandeur and mystery of the sea, and had a ready eye for anything fine in light and shade, or in canyon and mountain contour. From the daughter of a former owner of the Point Sal Ranch, whom I met a day or two later in Santa Maria, I gained some interesting particulars regarding the place. I had noticed near the ranch house an odd-shaped little building, looking like a lost summer-house. I found it had been the deck cabin of a ship that was wrecked on the point. The captain and his little daughter, and some of the crew, were buried on the hill above the house. No bad resting place for storm-beaten seamen, but bleak and pitiful for that little daughter. The remains of a cable landing on the cliff above, and quiet waters inside the point, were a reminder of the anti-railway days when Point Sal Landing was a place of more importance than now. From here a road went east, by way of the Cuyama Valley, and through the San Rafael Mountains to Fort Tejon, a name of epic sound to Californians of half a century ago, and over it an incredible amount of traffic came and went to and from this little shipping place. That was the age of mules in the west, and on these primitive mountain roads teeming rose to the level of a science. In later days the working of gypsum mines in the mountains nearby furnished employment for many men, 
and there had been some excitement over the discovery of gold in the sands of the beach, and rumours of a rich mine, hidden in some cave known to the Indians, and only to be reached by boats at low tide and at risk of life. From time to time treasure-seekers were trapped on the shore by the water, so the good old gentleman, my informant's father, kept a stake with rope attached on the cliff edge, by which more than one rash gold hunter had climbed back to safety. I learned further that in the vicissitudes of things Californian, the ranch had once changed owners for the consideration of a yoke of oxen and a bottle of wine and there was a full-flavoured story of some old Spanish Petruchio of the region who had tied his scolding wife to a tree, cut off her hair, and braided it into a pair of bridle reins. This dowry don seems to have had a passion for the bazaar. He is said to have possessed a string of dried ears, collected from the enemies he had slain, which quaint souvenir his daughter was wont to wear as a necklace at balls and fandangos. With such legends or histories are many of these lonely holes and corners of California illustrated. I slept well in the old barn which I shared with Chino and some families of swallows that had built in the gable. Next morning my host put me on the obliterated road that climbed the mountain and I bade the kindly people good-bye. The scene again was fascinating. The wind had fallen somewhat, but still came from the sea, and freighted me with the gloomy masses of fog. Again and again the cold white mist enclosed us, or streamed more darkly overhead, to break away with bewildering suddenness, and reveal the long dark headland hooded with cloud, its foot whitened every moment by the tearing claws of the sea. It was like a page of ocean, and the short mountain grass trembling in the wind, with the purple thistles ranked beside the path, was suited to the scene. Now and then came the hoarse barking of seals on the rocks, a thousand feet below that deep seal roar that beats off shore above the loudest gale. It was altogether the finest, because the wildest, piece of weather, scenery, and sentiment all mingled that I had met on the whole expedition. I even shouted aloud, uh, never mind what, in my excitement, giving Chino such a start thereby that he came near pitching me over the cliff. So far we had been climbing steeply, but keeping near the shore. Now the track struck directly northward, and I regretfully bade adieu to that wild and lonely coast. The path was difficult to keep, and often I lost it in the wide and down-like hillsides. At last we reached the summit, in a dense smother of fog that made it impossible to travel at all by half an hour. Then I found that we were shut in by a barbed wire fence, and it was another half hour before I could get the wires down so that Chino could step over. Finally, rounding the shoulder of the mountain, I came in sight of the coast to the northward. It ran again for a long distance in trackless dunes, and I determined to strike once more inland until I could return to the bolder coast that must begin at the southern end of the Santa Lucias. I found a rough road that wound down the Coralillos Canyon, and with one or two detours made necessary by the washing out of the track, we came in due course to cultivation, and the eternal barley and beans. As we emerged into the wide Santa Maria Valley, beets joined in to make a trio. By evening we reached the little town of Guadalupe. From its Spanish name I expected to find it old and interesting. On the contrary, it was merely old and dirty. Half the place is Chinese, with the regulation red and green joss house, the regulation smells, 
barbarous yellow flags hanging from bamboos, and store names looking like groups of excited tadpoles. The other half is mixed Portuguese and Italian Swiss, and it's hard to say which half was the more unprepossessing. I found a stable, though not an ostler, for Chino, and learned from a skirmishing boy that the saloon across the street was the only hotel in the place. The proprietor, a pig-like Swiss, wasted no civilities on a customer who had no choice, and seemed to resent a request for water and a towel. For half the night sleep was wrecked by the din of bibulous patrons. I was up betimes and hastened away from Guadalupe as the first drowsy Chinese was lighting his pipe in the doorway of his frowsy laundry. I now took an easterly course up the valley. An unbroken green of beets spread mile on mile, and substantial farm buildings gave evidence of prosperity. Far to the north the foothills of the Santa Lucia took a hue of fawn where the sunlight flowed over swelling contours of dry grassland, purple where companies of oaks marked out the canyons and clouded the higher ridges. The nearer landscape was uninteresting, and I was fain to beguile the way with the unconscious humour of the fence advertisements. Modest efforts like Goldstein's Prices Will Surprise You, or Bowen and Scraypen for Shirts and a Square Deal, were varied with bursts of wag-like song such as Bilkham's shoes are straight, and our prices are right. Call in and see us, partner. Two doors past the P.O. We'll treat you white. Hmm. The board fence has never been given its due by writers on the genesis of American poetry. Gradually houses became more frequent and more urban in look. Some of them, large, new, brilliant with paint and bougainvilliers, I judged to be the residences of the local magnates in oil and beets. In due course we arrived at the thriving town of Santa Maria, finding it dressed in patriotic bunting in readiness for Independence Day close at hand. I put up for a day and found the place very attractive, the model of a progressive western town, neat, bright, and well-ordered a whole continent a parting character from its neighbour, the mangy and ill-favoured Guadalupe. Leaving here at noon on the next day, I took a northward road, crossing the Santa Maria River, or, more exactly, its bed. It showed a quarter of a mile of Sahara-like sand, without vestige of water, though four months before the river had been running amuck, bank full and yellow as ancient Nilus. Here I entered the county of San Luis Obispo. It opened hopefully with a rougher look, and I felt by many tokens that I was no longer in Southern California. The cross-range of the Tehachapi is the physical bar which gives effect to the conventional division of the state. It is the region south of the Tehachapi that constitutes Southern California, and that was now finally behind me. A mile or two beyond the river I saw two wagons approaching me, loaded with household stuff that showed some family on the wing. In the first were a couple of rosy young women, who stopped me to ask whether I had seen any people camping in Santa Maria as I passed through. It appeared that they were expecting to overtake there some advance guard of their party. In the other wagon were a man a woman, a sleeping baby, and, as my ears told me, several more children who were stowed away in the covered rear end. The man accosted me with, Say, stranger, where are you from? Los Angeles. Los Angeles, eh? Well, you can maybe tell us how things are down in that section. I made the best answer I could to this rather extensive question, and learned in turn that they had come down from southern Idaho hunting a location. There is a picturesqueness in such incidents, a bunion-like simplicity, 
as it might be, and in my journey I saw a company that came to meet me in the way, and when they were come to where I was, one that seemed a goodman betokened me as if I should stop. So I stayed, and we fell a-talking. You are well met, said he, and then he would have me tell him how all matters did in the country of the South. For you must know, said he, that we are travellers, as I see you are, and seeing we are met on contrary ways, it may be we shall save our steps and our beasts as well, if each other shall show the other what manner of country it is he is bound away from. Do you begin? And so on. Thus the sons of Adam, John Thompson, even as Mahalaleel, still are going about the earth in the old elementary quest, seeking a place of habitation. I heartily wish them Godspeed, and the caravan vanished in a cloud of dust. In the Nipomo Valley through which I was now passing, there are living a number of members of the Dana family. At the death of the late head of this branch of the house, who was a cousin of Richard Henry Dana, the writer, who has several times been referred to and quoted in these pages, the Natomo ranch, of over thirty-seven thousand acres of land, was divided among his numerous children. Using the privilege of a traveller, I called upon Mr. John Dana, the eldest son, and was received with all possible kindness, American frankness and Spanish courtesy together, for his mother was a Carrillo, of the best blood of Spanish California. It was like an echo from the old days to hear from his daughter how, half a century ago, her father would ride in one day the ninety miles to Santa Barbara to pay a call to his betrothed in the evening and it was a surprise to learn that the lady, Doña Carolina, was a niece of that Captain Thompson whom the author of Two Years Before the Mast drew in such effective colours. I was entertained that night at the ranch of another one of the family a mile further up the valley. It needed an ample table to accommodate the three generations of Danas with whom I sat at supper and I wondered, as I listened to the cheerful bilingual talk, and noted the fine physical results of the union of Saxon and Spanish strains, whether the race does not suffer more than we think by the barriers which prejudice often raises against interracial marriages. My road next morning was through the rich grain land of the Nipomo. Straight ahead rose a striking peak named El Pichaco, and on the east ran a range of odd sugar-loaf hills, from which many a bright rill came romping down. Reaching the top of a long rise I could see the flash of breakers five miles to the west. An hour or two took us into the Arroyo Grande Valley, a region famous especially for the growing of seeds. On leaving the prosperous little town, we took the road once more toward the coast, which we struck near El Pismo, a newly exploited beach resort. The place had no attractions for me, but Chino scented a stable, and gazed anxiously toward the town as we passed it by in the offing. Here ended the long sweep of low sandy shore. From this point northward the coast ranges pushes its spurs sharply into the waters of the Pacific and the scenery consequently becomes bolder and continuously attractive. The coast here trends west and then south to form the Bay of San Luis Obispo. To this point come pipelines from the oil fields in the interior, and from Port Harford on the west side of the bay cargoes of oil are shipped to many ports on this side of the globe. At Oil Port I saw a deserted refining plant, complete to every accessory and representing a huge outlay. Its owners had been defeated in some bout of wits with the colossi of the industry, and there it remains, silent and inactive, an example to rash capitalists. 
the road now swinging inland to avoid a hill, I found myself in a pretty wooded canyon. A short distance along it I came unexpectedly to a hotel, whose reason for being is some medicinal springs nearby. The place was so pleasing in its bird-haunted seclusion that I took Chino's hint and put up for a day or two while I explored the locality. On the cliff a mile away a recent subsidence of the land had laid bare an ancient Indian burying place. The ground was strewn with crumbling yellow bones, and though the best of its archaeological treasures had already been gathered up by collectors, it was easy to unearth rude implements of stone that had been buried under many feet of accumulated soil. No doubt future ages will similarly delve among our own remains as those of a sort of savages. Nearby was the dwelling of a Portuguese fisherman who came over to chat, and hospitably invited me to visit his cabin. I found him full of friendly talk and simplicity. Seeing me notice a framed print of the Saviour that hung above his bed, with the title O Bom Jesus do Milagre, the Good Jesus of the Miracle, he seemed to fear that as a probable Protestant I might disparage it. For the defence he related the story of a poor Portuguese boy who, having once buried some money for safety, was unable to find it when he came back to dig it up. In his distress he fell to prayer, and vowed to have half the sum to the church if he were enabled to find it. As he resumed his digging a man came by who asked what he had lost and offered to help in the search. The money was quickly found, and the stranger went on his way. The boy, true to his word, was proceeding to fulfil his vow, when, on the wall of the church whither he had gone to complete the arrangements, he saw a picture of the Saviour, the same in attitude and expression as the one I was looking at. "'That is the man who helped me find my money!' he cried joyfully. We believe that, said my fisherman eagerly, we believe that. People's laugh at us. Well, we believe that. I assured him that I saw nothing to laugh at in his story, as God forbid I should. At this he was greatly pleased, and shook me earnestly by the hand, saying that I was a good man, a good man for sure, and that when, by help of my Spanish, I was able to decipher some phrases of Portuguese in a letter from home, he clapped me on the back delightedly, and declared that I was a good scholar all right, good man, good scholar, good friend. A mile further along the coast at the mouth of the San Luis Creek is the little village of Avia, where lives a Spaniard of the same name who is related to some of my friends in the south. The Avias formerly owned the whole neighbouring grant of the San Miguelito, but the inevitable has taken its course. The property has passed to the gringos, and even the fine old family mansion was burned to the ground a few years ago. I found Don Juan living with his sister and niece in a little wooden building on the site of the old house. He was deep in King Henry the Sixth, for Shakespeare and Cervantes are his twin sons of literature. When I presented my letter, I must need stay to dinner, he would take no denial. And then, as sounds of agitation came from the chicken-yard, there, you see, Doña Josefa has killed a fowl for you, and Maria will be vexed if you do not taste her colacci. Many were the tales he had to tell of life and manners in the bygone days, of fiestas and bailles in the old house, with pensive tribute to the rare wines and champagnes that used to flow thereat, of the horses, then of no more account than rabbits, so that if a friend, even a casual traveller, needed one, it was but to send the vaqueros to run a band into the corral and then choose the one you like, it is yours, and of how the Spaniards, when selling cattle, would receive the stated price as each beast was passed over, one steer, one gold piece, another steer, another gold piece, and so on. That was to save trouble, 
perhaps also to save mistakes, for it is a matter of common report how grossly they were cheated by some of the traders who, knowing that a Spaniard would not condescend to examine an account, were unduly prone to little blunders, casting up units as tens, and so forth. When I rose to go, I found that a bed had been made ready for me, and that I must stay the night, or I should deny them the now rare luxury of entertaining a friend. I could not refuse this kindness, and Shakespeare and the drama of California, and Don Juan's cigars, occupied us until long past midnight. End of chapter 11「French hospitality and Irish. The city of San Luis Obispo, the mission, preposterous chimes, lynchings, volcanic peaks, a grey day, Italian Swiss settlers, blithe cowboys, morrow, entering the coast range country, Cayucos, the town of Cambria, Abalone Fishers, San Simeon, Piedras Blancas Lighthouse, Welsh Kindness, Indian Relics, A Primitive School, Irish Hospitality Again. A few miles to the northeast of the San Luis Hot Springs is the city of San Luis Obispo, with another of the Franciscan missions. My contour map showed an interesting-looking piece of rough country lying near the coast, which would be missed if I took the direct road. I therefore determined to find a way over the mountains, and made a start northward, up a canyon, charming with ferns and wild flowers, and profitable with blackberries. A gay little brook trotted beside the road, and when outposts of the pines appeared on the higher ridges, I congratulated myself on my choice. We passed many small farms, but nearly all were abandoned, owing, I fancy, to the repeated washing out of the road in winter storms. Near the head of the canyon I found the owner of a ranch working at the road to render it passable for a wagon, in hope of making his farm saleable. His family and furniture had been moved away, he said, but he should be glad of my company for the night at the house, if I chose to stay. This I was glad to do, and enjoyed his simple talk of his losses, his children, and his plans. Somehow such confidences often come nearer to the heart than a valuable kindness. Next morning I started early on my climb. The dilapidated road went no further but my friend pointed out a trail that led in the right direction. It struck at once up the mountain side, which here bore a thin forest of the interesting knobcone pine, Pinus tuberculata. The region had been burned over some few years before, with the result that most of the old trees were dead, but around them flourishing squads of pinelings were growing. These were already bearing cones, as if nature had hurried to forestore another fire, which, if it had come before the young trees bore their fruit, would have ended their succession. For the species is peculiar in holding its cones unopened until fire destroys the tree, when the young seeds are liberated by the heat that kills the parent. This seemed a vivid illustration of St. Paul's eloquent argument for the resurrection. The trail had gradually become fainter, until, near the summit of the first ridge, it wavered off into uncertainty, and finally ran out. I tied Chino and beat about for a half an hour, hoping to pick it up, 
but the depopulation of the canyon below had put the trail into disuse, and the industrious brush had quickly claimed its own. To south and west I got glimpses of the ocean at a few miles' distance, and, on the other hand, ran a maze of mountains and canyons, far too steep and too heavily brushed to allow of our making across country. Leading Chino carefully along a sharp slope, I gained a connecting ridge that was sufficiently open on its summit for travel. It bore west, whereas I wished to go north but I went on in hope of either striking a trail or finding more open country by which to drop to Coon Creek Canyon, where I knew there was a road. Coming at length to the end of the ridge, I found that it fell away steeply. In the deep canyon that opened before me I saw a tiny canyon and traces of cultivation. It was getting towards evening, and there was nothing for it but to go back or to get down to the canyon where there would probably be a trail, and almost certainly water. So, leading Chino carefully by the bridle, we began the descent. It was a difficult piece of work, and not entirely without danger. Had I been alone it would have been merely to fight my way through stiff brush down a steep hillside, but Chino, with his encumbrances, was in constant danger of losing his footing on the sharp, uneven slope or getting snagged on some rock or stubborn elbow of greasewood or buckthorn. But the good horse behaved well, responding instantly to my voice and guidance, and by sundown we got safely down to the canyon. As I expected I found a good stream, and following it down we soon came upon a faint trail which led to the cabin that I had seen from above. It was deserted and had fallen into the quick decay that overtakes man's abandoned outposts in the wilderness. A row of cypresses, a few starving vines, figs and apples, and a straggling rose-bush seemed to show that a family, not some solitary settler, had here suffered defeat. It was far from being a cheerful spot, but it served our purpose well enough. I found good pasturage for Chino on a little cienaga, or marshy spot, beyond the creek, and supper and a rousing pine-wood fire soon put me in happy mood. I spread my blankets among the old trees of the orchard, and lay blinking at the darkening embers until the final blink came that was prolonged until morning. We were early on the march, or, to speak literally, on the scramble. I had figured out my whereabouts as closely as I could by map and compass, and decided that I must be on Diablo Creek, the stream next south of Coon Creek, which I must somehow reach before I should find a road. I prospected up the first one or two canyons only to find that they soon changed their direction. Then came one that seemed more hopeful, though it was full of broken rock and boulders and hard on Chino's feet. I determined to try it. As I was leading him carefully among the rocks, I stepped close beside a rattlesnake that lay coiled among them. We had a lively engagement for a minute or two, but as I was not wearing my revolver he was too discreet to come into the open. I had the mortification of seeing him slip into a cranny where neither shot, stick, nor stone could reach him. I always feel unhappy when I fail to kill one of these detestable creatures. We made slow headway up the canyon, which soon degenerated into a gully. It grew very hot, for in this narrow place no breeze could reach us, and the rocks reflected the heat like fire-brick. Once or twice it seemed impossible to go on, for Chino was slipping about every moment and I was afraid he would fall and come to harm but the gully continued in the right direction, and I hate turning back. During pauses for rest I would sit upon a rock to study the map, while Chino looked on over my shoulder. Then we would discuss the situation somewhat thus. I interpret my horse's part by his demeanour, which was almost intelligent enough to amount to conversation. Chino, 
hang it this can't be the trail you know i why not it's not exactly a trail chino but it heads the right way besides the map chino confound the map i don't believe i uncle sam's map chino your uncle and mine it must be right you know chino well but i it can't be much farther to the head of the canyon anyhow and then chino well but look i getting up now look here my boy we are going on up so that's all about it at least i am you may stay where you are if you like chino aside that'll never do he pays the stable bills in town fairly enough sighs heavily well then all right we'll take another shot at it come on governor in this manner we toiled along for perhaps two hours and at length stumbled out from the canyon upon a flat where under a big oak were the traces of an old camp probably of cattlemen on the hillside opposite i saw to my relief faint but unmistakable signs of a trail after an hour's rest we made for it and followed it down long zigzags here overgrown with brush and there washed out by rains until we emerged in a green valley which i knew must be coon creek canyon in a little shanty from which smoke was rising i found an old frenchman woodcutter sorting herbs into bundles his first word was the most hospitable one are you hungry i'll get you some dinner i was glad to take a cup of coffee which was still hot on the stove and then learning that the road was close by i struck into it a comfortable ranch house stood at the junction and seeing a man romping with a child by the open door i went over to speak to him when i had made sure of my whereabouts and explained my presence in that out-of-the-way spot the question again was have you had dinner well come in we're just sitting down the family consisted of the handsome old man i had spoken to a stalwart son and daughter-in-law and two chubby blue-eyed children i was made to feel as much at home as if i was a member of it myself it proved that they were irish so i might add another nationality to the list of those from whom i had received a traveller's aid and comfort like the apostle i felt myself debtor both to the greeks and to the barbarians san luis obispo was still eight or ten miles away and after the morning's work we travelled slowly i walked leading my tired horse and enjoying a sunset view out over the wide los osos valley below me a lake of milky cloud filled all the valley extending westward to the coast and far out to sea above it stood up black and ragged the summits of a row of volcanic peaks which give a unique character to this locality beyond lay the main range of the santa lucia down near at hand softly opalescent in evening light about sundown we arrived on the outskirts of the town and i furnished diversion for the young fry of the place as i hauled my tired steed along almost by main force to his quarters my own were close to the mission and at intervals of each day of the two or three i stayed here i watched from my window the black-shawled women hurrying to service once before when i was in town i had wandered into the old building and finding service in progress had felt it good to kneel with the half dozen mexican peons who shared the back seats with me somehow the tires of a common humanity and i hope a common humility also seem to me of more account than the differences momentous as i hold them to be between rome and canterbury and when i watched those humble black-shawled rather sad-faced women going to their devotion something brought to my mind the carpenter's wife of nazareth and a phrase or two of that sweetest lyric of holy writ the loneliness of his handmaiden exalted them of low degree the mission itself founded in seventeen seventy two 
is not specially attractive, but contains some interesting matters. By the kindness of the priest I got entrance into the old garden, a quiet square of old-time flowers and arbored walks. The father told me that the Tulareños, or Indians of the interior valley, who came periodically to the coast to gather shellfish, still make their camp as a right in the mission grounds. I was glad to hear that, in the eyes of his church at least, the Indian has yet some trifling rights beside his pauper's dole. I was at first staggered, and then much amused by the bells of the mission, as they called worshippers to the services. Imagine being awakened from normal slumbers by this preposterous ditty rung in a sort of jig-time on bells not remarkable for sweetness of tone. Reader's note here follows two lines of musical annotation in two-four time. End of reader's note. Repeated four times and ending with three explosions fortissimo. This, it appears, is San Luis' traditional exhortation to his parishioners. Performed, as it was in quick time, with a sort of idiotic excitement, it resembled the antics of marionettes, and I could never hear it without a burst of laughter. A walk about the town, which is an old one by Western reckoning, and contains some six thousand people, yielded a few attractive items. There is quite an air of old California remaining in the nooks and corners. Near the centre of the town stands what was one of the best old adobe houses, now fallen to the uses of a Chinese laundry. Nearby are a few fine olive and pear trees, and half hidden here and there among the stores are tall date palms and ancient prickly pears that mark the gardens of the old Pueblo. The surrounding region has been the scene of labour of some notable bandits, and more than once it fell to the citizens of San Luis, as to those of many other western towns, to take the execution of the laws into their own hands. In one year, I was told, no less than eleven malefactors, or supposed malefactors, were here summarily hanged, and a lady with whom I talked described how, on one occasion, she herself, a girl at the time, looking casually from her veranda, had seen three bodies swinging in a row at the corner of the street. On leaving San Luis Obispo I took a northwesterly road that led toward the coast. A sprinkle of rain was falling, but those little crossbowmen of God, the swallows, wheeling happily about in the upper air, prophesied fair weather, though the heads of the rank of peaks that rose close by to the south were veiled in rolling mists. Both in colour and outline these mountains are very conspicuous. Each peak stands out isolated, statuesque, and finally unconventional. Broad cloudings of lichen, in grey, ashy green, and purple, variegate the ragged blackness of their contours. Under that sombre sky they had a strange and antediluvian look. As they came near the third in order, called Cerro Romolado, it showed through the eddying cloud as a black volcanic cone, and to heighten its eerie appearance a company of buzzards were perched in the gaunt sycamores at its base, as grim as Odin's ravens. On the other hand lay the Santa Lucias, a long wall of fallen black, belted at half its height with a level stratum of vapour. The valley had fully taken its summer hue of brown, but the foreground was tinged with the gold of dry wild oats. A few grey farms nestled among the grey rocks on the grey mountainside. A colourless stream rattled over a stony grey bed. Grey moss trailed from the roadside oaks and the sky was of that great elemental grey that stirs the Anglo-Saxon in one as sea-spray would rouse a Viking. In California I never get enough of this finest of colours, and here I set my teeth for very joy. Even Chino felt the stimulus, 
tossed his head, pricked his ears, and broke voluntarily into a canter. From here northward, for some hundreds of miles, the principal industry of the coast region is dairying, and the people engaged in it are mainly Italian Swiss. It was a surprise to me, and a rather unwelcome one, to find in what numbers these hardy and industrious folk have settled here. Unwelcome not from any dislike I have for the race, but because my intercourse with them has given me the impression that, of all the various racial ingredients, the Italian will prove to be the most difficult to blend. When I was lingering near the remains of an old orchard to give Chino a chance to graze, a cloud of dust and a hilarious whooping told the approach of a bunch of cattle. They were convoyed by five cowboys in sombreros and chaps, who stopped to fraternize with a brother horseman. They had been four days on their way down from the San Luis Rangers, and were loud in envy when they learned that I was two months out, and still had more than half my journey before me. Two of them at once offered to trade jobs with me, without even waiting to hear the nature of my own business. When they understood this, they were urgent to accompany me, and thought they might be useful in working the picture-box, or even doing the poetry stunts. But finding that their beef was spreading over too wide a territory while we talked, they suddenly jerked their ponies round, and with blithe shouts of adios, jingled away in a whirlwind of dust. Evening was falling when we came to the coast of the village of Morrow. The sun broke for a moment through the clouds in a sudden magnificence of crimson, painting a gorgeous belt along the horizon, and empurpling the great plain of ocean, though all about me was still that nobler grey. Morrow's population sat at ease on doorsteps and packing boxes, watching a game of horseshoe quoits. The stableman was with great difficulty attached to attend on Chino, and I made a meal at a primitive restaurant, where the lads and lasses of the place performed on an adjoining rink to the strains of a phonograph. This pretty place is destined, I think, to be of more note than it is now. It lies at the northern point of a beautiful bay, three or four miles in length, and all but landlocked. The sporting attractions are of the best, and the landward scenery is very interesting, and the great rock El Moro, which stands at the bay's mouth, gives nucleus and distinction to the whole. On leaving Moro I found myself definitely entertaining that little-known stretch of mountain country which borders the Pacific closely for a distance of about a hundred miles. For most of that distance there are no roads and few settlers, while the trails are rough, steep, and often so little travelled as to be difficult to follow. Further, no maps of the region were to be had. Many persons had told me that I should never get through without a guide, but it seemed to me that, since water must be plentiful and I could carry food enough for many days, there would be no particular hardship in the matter, even if I should get lost. My only fears were on Chino's account. The long trip had worn him down. Easily as we had travelled, and with all my care, the saddle had rubbed sores on the withers, which might render him unfit for use, while the question of feed would be a troublesome one, for the wild forage was by now almost gone, and I could not rely on buying fodder from the scattered settlers. However, I could not afford to miss this fine piece of coast, so I resolved to go on, taking what chances there might be, and offsetting them as far as possible by special care. I got some general idea of the trails from people at San Louis, and had no doubt that we should get through. The regulation sea fog lay thick upon the coast as we started northward. To seaward the great rock loomed uncertainly and the cries of unseen gulls came weirdly through the mist. Occasionally a field of beans would be seen near some farmhouse occupied by Swiss, with all hands diligently hoeing, not only men and boys, but women. I suppose to some people this would seem shocking, 
but I own that it had a wholesome primitive look to me, and I could not see that civilization or even culture needed to quarrel with it. The houses were generally rough, too, but they had an air of country comfort, and there were plenty of trees about them. Here again I may be retrograde, but I sometimes wonder whether the elegance of our days is not in some insidious way a foe to true home-making, and whether the modern American home, with its perfection of artistic and hygienic accessories, is quite the equal in value as regards the family idea of those simpler conceptions which our immigrants bring with them though they seldom persist in the first generation of American-born. The road kept near the shore, and as the fog slowly lifted, I now and then caught glimpses of the Santa Lucias, now a soft mystery of blue, shaded with milky skeins of mist. Eight miles, and we came to Cayucos, a one-street village lying in the bend of a rocky bay. While Chino lunched at the livery stable, I found a quaint little restaurant whose Portuguese proprietor, on the mention of my meeting with his countrymen at Point Conception, shook my hand as earnestly as though I had done him a high favour, and could hardly be persuaded to take payment for my meal. A few miles farther, near Point Estero, the road turned somewhat inland. It was again a delight to find myself among pines this time of the radiata species, whose southern limit of natural growth is this region. The tree is one of the handsomest of pines, especially notable for the full, dark brilliance of its foliage. In its manner of growth, and with that background of grey and silver sky, I was strongly reminded of the Scotch fir of my native land. From the top of a long, steep ascent I looked down upon the compact little town of Cambria, lying pine-encircled in a hollow of the hills. I have seldom seen a place more happily situated. A fine trouty stream, the Santa Rosa Creek, flows in a wooded canyon past the town, mingling its jaunty voice with the roar of the ocean near at hand, though unseen. In the gardens, palms compete with wonderful fuchsias, and the sensational rose-bushes of a tree-like size. From its name, and the fact that its mainstay is mining, principally for quicksilver, I expected to find the place Welsh, and indeed it has much of the physical air of a rain-washed Welsh town. I found, however, that, as with all the region, the prepondering flavour is Swiss. I put up for the night at the comfortable hotel, and next morning we took our way again through the fragrant pine woods. On the top of the hill was a little cemetery, lying between sea and pines, and hushed by the voices of both. A bright, strong wind was blowing on this upland. On one hand spread a brilliant green and purple sea, with the eternal fog-bank lying in wait in the offing. On the other rose the mountains, with great pines etched finely on the skyline. Where we came down to the shore, a camp of Japanese abalone fishers had established themselves. Huge cauldrons were boiling on the beach, and a wide space nearby was covered with the drying racks. Here, as at several other places, I found the men equipped with power launches and modern diving dresses. The camps were always neat and systematic, and everything complied with the national characteristic of thoroughness. The coast now curved to the pretty bay of San Simeon, fringed with islets of rock round which the sea coiled in dazzling whiteness of spray. Along the cliff large siestas grew thickly, with lavender lupins, yellow tarweed, Echelotsias of that splendid deep orange that suggests the Arabian Nights, or the court of Ahasuerus, like sunshine filtered through silky curtains of crimson and gold. Inland, grey farms lay in beds and hollows of the mountains. 
wind-shorn oaks and laurels filled the narrower canyons and whenever the road swung in to round the head of one of these i found myself suddenly in a different world among wild roses ferns blackberries and phenomenal thickets of coarse flowering weeds we loitered along so easily among these various attractions that it was near evening before we came to the village of san simeon this once promising little port has dwindled under the caprices of fortune and local landowners until now only one small coasting steamer calls unpunctually at its wharf i found myself the only guest in a hotel that would have housed double the whole population with room to spare but my host an old maine seaman and for twenty years in the lighthouse service on this coast and his good welsh wife made amends by their friendliness for the physical drawbacks of the place i rode out next day to visit the lighthouse at piedras blancas six miles up the coast a rattling breeze blew from the sea and chino appreciating the freedom from saddle-bags and blanket roll let himself out at his best on the way we passed the piedras blancas ranch house i found this once fine old mansion deserted and falling to ruin two ancient cypresses leaned mournfully against the veranda and seemed as though they were weeping the crazy steps rocked under my feet and some pigeons took flight through a broken window the place looked like some faithful old retainer left decrepit and pitiful by the death of his master the lighthouse is a high white tower handsomer than most on this coast i found there beside the keepers a lot of frank-eyed frolicking children whom from their dress i took to be all boys until by chance i found it was otherwise the spot is a lonely one but there seems to be something in the nature of the lighthouse service some spiritual ingredient that keeps its people hearty and wholesome at cambria i met a young welshman owner of a large ranch in the mountains and whose father had a dairy ranch near piedras blancas i called on these good people on leaving san simeon and stayed a day or two with them enjoying the cheerfulness of family life in three generations and the old world simplicity of manners no doubt a travelling turk or zulu would be welcomed in that house of kindness but i could see that old gentleman's heart warm to me when i was able to give him body die chewy good morning for a breakfast table greeting this region must once have had a considerable population of indians though it now contains fewer than any other part of california my host's vegetable garden was quite a museum of their relics the stone morteros or grinding bowls come in handily as sockets for gate-posts and among the baby's toys was one of those in miniature which had probably been fashioned by some aboriginal parent as a plaything for his little girl perhaps an item in a doll's set one of the sons having business with a neighbour a few miles up the coast accompanied me when i started on my way i was respectfully amused at the primitive appointments of the piedras blancas school which we passed which seemed to illustrate pallas in all her chaste severity the schoolhouse was a tent of ten by twelve feet and the furniture consisted of three small tables evidently of kitchen antecedents two plank benches a chair and a desk for the teacher a nail keg for an emergency scholar a demijohn for water with a tin cup a square yard of blackboard and a handful of books apparently fourth hand it was vacation season and a trio of cows sniffed at the crannies in hope of scenting hay the only sound beside the cry of plovers was the sober voice of that wise old teacher the sea thirty yards away and i wondered whether it might not be instilling into those children of the lighthouse who come here for their simple schooling some fine lesson of reverence and wonder that one day may blossom into poetry or art 
My companion's destination was a dairy ranch, kept by two jolly young bachelor Irishmen. One or two neighbours happening in, we made a cosmopolitan dinner party, six nationalities among seven people. Gaiety and friendliness abounded equally with beans and home-cured bacon. Again, there was no withstanding the hospitable pressure to stay for the night. I shared my host's room, with the result that we talked so late that we hardly got to sleep, when we were awakened by the cries of the vaqueros as they brought the cattle into the corrals for the morning milking. End of chapter 12Chapter Thirteen of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Thirteen, San Copaforo Canyon, oddities of pronunciation, more kind Mexicans, a mountain home, the pear orchard, a resting spell, the Santa Lucia fir duality of climate, physical and pictorial aspects of the region, a hot climb, crossing the crest, more great oaks, camp on the Nascimento River, a delightful swim, Sunday in camp, the trail lost, intelligence of Chino, the San Antonio River, the village of Holon, Indian music, my classification. The fog, which had hardly lifted for two days past, lay denser than ever over the coast, when, about mid-morning, I rode away along the cliffs. I caught momentary glimpses of black fang-like rocks among which the sea hissed and spouted in incessant uproar. From the cliff edge the ground rose to a high, undulating horizon, uncertainly seen between the wreaths of the fog. The country was treeless, only low-growing brambles, thistles, and bracken sprinkled on the ground, and mingled their faint wet odour with the strong smell of the sea. All concurred to bring up a vivid resemblance of the downs and moorlands of England and I half fancied I heard the seraphic voice of the skylark showering down impassioned joy from the firmament of grey. Gradually there grew before me the high wall of the San Copperforo Canyon, and a couple of miles brought me to its edge. This name suffers many uh, variations. I have read it San Carpoco, San Carpojo, San Japoco and San Hapojo, while in speech the changes are run on Sankipoco and Sankipoki. It is not surprising that this modest saint should prove troublesome to laymen, and I had lately met with greater oddities of pronunciation at San Simeon, where I heard Piedras Blancas seriously referred to as Peter's Blankets, and Arroyo Cruz the name of a neighbouring canyon as a royal cruise. The San Carpaforo is deep, with a sandy bar and a roaring surf at its mouth. I took the trail up the canyon, where a small stream wandered in a waste of brush and boulders, and, after passing one or two deserted cabins, came at midday to a thrifty little Mexican farm gay with flowers and children. There was a smell of cooking in the air, and I inquired whether they could get me dinner. It was willingly done, and the meal was doubly enjoyable for the tokens of happiness and affection that abounded among them. When I asked what I owed for my entertainment, "'Nothing, senor,' said the good woman. "'It was but a poor dinner. That is worth nothing.' And when I left, it was with a chorus of Buena Fortuna. To keep the main coast trail, I should have crossed the canyon at its mouth, and continued directly northward. I had two reasons, however, for wishing to make a divergence. One was to visit the mission of San Antonio, which lay on the other side of the coast range, 
and could be reached by a trail that crossed the mountains at this point, the other to study a rare tree, the Santa Lucia fir, Arbis venusta, which is found far up a few canyons of this range. I had heard that a small group of them grew in the San Capo Foro, and the double object decided me to turn inland. After a few miles the trail left the bottom of the canyon and climbed the northern wall. Scattered willows were exchanged for shady woods of oak and maple, with thick underbrush of wild cherry, buckeye, and many other flowering shrubs. The fog had quite lifted by noon, but long before sundown white scarves of vapour again floated in, eddying in elbows of the canyon, or creeping with serpentine motion along the cliff-like walls. The opposite summit, gaining an increased effect of height from the belt of the fog, rose like the wall of some legendary sky city. High up the north face of the canyon I came upon the ranch of my friendly acquaintance of Cambria. It lies about midway up the western slope of the mountain, backed by a wood of fine oaks, and looking out over the deep rift of the canyon to a high ridge crested with pines. For situation the spot is quite ideal, and its elevation of seventeen hundred feet, with its nearness to the sea, give it an unequalled climate. In the orchard I saw such diverse fruits as cherries, oranges, and butternuts, with many others, all growing in perfection. Again it was Welsh hospitality to which I felt debtor. The evening sped with tales of sport for which the antlers, skins, and other trophies that crowded the house furnished the texts. When I awoke at dawn next morning I looked out from my bed under a maple upon a spectral river of cloud that filled the canyon below me. As the sun rose the vapour began to draw away in shreds and skeins of grey and for an hour we were enveloped in the grateful moisture. Another hour and the sun burned as through a glass, while the fruit reddened almost as one watched it. Yet a pleasant coolness held in the shade, and now and then a snowy berg of cloud drifted lazily up the canyon to melt away as it reached the warm stratum of the upper air. There are the remains of an old orchard hereabout, the origin of which is a mystery to the very few people who know of its existence. It lay near my route, and I turned aside to pay it a visit. It goes by the name of the pear orchard, but I found only one pear tree remaining, and sharing the solitude with a score or so of hardy olives. By comparison of the size of these olives with others I have seen in the gardens of the missions, it seemed that they could hardly be less than a century old, while the pear was an oak-like tree, the nestor of mortal pears. Who were the planters of this secluded mountain garden? I could only guess that, like the one I had found on the Halama, it had been an outpost of one of the Franciscan missions and had been planted by the old padres with the help of their Indians. But padres and Indians alike have long vanished, and left no successors to claim the fruit of this forgotten orchard. Chino's sore withers had become so troublesome that I resolved to cease travelling for a time while I doctored and rested him. A few miles up the canyon I found a good place for the purpose where a Cienaga provided abundance of pasturage, and there I made camp, under a great oak beside the creek. I had provision for ten days or more, and there were plenty of trout in the stream. The Cienaga produced medicine as well as forage, in the shape of the herb called by the Spaniards Mastransia, an excellent remedy for such troubles as Chino's, either in horses or men. I was not sorry myself after two months in the saddle to stay for a time in this attractive place. Twice a day I brought Chino in for medical parade, otherwise there was nothing to interfere with a program of fishing, mending, 
botanizing in my humble way, or unadulterated loafing. About a mile from camp I found the group of firs I wished to study. They grow in a deep and narrow part of the canyon, and mostly on the northward-facing slope, where little sun reaches them. I was greatly interested in meeting this rare tree, of which there are probably not more than a thousand or two living. In shape it is a typical fir, straight, spiry, and symmetrical, reaching a height of about eighty feet. The foliage is stiff, bright, and sharp-pointed, and the cone is unique for the long bristly bracts that protrude from between the scales. The cones are produced only at the top of the tree, and it was a little trying to feel the slender leader bend almost horizontal under my weight when I climbed to secure a few specimens. On the mountain side about camp grew a scattering of digger pines, Pinus sabiniana, becoming more numerous toward the summits. It was a mark of the particular duality of climate in this region that both the moisture-loving fir and this drought-loving pine find it suited to their contrary natures. The yucca and the great golden mencelia, five feet high, also flourished in the hotter slopes, the former a surprise to meet in this latitude. I found that I had been largely mistaken in my forecast as to the physical features of this part of the coast range. I had figured this western slope, where streams are numerous and summer fogs almost perpetual, as a region of rugged mountain, bearing a heavy forest of coniferous trees, as being similar in fact to the corresponding slope of the Sierra Nevada, but with more of timber by reason of the greater moisture of the summer climate. Instead of this I found, rising from the coast, steep but rounded hills of grass, only occasionally ridging up to rocky crests. Files of oaks grew in folds and hollows, and mingled with them in the deeper canyons were alders, sycamores, willows, and the fragrant California laurel, otherwise known as myrtle, pepperwood, or bay. Farther north I found the slopes steeper, the canyons deeper and more wooded, and the crest of the range, which runs higher than here, densely forested. But there also the seaward slopes are rounded, grassed, or brushy, and, generally speaking, scant of timber. Pictorially, the country I was now in is full of beauty and character. A more admirable contrast of colour could not be imagined than those massed slopes of quiet gold, gentle in contour, but striking in height, imposing in length of range, and blotted by the clustering oaks with islands of serious green. Especially was it lovely at sunset, when the summer yellowed hills took a flush of rose, the long canyons were shadowed in purple, and even the uncompromising blue of the sky warmed to a tenderer glow of violet. The flat where I had my camp had once been homesteaded by a settler, one Heisel, whose memory is kept alive by the remains of his fireplace. It seemed natural that the last token of a home-loving German, as I take him to have been, should be his chimney. My blankets were spread under a small oak nearby, and I made a point of smoking my evening pipe beside the old pile of stones round which, I guessed, his own tobacco smoke must often have eddied. I had been nearly two weeks in camp, and it had come to mid-August. My supplies had almost run out, and Chino's pasturage was becoming scanty, but his sores were looking well, and it seemed safe as well as necessary to move on. When it came to starting I became conscious again how quickly any place of abode, camp no less than cottage, engages man's instinct for a home. My heart fell a little, as I took a last look around the little clearing, and I waved my hand sentimentally to the oak that had been my green caravanserai. Not with Chino, who marched off so cheerfully that it was plain he suffered no pensive emotions. 
I had got such instructions as I could regarding the trail across the mountains. It is so little travelled that only twice during my fortnight in camp had anybody passed along it, but it is well marked and in some places worn deeply into the earth. I suspect, indeed, that it may have been in mission days the trail to the old orchard which I have mentioned, and that it was from the firs in the canyon, called Arbolis de Incencio by the Spaniard, that the fathers at San Antonio procured the aromatic gum for incense. The trail led steeply up the mountain side to the northeast. There was a hot sun, and the warm wind from the interior valleys brought more distress than refreshment. I had saddled Chino with special care to avoid chafing, and, with a view to his comfort, had packed the load on the saddle as I intended to lead him. I did not fill my canteen as I relied upon finding water where I crossed the creek higher up. But at the first crossing it was quite dry, and at the second only a couple of slimy pools remained among the boulders. These Chino promptly drank dry. After two hours of pretty strenuous climbing we came to the crest of the ridge, from which I looked out over a wilderness of low ranges, coloured here in dark bands of chemise, there in golden slopes of grass, thinly stippled with oaks and digger pines. I made a hasty lunch, for I had no very clear idea of the distance to the Nascimiento River where I intended to camp, and which would probably be the first water we should strike. Then, with a regretful glance back to the west and its cool fog curtain, we plunged down the landward slope. The sun beat down with trying fervour. The trail was rough and difficult with brush, and the shade was at an impossible premium. A couple of miles down I found the remains of a settler's house, and explored for water, but without success. An hour or more of rough going brought us to a wide glade wooded with oaks of unusual size and beauty. They were the great valley oak of California, the Robla of the Spaniards. The species was well known to me, but nowhere else have I seen it reach the stateliness of these superb trees. The huge white trunks and fountain-like flow of branches had a sort of Greek perfection. One could easily understand why, if Greece has such oaks as these, they were held sacred to Zeus. Here were the remains of a house, and I searched again for water, for I was getting pretty thirsty, but the cracked troughs in the old corral gave notice that I need not expect to find any, and seemed to hint at the reason for the abandonment of this handsome homestead. A short distance beyond this place the trail emerged at a divide, and I saw with relief the canyon of the Nascimento lying below, with one pool of blue water shining among its sun-bleached boulders. The opposite wall was a high perpendicular bluff of purple-red rock, barren except for a few spectral digger-pines that grew in crannies, or leaned in languid attitudes on the summit. It was an unusual landscape, and one worthy of particular notice, but I was too tired and thirsty to enjoy it, and hurried on to get down to the stream. The trail descended at the north side of the canyon, and by evening we debouched at river level into a valley of grass, oaks, and pines. Fording the river we went into camp among the willows on the farther bank. I was amused to see the puny size of the stream, for at Cambria I had heard a ranchman describe how he had nearly lost his life in swimming it with his horse three months before, and I had intended to use caution in fording it. Such are the vagaries of Californian rivers. There was a deep pool, almost landlocked, close to camp, and to this, after supper, I repaired for a swim. I do not know when I have enjoyed one so much. The water was crystal clear and perfect in temperature. White sand formed the bottom. One side was fringed with small cottonwoods. 
and the other, where the water was deepest, was walled directly by the dark perpendicular rock, from the crevices of which waved fringes of delicate ferns. The moon was nearly full, but it was not yet an hour past sunset, and the day hovered on that quiet borderland where one can hardly tell shadows from thoughts. A pale flicker of moonlight caught the ridges of water that flowed about me as I swam slowly to and fro. And once a water snake slipped noiselessly away before me, the little black head rippling the water into lines of pallid silver. After the heat and thirst of the day, I felt half inclined to sleep in that delicious pool. Then I gathered a good supply of fuel and spent a luxurious evening in company with a small but loquacious fire. Tomorrow would be Sunday, and we should not travel. I was glad that it occurred that I would pass a day by this stream which I had long wished to see. Even the name seemed to invest it with a special charm. I take it to have been a religious reference, and the association of the holy birth with the quietude and beauty of nature that reigned in this lonely spot seemed very happy. I suppose there was not a human being within ten miles of me in any direction. I woke next morning in time to catch a coyote nosing at the saddle-bags which I had hung in the fork of a willow tree twenty yards from my sleeping place. A shot from my revolver sent him scurrying. The morning was passed in camp, in hope of offsetting the maximum of heat by a minimum of exertion. In the afternoon a trifling breeze wandered up the canyon, and I spent some hours in trying to prospect out tomorrow's trail among the tangle of cattle paths that crossed and recrossed, converged and diverged all over the country. It was annoying to find, after several miles of tramping, that what had seemed to be the principal trail led again uh, to the river, by which I knew that it was not the one I wanted. In the end I resolved to ignore them all, and strike across country by compass. It was evening when I got back to camp, and the air was full of the cooing of doves, and the wick-wick of their wings as they flew to and from the river. Once, when I went downstream, I saw for the first time the great American egret, Herodotius egretta, unmistakable in its snowy beauty, though not now wearing the bridal plumes that have almost brought the species to extermination. I noticed also the watermark of the spring rains in the drift that had lodged in branches fifteen feet above the present level and could better appreciate the risk in swimming such a torrent, nearly a furlong wide, and full of hidden traps and dangers. I was up next morning by moonlight, and after breakfast doctored Chino's saw, which had become inflamed again by the heat and the climb of Saturday. I saddled him with all possible care, again arranging his load with a view to leading instead of riding him. Then we both drank deeply at the creek and started with a full canteen. I had no map of the region, for there is a gap of a hundred miles or so here in the maps of the geological survey, but I gauged the direction of Holon, my objective point in the San Antonio Valley, to be nearly due north, and believed I could trust the compass better than one or two doubtful landmarks of which I had been told. The country ran in interminable low hills, or lomos, as monotonous and about as vacant of recognizable features as a tract of ocean. But it was pretty open, and only cut by shallow gullies from which the water had vanished, leaving a sickly white incrustation of alkali. Among these we threaded our way, hour after hour, without much difficulty, while I looked carefully at every trail we crossed for marks of horses' hoofs, but saw nothing but the tracks of cattle, coyotes, and deer, except once when a bear's heavy imprint was sunk into the baked clay of a dry arroyo. Chino was in unresponsive mood, though I tried to interest him in various topics. 
I am sure that by now he understood much of what I said to him. Naturally, I did not choose such matters as politics or the price of pig iron for discussion, but to such sentiments as, Chuno, my boy, we're doing handsomely, aren't we? Or, what do you say to taking five minutes for cooling off, old fellow? I am sure he responds understandingly, while when I attempt something humorous as, Well, old chap, I don't see the domes and minarets of Holon on the horizon yet, do you? He replies with something that comes as near a smile as it is possible to the equine countenance. Nature, in framing this best of quadrupeds, seems very judiciously to have put the humorous ingredient at a minimum. It would be unfortunate if the horse were so constrained as to care as much as the terrier, for instance, for practical joking. Between the two of them it seems to be a question whether the horse or the dog is to be the first to surprise his master some fine day not far ahead by bringing out the epoch-making words, Good morning. We had been steadily marching northward for several warm hours, when the cattle paths we were on began spontaneously to develop symptoms of wheel tracks, which grew imperceptibly from nothing and nowhere. The trail widened gradually into an unmistakable road, which led, on the whole, in the right direction. It ascended a long, winding canyon through sparse timber, emerging at last upon a river which I knew must be the San Antonio, while beyond the low range of hills to the east must lie the wide valley of the Salinas. Then came a fence at which novel sight Chino stepped out with more enthusiasm. The stream was almost dry, but under the bank I found a little trickle of water, and we took an hour for lunch and rest. A mile beyond the river I saw a ranch house in the distance, and knew by the flutter of linen that it was inhabited. A young woman answered my hail by opening a window six inches. To my inquiry whether I was on the road to Holon, she replied curtly, Yes. And the distance? A mile. And with that the window was slammed down and she vanished. This was somewhat chilling demeanour from the first human being I had seen for nearly a fortnight, but the news of my whereabouts was welcome enough. We were soon on the main road, and by evening entered the village and put up at a rustic inn, where Chino tasted once again the comforts of a stable, and I of feminine cookery and housekeeping. Holon is a primitive place, though not an old one. It lies twenty miles from the railway, but on a road which has a fair amount of travel. A dozen times a day an automobile charges through, with passengers goggling through the clouds of dust to catch those flying glimpses which seem to satisfy the people who like that way of seeing the country. The village consists of two store and hotel combinations, a church seldom used, a school, three saloons, and about as many small residences. A sound of strumming came continually from one or other of the saloons, where two stolid Indian youths on violin and mandolin sat playing sans intermission the simple and rather joyless airs to which generations of their people have danced or shuffled. They played in an oddly mechanical fashion, giving no least token of pleasure in their occupation, but sawing and picking away in a poor, dull way that seemed pathetically to illustrate their racial attitude towards life. A little creek, a branch of the San Antonio, runs through the village and is vocal all day with plovers, while trios and quartets of coyotes, wise beyond the range of poison or rifle, perform in the dusk of dawn and evening. Holon promptly adjudged me to be a prospector, and the classification held good until the following noon, when my landlord approached me with a sample of rock and requested a diagnosis. I saw that he disbelieved me when I said I could not tell quartz from quicksand, but was convinced when I declared his specimen to be volcanic putty, which it certainly resembled. On the score of my McClellan saddle I was next placed in the forestry service, 
and as no occasion arose for disturbing that idea, I suppose it remained. For the rest, I noted that the dialect of Holon is rather above rather than below the Western standard in amount and quality of profanity, and that days when the thermometer registers a hundred and odd degrees are pronounced by Holonians to be agreeable. End of chapter 13「fourteen of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter fourteen. Farewell, Chino. Enter Anton. Camp at the mission of San Antonio de Padua. Crows, ants, swallows, and coyotes. Spanish hospitality and family affection. Dog versus skunk. Digger pines. Recrossing the crest. Santa Lucia Peak. Los Borros Mining Settlement. A voluble box lid. Delightful trail. Entering the redwoods. The coast again. Bold scenery. Pacific Valley. A lonely ranch. Striking it rich. The weekly mail. My only regret in leaving Holon was that there I said farewell to my good Chino. The roughness and heat of the journey over from the San Carpoforo had resulted in inflaming his withers again, and so badly it would be at least two weeks before he could be fit for the troublesome piece of country that lay ahead. I had noticed in the hotel stable a well-built saddle-horse a little heavier than Chino, of a colour between buckskin and sorrel, and showing that dark stripe along the back which is recognised by experts in horse-flesh as a mark of superior toughness. From the fact that he had last belonged to a forest ranger, and also from the remarkable variety of brands he carried, I judged that he must be used to roughing it, and when, on a trial canter, he proved to be free and lively without undue nervousness, I decided on the change. It went much against the grain to part with this loyal companion of several expeditions by California shore, desert, and mountain, but the summer was getting late, and I was only about halfway to my goal, so that I must not lose any more time if I was to finish the trip before the rainy season set in. A trade was arranged. I filled my pockets with Chino's preferred dainties, paid him a final visit, and left him munching my valedictory apples with so much indifference that poignant regret on my own side seemed superfluous. It was mid-afternoon when I started with my new acquisition, whom I named Anton, by way of reference to the San Antonio Valley in which Holon is situated, for the mission of San Antonio. The road lay up a pleasant valley of oaks. A somnolent haze overhung the landscape, and deepened the tone of the distant mountains to densest purple. The nearer hills rose in restful shapes, dotted with brush, and crested with phantasmal digger pines. These trees have almost the air of a mirage, so thin and unsubstantial do they appear. At the north end of the valley, where the hills closed together, I came to the mission. It stands ruined and solitary on the east bank of the river, and looking down the sunny, oak-filled valley. In situation it was perhaps the happiest of all the missions, but, like nearly all the others, it has suffered from both spoilation and neglect, and the beauty of its setting seems only to accent the desolation of its decay. The remains show the total enclosure to have been of great extent, and history gives it as one of the most prosperous and important of all the chain. The church, which has lately been partly repaired, is a lofty barn-like structure with no remaining traces of interior decoration or furnishing, and the walls are horribly defaced by the name-scratching insanity 
of sightseers. The façade, built of the durable mission tiles, is still beautiful in its tasteful simplicity, and a few skeleton arches of the quadrangle are standing. But the bells have long since disappeared. Instead of vesper chime, the air was raked by the strident voices of many crows, disputing, after their wont, over the choice roosts in the cottonwoods. It needed a more violent effort of fancy than I was capable of to hear in the shouts of these pirates the songs of praise which poets think they detect. In pleasant contrast, St. Anthony's swallows, happiest dispositioned of birds, were thrilling with evening joy, and seemed to weave a charm of communal friendliness and content about the old crumbling building. Hard by the church stand a few indomitable pears and olive trees, as thrifty as though not a year had passed since the last of the padres of San Antonio forsook his hopeless charge. A broken rank of pomegranates marks the boundary of the old garden, their uncompromising green and scarlet quite out of harmony with every other element of the scene. A small building of adobe a hundred yards away was interesting as showing the early California method of roofing. The heavy rafters and ceiling beams were still held in place by rawhide lashings. Layers of tules were placed on the rafters, and on these rested the heavy red tiles. I later learned that the building had been the mission jail. I made camp in a brook that ran in a hollow behind the church, but had fancy for sleeping among the olives, a fancy for which I paid tribute to a spiteful colony of ants. Coyotes sympathetically shared my vigil. I slept uneasily, and was awaked in ample time to receive their adieus as they stole away to cover at dawn. These animals are very numerous in this locality, and as I rode away in the afternoon I noticed the carcasses of several of them hung to the limbs of the trees, for example, to the rest. Some of my Spanish friends in the south had recommended me to relatives of theirs who lived near Holon. I found them living a few miles from the mission, and was received in the kindest manner and made welcome to stay at the house. It was a good example of the ranch house of earlier days, a substantial adobe, broad of verandas, and shady with locusts, almonds, and clustering roses. There was an orchard of fine old trees, and a well of specially soft water, to which the young beauties of the neighborhood were wont to resort on Sundays, a dozen in a bevy, to wash their dusky tresses. It would make a pretty sight the row of girls with locks dishevelled, sitting in the sun beside the tamarisk hedge, laughing over the gallantries of young Oturos and Robertos, and laying trains of harmless malice for firing at the next fandango. Here again it was most pleasant to see the family affection to which I have referred on previous pages as a noticeable feature of Spanish and Mexican life. Little Julio, and Adriano and Ingratia came clambering about their genial giant of a father, calling him by his pet name of Tito, and the Signora might have sat as a model for the picture of a happy wife. A brother of my entertainer happening in, I was carried off to spend a day or two at his house ten miles up country. We rode the whole distance through unbroken oak forest, and the house set at the foot of a wooded hill and on the bank of the San Antonio River, occupies a position that might be coveted by millionaires. Deer and quail are plentiful, the river abounds with trout, and even salmon spearing is no rarity. The veranda was a sort of epitome of California sport. Doña Petronella was bound that I should taste all the delicious Spanish dishes at their best. Both husband and wife were full of interesting conversation 
on matters now passed away, and altogether one of the most agreeable episodes of that whole journey was the two days I passed in that tasteful home. From here I was to cross the mountains again to the coast. My host accompanied me a mile or two to put me on the trail. A couple of the dogs came with us, in hope of some interesting incident, which came when my companion spied a skunk, which he shot from the saddle. The dogs rushed off joyfully to do their part, and received a full volley of the particular skunk artillery at close range. It was intensely comic to see their frantic disgust, and the vain attempt they made to rub, scratch, scrub, drown, or outrun the vile legacy bequeathed them by the innocent little Mephitis Americana. At the place where the coast trail crosses the river, my friend said good-bye and turned back, while I struck up the mountain. Digger pines were numerous, and came as near to forming a forest as this singular species ever attains. It is the most shadeless of trees. There may seem to be a fair density of foliage, but the sun somehow gets through all the airy tassels with hardly any loss of power and the ground below shows only the faintest tone of grey. This peculiarity was again impressed upon me as I led my horse up the steep mountainside under a sun of semi-desert heat, and it was with relief that, on reaching the first high ridge, I saw a few miles to the west the blue of substantial forest, and beyond the familiar white band of fog overhanging the Pacific. Reaching at length an altitude where the finer yellow pines began, we halted for rest. Far to the north I could distinguish Santa Lucia Peak, the culminating point of the range, cut in a band of solid purple on the fainter blue of the sky. As we crossed the next divide there opened suddenly a full view to the west. A huge canyon fell away abruptly from where I stood. The northward-facing slope draped darkly in forest, the southward in lighter brown of chemise, and the seaward opening filled with a gleaming barrier of fog that broke here and there into curling waves of vapour. A cool wind blew from the ocean, and I hailed with pleasure the return to coast conditions of climate. Now came a long descent through fragrant forest of pine, spruce, and madroño. It was evening when we came to a point where a side trail led down to the mining settlement of Los Boros. A mile brought us to the village, where we found accommodation at a quaint little hutch of a place kept by a German whose quiver was not only full but bursting with tow-headed, chattering children. The mines are not of great importance, but at least they have disproved the belief that was for a long time prevalent that this part of California was barren of gold. It was a strange sight that I saw next morning, when we had climbed out of the hollow in which Los Barros lies, and I looked out to the west. The fog was not far below me, and I seemed to stand between two firmaments the blue of the upper and the grey of the lower sky. Around me spread a stratum of landscape in brilliant sunlight, with Santa Lucia Peak glowing like an opal in its setting of sumptuous pine foliage. At a little cabin beside the trail I paused to read a notice that had been inscribed on a box lid, apparently with a red-hot nail. In fervour of composition it suggested the agony column, with a touch of Flora Caspi in Little Dorrit thrown in. Uh, this is how it read. Notice. The bond will be taken up. This is Gold Ridge, and don't you forget it, sir. Mines to bond all the famous mother load, free milling, quartz cyanating ore and placer ground on the famous Spruce Creek, biggest bar, famous nugget node at head of Spruce Creek, Above it terms reasonable, inquire right here. 
The house appeared to be vacant, but I did not care to risk meeting the voluble dealer in prospects, and hurried away. That morning's trail was the most delightful I had experienced on the trip, winding down the forested mountain sides among yellow pines, oaks, and madronos. The ground was all ashy rose with the fallen leaves of the last-named tree, and was like one of those wonderful old Persian rugs. Across the canyon the mountains rose in steep slopes of faded gold, laced here and there with dark files of timber, and beyond the distant back ranges receded in varying tones of blue. The fog was slowly drawing out to sea, and suddenly, as if a curtain were partly lifted, I could look beneath the sheet of dazzling cloud and see the crinkled water a thousand feet below, leaden in the shadow of the dense vapour. A short distance up the coast, Cape San Martin stood sharply out, a line of surf marking where the great shoulder of mountain plunged into the ocean. At the bend of the trail I noticed a cluster of slender pyramids rising among the pines, dressed with close feathery plumes. They were redwoods, sequoia sempervirens, no less beautiful and hardly less wonderful than their cousins, the giant trees of the Sierra Nevada. I was now entering upon the territory of this exclusive tree, which grows nowhere but in the fog belt of the coast, from here to the northern limit of the state. I greeted it with enthusiasm, forecasting the many delightful days during which I should be in its companionship. If there had been pasturage available, I would have celebrated the meeting with a night and a campfire, but the best I could do was to decorate my sombrero and Anton's bridle with sprigs of the handsome foliage. The trees had been cut a few years before, and I noticed the vigorous growth of saplings that encircle each great stump. One may often see a number of trees growing thus in a complete ring, marking the circumference of some vanished monster. No tree yields better returns to intelligent methods of forestry than this one, as valuable for its uses as it is splendid in its growth. The trail descended for mile after mile through this charming woodland, issuing at last on the shore at the mouth of Willow Creek. Here the fog again enveloped us in its cool embrace. I gathered this was Anton's first introduction to the sea, for he halted and gazed at it with deep attention, head cocked slightly sideways, as I found to be his habit on encountering a novelty. Close by the place where Willow Creek flows out is the prominent headland generally known as Point Gorda. There being two other capes of the name in California, this one has officially been named Cape San Martin. The point forms the southern arm of Rocky Bay, on which the westering sun now shone palely, half veiled by the vapour that was again beginning to creep inland. The fog movement on this coast during summer is almost as regular as the swing of the tides, and the long canyons running east and west act like funnels for the constant interchange of air between sea and land. The shore here, as all along this mountain-walled coast, is bold and scenic, fringed everywhere with islets about which the water coils and lurches in unceasing turmoil. I cannot imagine a more alluring yachting ground than this hundred-mile reach of lonely water, with its barrier of summer gold or winter emerald, and in the coming era of air travel, one of the inducements held out to tourists by the Pacific Coast Aerial Transportation Company will certainly be the unrivalled panorama of the Santa Lucia chain of mountains rearing its glowing rampart from the isle-gemmed empire of the sea to the azure vault of the Empyrean, etc., etc. 
we now climbed a steep trail cut in the face of the cliff. The flash and thunder of the surf below were so trying to Anton's nerves that the expedition narrow escaped a tragic finale on the rocks beneath. Coming to the top, I saw a narrow bench of land extending a mile or two to the north, the only stretch of level land along the Santa Lucia coast, and dignified with the name of Pacific Valley, though there is really nothing at all valley-like about it. In the distance were the weather-beaten buildings of a ranch, where in due course we arrived and found entertainment with hearty, simple people. The place was picturesque, with a frontier-like litter of odds and ends. On the pickets of the fence I counted eight sets of deer antlers, and the walls of the outhouses bore a notable array of pelts of sheep, deer, oxen, wildcats, seals, and smaller animals. Minus pans and mortars, mineral specimens, fishing gear and rifles marked the various interests of family life. I looked with curiosity, uh, not impertinent, I hope, at the weary-looking elderly housewife, for I had heard that a few months previously the family had struck it rich. A landslide had uncovered a ledge of very valuable gold-bearing quartz on their property, and had promoted them at a step from the frugal comforts of farmers to a reasonable certainty of easy wealth. I could not but wonder what would be the physical, mental, moral, and spiritual results. The father, now dead, had carried the weekly mails for fifteen years by pack-horse from Holon over the trail I had just travelled. Jim, his old departmental mule, retired from service, roams about the ranch, respected by horse and man alike. The day that I arrived chanced to be mail day, so I had the opportunity of seeing the excitement when, long after dark, a clatter of hoofs announced the event of the week, and young Benito, whose acquaintance I had made at Holon, went jingling past on his way to the post office at Gorda, a mile further up the trail. I was glad to find, by the example of this pleasant family, that it is yet possible to live where mail comes but once a week, and telegraph or telephone messages are impossible, and still be comfortable and contented. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Fifteen Camp at Mill Creek. Tools and the Man. A Serpentine Trail. Lucia. A Postal Frontier. A Lost Schoolhouse. The Tanbark Oak. A Coast Range Sunset, Gamboa's Ranch, A Rare Situation, Sudden Changes of Scenery, The Trail, Lost, Again, Rough Scrambling, Little Springs, A Bath in Mid-Air, Unseen Choristers, Two Hundred Feet of Magazines, Camp Among the Redwoods, Superb Trees, Castro's Ranch. It was a Saturday afternoon when I left Pacific Valley. A few miles up coast the view was closed by the promontory of Lopez Point, on the thither side of which is a stream called Mill Creek, where I propose camping for Sunday. The afternoon was bright for a change, and I travelled slowly, revelling in the romping wind and the splendid colour play of the sea. The mountains again rose abruptly from the shore in folds of faded gold that were swept by flying cloud shadows and chequered with clear blocked masses of timber in canyon and on crest. Again I longed to be a painter, a great painter, one to whom the subjectiveness, the spirituality of colour should be known, and who might transcribe this fine fragment of nature in all its material 
and immaterial beauty. There is a largeness and freedom about this little visited coast that puts the mind under stimulus, and almost rids one of that deadly incubus of experience which so sadly dulls the edge of our impressions. At Mill Creek I found one of the landings which take the place of harbours on this rocky coast. A crane, cable, and windlass, by which freight is sent up or down between cliff and water. I found my friends from the ranch at work at a pile of redwood timbers, which they were about to raft down to their own landing. There is no lack of variety in the occupations of the settlers on the coast of the Santa Lucia. Tools and the man will be the text of the Virgil of this region. I made camp beside the creek, but the pasturage was so scanty that it was necessary to take Anton a mile further to where a Mexican lived, from whom I might buy hay. Here Anton was accommodated in the stable, and when, after a pleasant chat, I returned to camp, I carried back a sizable venison steak pressed upon me by the good people. The fog was unusually dense at night, and by morning my blankets were soaking. I kept up a roaring fire for comfort till noon, when the weather cleared, and the rest of the day was spent in seeking shady places for relief from the sun. The creek was full of trout, and two hours of the evening sufficed to catch my breakfast and enough to make a fair return for my venison. The trail next day continued to wind along the cliff, diving every half-mile or so into a wooded canyon and giving a charming alternation of landscape and seascape. If the course of this trail were drawn in bird's-eye fashion, it would show a surprising serpentine, and the ratio of airline distance to actual travelling would be a remarkable one if it were calculated. In one of the canyons I found the home of an old settler. It made an inviting appearance with its garden of herbs and flowers, and its half-acre of fruits and vegetables. A boy was cleaning a rifle by the gate, and through the open door I could see the owner of the place, a man of so little curiosity that, although I may easily have been the first passer-by for a week, he neither asked nor cared to see who the traveller might be. Usually the arrival of a stranger would bring out all hands and a host of questions. In another and deeper canyon, known as Lime Kiln Canyon, I came upon the remains of a considerable building filled with machinery, all now fallen into wreck. The place was a wilderness of ferns, flowers, and noble redwoods, and I had to resist a strong inclination to camp there, backed by Anton on the score of a scanty cropping of green fodder. The climb out was long and strenuous, but Anton did himself credit, and indeed I had constant reason to congratulate myself on the exchange I had made. After some miles of steady travelling my next landmark came in sight far ahead, a farmhouse set high up on the hillside. It was always a relief to find that I was on the right track, for besides being little travelled the trails are much complicated with cattle trails. The house proved also the post office of Lucia, the farthest outpost of the postal service in this direction. Here, on Monday, I mailed letters which, after lying here until Saturday, would be taken to Gorda, where they would wait until the following Saturday before starting for Holon and the inhabited world. Now began another stiff climb, compensated by fine expansive views to seaward. I was astonished to find a school up here on this lonely mountain side. The scholars had just been dismissed and were playing round the neat little building. Of the ten or twelve I saw while I stopped to chat with them, all but two were Mexican, a fact which helped to explain there being so many children within range for Mexican families are apt to be a good deal larger than American, and three little homes might easily contribute a dozen or more youngsters of school age. A couple of miles farther on 
I came to one such home, a picturesque, weather-beaten house shaded by fruit trees, whose size showed a probable age of some forty years. A tall, white-haired old man, who was sitting on the porch, came forward and greeted me in Spanish as I reined up, inquiring whether I would not dismount. I was glad to do so, and passed a pleasant half-hour with him and his eldest son. Again I found that the mere mention of having friendly acquaintance with a compatriot was enough to ensure kindest reception. It was late afternoon when I got my directions for the next ranch, where I intended to stay for the night. Crossing the deep canyon of Vincenti Creek, the trail bore steadily up the mountainside until it must have reached a height of well over two thousand feet. In the canyons hereabouts, the tanbark oak, Quercus densiflora, that curious link between oak and chestnut, grows freely, and the gathering and shipping of the bark formerly made a considerable industry here, as it still does along the coast farther north. At one spot, known as Tanbark Camp, I noticed the remains of a large abandoned encampment. Higher still, and near the crest, I came into a region of magnificent yellow pines and redwoods. It was sundown, and the view was a remarkable one. The sun shone level, and with a strange bronze hue, through a translucent veil of fog. Below the fog the surface of the ocean was clear, and was flooded with gorgeous purple by the sunset. On the high crest where I stood a clear warm glory bathed the golden slopes of grass, and lighted the noble trees as if for some great pageant. There was a solemnity in the splendour, an unearthly quality in the whole scene, that kept me spellbound and bareheaded until, fatefully, imperceptibly, the sun had set. The situation of Gamboa's ranch is superb, the very finest I know. The house, an old and picturesque one, hangs like an eyrie on the mountainside, which is so high and steep that one looks down upon the vast expanse of ocean as if from a two or three thousand foot cliff. Downs of rich grassland fill the view to north, south, and east, with great pines clothing every ridge and hollow. The fog seldom reaches to this height, yet its coolness tempers the summer, and the climate forms a perfect combination of sea, mountain, and forest elements. The boys were away driving cattle across the mountains, but the wife, a pretty Mexican woman, made me welcome, and after a supper of venison with frijoles and tortillas, entertained the hired man and me with a phonograph medley of favourite Spanish airs. It was something of a shock to find that even these farthest recesses of mountains had not escaped that terrible machine, which I suppose by now is rousing the echoes of Nova Zembla and the Mountains of the Moon. I slept under an apple tree in the orchard, which was festooned throughout with ropes of venison jerky. During the deer season, venison is as much a staple of these mountains as potatoes are all the year to dwellers in town. A mile or two beyond Gambona's is the Arroyo Grande, one of the deepest canyons of the range. I had been but little on horseback since we entered this rougher country, wishing to spare Anton as much as possible, a point of necessity indeed, for the trail was almost always either steep in grade, or lay along slopes sharp enough to make the consequences of a stumble something more than annoying. I now led Anton carefully down the stair-like descent, which took us from open grassy slopes through a region of flowery brush into a shadowy canyon of redwoods with a lively stream. Here again it was a trial that the total absence of forage forbade camping, for otherwise the place was superlative for the purpose. 
Half a mile farther on we crossed the north fork of the same stream, for I had to endure a similar tantalization. Then came a long, hard climb out, with alternate blaze of open hillside and slumberous shade of canyon. These changes are startlingly sudden throughout this region. From steep-walled clefts filled with silent companies of straight-stemmed trees and roofed with a green firmament of foliage, one passes without warning to breezy hillsides of sun-scorched grass or brittle grey sage and buckwheat, where, far below, the greatest of oceans stretches from the line of the cliff out and away to infinitude and China. The country hereabouts was marked everywhere with an unconscionable tangle of cattle paths, among which it was quite impossible to keep the trail. I knew that I needed to keep well up on the mountain, but with a mile of steep slant to guess on, I was soon hopelessly at fault. Moreover, the slope was cut vertically by rocky brush-filled gullies, which bothered Anton greatly. Several times I had to build or cart away for him. He was behaving so bravely and sagaciously that when at one place, after I had spent half an hour in trail-building, he pointedly refused to trust himself to it, I thought it best to defer to his instinct and waive the point, though to round the head of the gully meant another hard climb. As it was, he received some cuts upon the knees, hocks, and feet, and I looked at him with compunction when, at last, we picked up a more likely trail, and rested for ten minutes to recuperate and repair damages. Far ahead, and nearly at shore level, I could see a tumble-down mess of corrals and cabins, which I knew must mark an abandoned ranch called Dolan's. I had been advised to camp there on account of there being water and a little pasturage, but when we reached the place it looked so woebegone and generally uninviting that, fagged as we both were, I resolved to push on to some more desirable spot. So on we marched for weary miles now fortunately over a better trail, and at last, rounding the head of another deep canyon, came to Little Springs, otherwise known as Slates. Here I found a comfortable, old-fashioned house where I could put up for the night. In fact, the place makes some claim to rank as a resort, by virtue of its medicinal springs, though no guests were in evidence nor any token of either expectation or accommodation for them. A quarter of a mile from the house I found a couple of tents pitched on the ledge of a rock halfway down the hundred-foot bluff. In them were bath-tubs, to which hot sulphur water was led from springs that break out all along the cliff. Tents and tubs had been hauled up with windlass and cable from the vessel that brought them down from San Francisco and then had been lowered over the cliff on to the ledge near the springs. It was an enjoyable experience to bathe thus, as it were, in mid-air, with gulls screaming all around and breakers roaring fifty feet below. Fog again enveloped us when we started next morning. I was told that the trail from this place was an official one, being kept up by the county, and I communicated the news to Anton for his consolation. It kept close along the cliff, as I could tell from the sound of the surf and the cries of seabirds far below. It was very interesting to travel thus, as was often the case, in company with unseen comrades, beauties, or dangers. Once I heard a company of land birds singing away merrily in some bush in the fog below me. It had a charming sound, reminding one of magical casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. I often wish I were in some small fraction of a Keats myself to put the beauty of such little incidents into felicitous phrase. Now and then a rift in the vapour showed for a moment the dull grey gleam of the comers as they plunged shorewards, 
or the dark fringe of rocks forever pushing back the wash of the sea. In the canyons the fog made a strange white gloom, dense but luminous, through which the great stems of trees stood up like the pillars in some Dantean temple of shades. Sometimes a group of wind-twisted trees showed weirdly through the mist as if peering up from under their matted thatches of foliage in dread of some portentous stroke. Every canyon had its stream, filling the air with a monotone that would have been ghostly but for the cheerful notes of the oozles. The presence of that gay little water sprite is as genial as August sunshine. About midday the fog broke away, revealing far up the coast a prominent headland which I set down as Point Sur. It revealed also my trail, stretching like a pleated ribbon along the mountain, high above the sea, and on and on to vanishing point. At the head of one of the canyons I found a snug little place kept by two old bachelors who have carved out a narrow strip of ground on the roof-like slope above the creek. I stopped for a rest and a chat, and gained a little sidelight on the conditions of life along this coast from the three piles of magazines, each reaching from floor to ceiling of their living room, or about two hundred feet board measure, of compressed literature, which they keep for reading matter in winter, when for weeks together the trails may be impassable. At the mouth of this canyon the creek makes a spectacular drop direct into the ocean, like some Norwegian stream falling into a fjord. In the next large canyon there was a huddle of decayed buildings with the remains of an orchard. As there was fair pasturage I resolved to camp, a special attraction being the fine redwoods that grew along the creek. I had never until then found an opportunity of making camp among these trees, though at one time or another I must have hobnobbed with almost all the other members of the California conifers, from tide-water to timberline. I unsaddled at the foot of a genial-looking monster, picketed Anton in knee-high wild oats, and ate my supper under the eyes of a covey of quail that perched on an old rail fence nearby and disgust me in almost human tones. The occasion justified a campfire of the best, and I passed a long evening cheerful with reminiscences of bygone nights among the forests of the greater California Sierra. The squirrels and jays were roused at first daylight by the smoke of my breakfast fire, but when we were ready to start, it seemed to me that I had hardly done due honour to my first redwood camp, so I took off Anton's saddle and smoked a couple more leisurely pipes. Then, in peaceful mood, we set out. The ocean lay under the usual shroud of fog, but on our high path the sun shone warm and bright, and the morning was gay with birds and butterflies. A rattlesnake that was out for an early breakfast and crossed the trail in front of us left his body to the buzzards, as a sarcastic commentary on the adage of the bird and the worm. Tracks of deer were numerous about every creek and spring, and once, when we had just crossed the trail of a mountain lion, Anton became so excited that I had no doubt he scented the animal somewhere close at hand. The redwoods in the canyons were finer than any I had yet seen, some of them quite wonderful in their straight, stately symmetry. The older branches of the largest trees were recurved, and hung for thirty or forty feet close about the stem. In places the sun's rays could hardly pass through the high roof of foliage, and I moved among the grey and purple pillars, subdued to a green thought in a green shade, as someone has put it. Anton's sensations apparently took the same hue. His pasturage the past night had not been overly luxurious, and he neglected no mouthful of verdure that came in his path. 
I wished I could introduce him to one of those mountain meadows where, in former years, I had often seen my animals half smothered in juicy grasses. Late afternoon found us at Castro's ranch, a comfortable, old-fashioned place, the terminus of wagon travel at the northern end of the Santa Lucias, as San Simeon is at the southern. The distance between them is about sixty miles in an airline, but it must be two or three times as much in actual travelling distance by the trails. I received a genial welcome from those excellent people, and made up Anton's arrears of hay and grain. Dogs, cats, and geese made the place lively with companionable sounds, and an orchard of peaches and apples formed an acceptable incident. I was lodged in a tiny, white-curtained room, opening on a flowery jungle of garden, and at supper was plied with venison, frijoles, and tortillas, with vegetable adjuncts to which I had long been a stranger in notable array. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of California Coast Trails by J. Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Sixteen From Trail to Road, The Big Sur River, Canyon of the Little Sur, Point Sur Lighthouse, A Robinson Crusoe, and A Great Discovery in Mineralogy. Portuguese friendliness once more. The perfection of coast scenery. Point Lobos. Cypresses and pines. The mission of San Carlos, Carmel. Beauty of its situation. The resting place of Sarah, Carmel by the sea. More delightful coast. Wonderful cypresses. Monterey, the old capital of California, as Dana saw it, historic objects, the Stevenson House, Wailing Days, the Old Church. The change from side hill trail to graded road, agreeable enough to Anton, gave me some regrets as implying a tamer country. For the first time in some days I got into the saddle and rode. The morning and the road were both delicious. A cool air came from the sea, which we now left out of sight, and the scents from bay, redwood, and underbrush were spicy and stimulating. The road wound downward between the wooded ridge that shut the ocean from sight, and high, steep hills of yellowed grass slashed as ever with timbered canyons. Unwelcome signs of what I suppose we must call civilization began to occur in the guise of warnings against hunting, fishing, or camping on this ranch. From time to time I caught the sound of a large stream running in the canyon below, and before long we dropped into the valley of the Big Sur River and came upon a little Noah's Ark affair with post office painted upon it. This place has long been known as Posts, after an early settler, but lately some person with a craving for change has persuaded the authorities to rename it Arbolado, a monstrosity of mongrel Spanish of which the department should not have been guilty. From here a stage runs on alternate days to and from Monterey, twenty-five miles to the northward. For five charming miles the road accompanied the stream under the grateful shades of redwoods mottled with gold and green of filtered sunlight. Then, climbing in long curves, it opened a fine view of the valley of the Sur, lying open as on a map, the stream itself hidden in deep forest almost to where a bar of surf marked its meeting with the ocean. A strong wind was blowing from the water and as the fog broke away from time to time the warring white-clawed waves could be seen far out at sea. Nearby and on my left stood the lonely rock of Point Sur, its summit hidden in mists, 
and on the other side rose a striking white mountain called Pico Blanco, the second highest point of the range. It looked strangely white, almost as though it were snow-covered against the blue of the eastern sky. From north and west masses of grey sea-rack came driving every moment in imposing volume, and encountering some opposing air-current maintained a sullen battle among the hills. Descending the steep grade we entered the beautiful canyon of the Little Sur, where, to my surprise, I found a mountain hotel and a resort of tents on the bank of the river. The place was deserted by the summer visitors, for September had now begun, but hay was there, and I judged it best to stay for the night, for fodder was now the matter of first importance in my calculations. I devoted the rest of the day to a visit to the lighthouse at the point, five miles away. The afternoon was delightful, with a clear sun and a Kiplinesque sort of wind, and Anton, relieved for once of impediments, bethought himself of his Arizona youth, and was bent upon rounding up all the cattle he saw on the hillsides. The ocean was of a splendid windy purple, though far to seaward the fog lay furled along the horizon in a band of pearly grey quail whistled in the brushy gullies, and overhead the gulls strained and screamed against the wind. A little black steamer was shouldering her way doggedly up coast, the white water churning by her side, and the smoke tearing away from her funnels as she fought her way along. I thought that Ruskin, in his quaint dogmatism, would not have included the smoky little bulldog in his eulogy of the sea-boat, but it seemed to me to show all the dutiful hardihood that roused his admiration, bearing its breast moment after moment against the unwearied enmity of ocean, the subtle, fitful, implacable smiting of the black waves, provoking each other on endlessly still striking them back into a wreath of smoke and futile foam, and winning its way against them, and keeping its charge of life from them. The point is an abrupt rock, connected with the shore by an isthmus of sand. A narrow path cut in the rock leads up to the lighthouse buildings. Anton was excited when he saw the surf crashing below him, and gazed from it to me with an I say, you know, kind of an expression, which was comically human. I was kindly received by the lighthouse folk, and shown over their spick-and-span domain. The light, which is a powerful one of the first order, stands two hundred and forty feet above the water, rather too high, I was told, since at that height the fog is more frequent and dense than nearer the surface. In the course of a walk up the stream next morning, I came upon an original, who for many years has lived a Robinson Crusoe life in a cabin high up on the canyon wall. His ramshackle dwelling was more shed than house, and I found the ancient himself seated beside it in a rather alarming state of undress, under the shelter of an umbrella, which he had hung obliquely from the roof to intercept the morning sun. With his bright blue eyes, skin originally ruddy but now tanned to Indian hue, and shock of long white hair, he made a most odd appearance. He was talking to himself as I approached, but hailed me hospitably to come in and sit down for a chat. The chatting was a passive affair on my side, for he himself did not cease talking for a moment, and after one or two vain attempts to stop him, I only sat and listened. His great topic was minerals, concerning which he had a theory, new to me, that every metal has a father and a mother. This great discovery had been revealed to him by an old Indian woman, once of these parts, who had bequeathed him a map, by which, he declared, he was able to make his theory effective. 
to discount the probable discrepancy between his apparent poor circumstances and his potential wealth he explained that he cared nothing for actual money being content with knowing that he could at any time procure it a philosophy which as he appeared to hold it sincerely was an admirable one and worthy to be recommended to our captains of finance the wind blew more strongly after sundown and tassels of foliage from the redwoods overhead came thumping all night on the tent in which i slept it was blowing half a gale when in the morning we took the road which after crossing the little sur river climbed a long rise that brought us again into company with the sea the birds had collected in the sheltered canyons and their unusual numbers made those parts of the way especially attractive so steep were the sides of some of the canyons that where the road ran high up on the wall i could look down upon the tops of the redwoods close below me as if i were an aviator and the scent that came up from the forest was such as to speak humbly i hoped to find in heaven in one canyon i found a schoolhouse the first i had passed for a week and a post office named sir the latter gave no token of its use for mail-boxes and signboard had gone out to sea together during the winter rains when i learned that the stream was mill creek i wondered how many more of that name i was to meet i think mill creeks in california could be numbered by the score all day the road wound along a rocky shore beside a bright sea broken by surf-ringed islets and the glistening fringe of kelp that lies for league on league unbroken along this coast to landward still rose the monotonous drab hills sprinkled with grey sage-bushes or greyer outcroppings of rock at long intervals stark-looking ranch-houses appeared but there was little travel on the road and the human voice was still a rarity to the ear wreaths of fog came drifting in now and then from the sea and the faint coughing of the siren at point sur miles in the rear seemed to add to the loneliness of the scene on rounding a bend i saw the hills before me crested darkly with pines even at three miles distance their vigorous manner of growth marked them as the radiata species and i knew that by that token we were coming to the neighbourhood of monterey where almost alone the tree is native it was nearing sundown and i should have been glad to camp among them but again the necessity of fodder forbade and i turned in at the next ranch to inquire the prospects for a night's lodging the portuguese woman received me kindly and found me a bed in a little outhouse the husband was away but five jolly children took possession of me with such enthusiasm that it was evident that a visitor was regarded as a prize of the first degree in five minutes avellino was on my back ernesto and braulio were punching me jovially angelis of the soft brown eyes was filling my hands with her best beloved flowers and fat jose was planning a rescue in order to show me a phenomenal pharaoh of pigs supper was an uproarious event and afterwards the whole battery of phonograph records was ground off for my delight i left them next morning while the boys were milking the herd of thirty cows and dear little angeles in enormous sunbonnet and gloves skirmished about waiting to carry the pails to the milk house it was a superlative morning with neither wind nor fog the first hint of autumn was abroad in some elusive fashion though in brilliancy the day was more like may than september the sea was a splendour of deep mediterranean blue and broke in such dazzling freshness of white that one might have thought it had been that day created how amazing it is that the ancient ocean 
with its age-long stain of cities and traffic, toil and blood, can still be so bright, so uncontaminated, so heavenly pure. It seems an intentional parable of divinity, knowing and receiving all, evil as well as good, yet through some deathless principle itself remaining forever right, strong, and pure, the unchanging good. Pines grew here along the cliff, outlining with tawny stem and dark magnificence of foliage the most exquisite of vistas. The coast was broken by little bays full of brown seaweed that rose and fell indolently with the slow breathing of the sea. Islets were scattered along as if they had been dropped like pebbles out of a full hand. I do not think there can be anywhere on our shores a more enchanting piece of coast than this and the next ten miles to the north. It is the acme of what is generally named the romantic in sea scenery, and is calculated, I should think, to throw an artist into a frenzy in which he would paint one final and conscious masterpiece, then close colour-box, camp-stool, and umbrella, and hurl them all over the cliff together. Noon found us at Point Lobos. It is a superb headland, overgrown with pines and cypresses that lean in perilous balance over the crashing sea, or stand statuesquely on rocky ledges, ideally pictorial. The cypresses are monarchical fellows, wonderful in size and evident age, and leer-like in their storm-thrawn attitudes. Like the pines, they are strict natives of this locality, and give a unique charm to this delightful coast. By their manner of growth they reminded me of the monumental yews of English churchyards, and indeed there is much of the same solemnity in their gnarled stems, far-reaching bony arms, and rich but gloomy foliage. I was courteously entertained at lunch by the owner of the ranch which includes this enviable piece of coast, then pursued my way, soon crossing a bridge over the wide, shallow stream called the Carmel. A beautiful valley here opens inland. I had long wished to explore it as well as to try my flies on the river, which has a good reputation among fishermen, but Anton was badly in need of a blacksmith, now near at hand, and I decided to keep the road towards Monterey. A turn brought me to the Mission of San Carlos, generally known as Carmel, one of the oldest and most interesting of all the missions. There's a particular beauty in the simple, rather heavy building that I could not easily explain to myself. I think it lies in the perfect balance which has been kept between solidity and ornament. The tower is a model of proportion, and the façade is only broken by one star window of simple but beautiful design. The star is a little out of the symmetrical, as is also the cupola of the tower but the variation is too slight to be jarring, and, if anything, adds a pleasing and humane touch to the modest building, as a token of the artless sincerity of the poorly skilled workman. Situation is another element of its charm. Tranquil hills, clouded here and there with pines, rise on two sides. A peaceful river flows silently by and at a little distance lies the blue and golden curve of the bay, broken by flash of surf where the tide is leaping on the river bar. The only houses in sight are a quiet farm and the little flowery dwelling of the Mexican who acts as caretaker. In the church the body of Junipero Serra himself lies buried near the altar, with those of three of his comrades. A tablet on the wall above commemorates them thus. Hiciacent exuie rev patris inipericera osf, missionum californiae fundatoris 
Ac Praecidis in Pace Depositae de XXVII Menses Augusti AD MD CCL XXX IV Atque Sociorum Eus RRPP Johannes Crespi Uliani Lopez et Francisci La Suen Requiescat in Pace. Reader's note, my poor Latin translation reads thus. Here lie the remains of the Reverend Father Unipero Serra OSF, founder and protector of the uh, missions of California in peace deposited this 28th day of August, Anno Domini, year of our Lord, 1784, and his companions, RRPP, Johannes Crespi, Giuliani Lopez, and Francisci Lassuan. Rest in peace. End of reader's note. It seemed to me a pleasant spot to be the resting place of the weary old priest. Swallows were weaving all about the place and had built against the painted windows above the grave. Their eager little voices filled the air and came mingled with the dreamy iteration of the surf. For a moment I was in Assisi, an auditor of St. Francis, the jongleur of the Lord, and of his little brother jongleurs. From here half an hour brought us to Carmel by the sea, where I tasted the luxury of a comfortable hotel, while a livery stable received my good Anton. The village is pleasantly rural, with its houses scattered through a pine wood that slopes to a beach of whitest sand. It is a notable place of residence for artists and university dons from Stanford and Berkeley, and one is conscious of a mildly bohemian or scholastico-artistic air. Carmel certainly has an unusual range of attractions. Its own happy situation, the exceptional beauty of the adjacent coast, a soft and equitable climate, and facilities for a variety of sports. And overall there hangs a tinge of romance from the neighborhood of Monterey, the capital of the Spanish and Mexican California of no very long time ago. I might have been in Monterey in an hour from Carmel by crossing the neck of the Monterey Peninsula, but I could not bring myself to miss any part of this enchanting coast, so next morning I took the road that follows the shore. This is part of the renowned seventeen-mile drive which figures on the itinerary of California tourists, and its fame is certainly justified. In its fine grouping of the beautiful and striking elements, the scenery might really be called classic, and indeed I doubt whether it could be surpassed, unless in Greece or Italy. The shoreline is ideally broken and wonderfully rich in colour, the water a play of emerald and sapphire hues breaking momentarily in sudden blaze of surf, or shaded to deeper tones by the brown banners of the kelp. Promontory and cliff are peopled with fantastic forms of pine and cypress, sumptuous in sombre green, or shagged with grey pennons of moss. Once the road ran for a mile or two under a deep cypress arbour, a green and brown tunnel, lighted dimly by windows that opened on brilliant seas, and echoing with cadence of surf and scream of roving gull. Many of the trees lie prone on the brown floor, mere tumbles of mossy green. Others are amphorous monsters with huge rheumatic knees and elbows, grey as the very bones of time. At Cypress Point, the outer headland of the peninsula, where winds career most wildly, the gaunt wardens of the cliff have been torn, twisted, hunched, wrenched, battered and hammered to the limit of tree resemblance. They make a Homeric-looking company, 
and tell a stirring tale of battle with every gust of rugged wind that blows from off that beaked promontory. Beyond Cypress Point the shore falls to dunes of white sand, splashed with creeping sea herbage, and trending northeasterly to Point Pinos at the southern horn of Monterey Bay. Inland the ground rises wooded everywhere with pines, and it was deep pleasure to ride slowly along, hour after hour, in that fine companionship. On one hand the comfortable sigh of forest, on the other the long, solitary surge of the Pacific. By evening we were entering the pretty seaside town of Pacific Grove. The tolling of a train bell sounded strangely in my ears, for we had parted company with the locomotives at San Luis Obispo several weeks before. As we passed the military reservation the sunset gun boomed from the Presidio, whereat Anton performed a most spectacular jump, and then a little parcel, which furnished some excitement from the smart soldier boys. Complicated odours of fish and antiquity met us as we entered Monterey, where the street cars wrought Anton's nerves to a point of desperation. I piloted him by back ways to a stable, and found myself a lodging at the house of a charming Spanish lady to whom I brought a letter of introduction from my good friends at Lompoc. Monterey forms almost a compendium of the history of California. It was only half a century after the first voyage of Columbus that Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo sailed into the bay, and the first civilized anchor dropped into its quiet waters. Sixty years later came Sebastian Vizcaño, and claimed the soil for Spain, giving the port the name of his patron, the Count of Monte Rey, then Viceroy of Mexico. That would be in 1602, five years before the Jamestown settlement was made on the other coast, and from that time down to the end of Mexico's ownership, Monterey remained the capital of the province of Alta California. Dana gives a picture of the town as he saw it in 1835, towards the end of the old regime. Quote, the pretty lawn on which it stands, as green as sun and rain could make it, the pine wood on the south, the small river on the north side, the houses with their white plastered sides and red tiled roofs dotted about on the green, the low white presidio with its soiled tricolored flag flying, and the discordant din of drums and trumpets for the noon parade." Unquote. Much of the air of its early days still pervades the place, and makes it in a way the most interesting town in California. The green lawn has gone, but many of the low adobe houses remain, and a good part of the population is Spanish or Mexican still, and my hostess, Doña Carmelita, herself a resident of Monterey from girlhood, has not a few compatriots with whom to talk over the old, gay, easy days that lingered here long after the rest of California had been charged with American energy. Monterey, and not the Mission Dolores in San Francisco, as Bret Hart expected, seems destined to be the last sigh of the native Californian. Many of the buildings are ticketed with some legend to attract the interest of tourists, generally a claim to being the first or last of their kind, or purpose in the state is the theme. Here is the first brick house, and here is the first one built of lumber. That low shady house was the home of Governor Alvarado, one of the last governors of the Mexican province, and at the bottom of the street that bears his name is the Custom House, where on the 7th of July, 1846, the flag of the United States took the place of that which Dana saw flying. Nearby is the first theatre, and on the hill is a large frame building which served as the first state capital. A ramshackle wooden house on a side street hoists the sign R. Stevenson House. 
I was not sorry to find that the authenticity of this particular relic was denied by my hostess, who declared that Stevenson was merely an occasional visitor at the house in question, and that he lived in a house, now pulled down, adjoining the one which professes to have been occupied by the last American consul, Thomas O. Larkin. As circumstantial evidence, the Senora confessed how she and others of the vivacious damsels of Monterey used to watch from the windows of the opposite house where she lived, Stevenson, Keith, the painter, and other cronies as they smoked and joked on the veranda of the Larkin house. It must go hard with every lover of the gentle Scot to think of him as inhabiting that other dismal shell, the ugliest house, I think, in all Monterey. I looked in at some of the windows and saw only bare whitewashed rooms with broken walls and floors. There was a notable debris of empty bottles, and in one room it seemed that some conscience-stricken carouser had sought to dispose of his incriminating evidence by stuffing it under the flooring, whence the necks of more bottles protruding in a waggish fashion as though they were tipping the wink to the spectator. At one end of the house an outside stairway led to the upper floor. At the other was a square of garden ground, in a corner of which a few nasturtiums and stalks of mint grew in a secret and furtive manner. Over all there ruled a quaint, olden odour, rare in this country, which oddly reminded me of English almshouses. In a walk about the outskirts of the town I came upon the old church, often called the Mission, of San Carlos. Having always been the parish church of Monterey, it escaped the ruin that fell upon its sisters, and is to-day, at the age of nearly a hundred and twenty years, a handsome, solid building. I was struck by the strange appearance of the pavement of the courtyard, which was laid with circular blocks of some whitish material that was like and yet unlike stone. They proved to be the vertebrae of whales, and reminded me that Monterey had once a whaling industry of some importance. Near the bay I found a building which was formerly the office of the Monterey Whaling Company. The last of the old whaling men of Monterey may still be seen haunting the waterfront, and in the maritime store you may see a bomb gun awaiting the next purchaser, who will never appear. In the bay a mixture of dories, lanteen-sailed fishing craft, steam launches, and glass-bottomed observation boats, from which tourists may spy out the wonders of Davy Jones's locker, mark the intermingling of the old and the newer interests. It was evening as I walked again up the long street. As I passed along I encountered now a tinkle of mandolins, now an odour of Spanish cookery and roses tangled together, quite unspeakable. Children played in the cypress-shaded gardens, or sat at the doors of the hunchbacked adobes with their fathers and mothers. On a side street a modern wooden church with a painful spire was lighted up, probably for choir practice. Protestant as I am, I turned away and walked again past the old Catholic mission. The last swallows were wheeling home, and the sparrows in the ivy were sleepily garrulous. The fading light lingered on the crumbling cornices, and the tile-capped belfry rose peaceably into the clear dusk of the sky. After all, age is a kind of sacrament. End of chapter 16